morning. Uh, welcome to day two of the fifth annual 360 Open Source Summit. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Graham Brookie. I am the director of the Digital Forensic Research Lab here at the Atlantic Council. And I'm Rose Jackson, the director of the Democracy and Tech Initiative, also at the Atlantic Council. <laughs> I don't know why I feel the need to say that each morning. Very much. <laughs> All of the Atlantic Council. <laughs> uh, yesterday we heard a, an enormous amount of conversation uh, ranging from leaders and partners uh, working to counter uh, and address Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, uh, as well as activists on the front lines of the democratic backslide in Hong Kong, uh, activists, journalists, dissidents targeted by NSO Pegasus, and, and so many other sessions. Which ones am I missing? <laughs> well, we ended the day looking forward and taking all of the conversations and lessons about the world as it is and tried to bring it into what is it that the world might look like and how do we prepare ourselves to have a more democratic and rights respecting version of a digital world with new technologies coming online. We also had our digital Sherlock's uh, doing a range of trainings, including from our partners at the Open Technology Fund, National Democratic Institute and others. Which brings us to today. I think our digital Sherlock's are started right now. Digital Sherlock's already got started all on the third floor. Uh, right now they are doing a training or a capacity building session with our partners at Code for Africa that we're very excited about. Uh, they'll be joining us throughout the day. I think that their lanyards are a different color. So we'll see you in a little bit, digital Sherlock's. Absolutely. So to give you a little sense of what to expect today, I'm jokingly calling it Government Day. But you're going to hear from a lot of folks ranging from just now, I'm not going to give away Graham's introduction. Of course, we have our major keynote later today with Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, interviewed by Nobel Peace Prize winning Maria Reza, which we're very excited for. But we've also got uh, a number of other government partners working on everything from addressing influence operations to talking about what it means when women are unable to participate in political life because the online environment has gotten too toxic. Really cheerful, light, happy things, of course. Uh, but we're really excited about what's coming today. There's the DSA and DMA drafters coming in to update us uh, on where things stand and what to expect moving forward. Uh, and a number of things I'm sure that I'm forgetting, but you have in your app, which is a great segue to some of what we want to make sure to cover, uh, your agenda, which I know we had some issues with that yesterday, so if it's not showing up for you properly, do the force quit, reopen it, and you should be good. Of course, reach out to us and let us know if that's not working. Uh, a few other little housekeeping tidbits before I pass over. Um, we do have the whiteboard again today. There are two new prompts on it, or shortly will be. Uh, one is asking you to think a little bit about what the next, let's say, seven years from now looks like what problems you think we're going to be trying to address uh, with a little bit of a, let's just say a spicy prompt to the right of that, that the Digital Forensic Research Lab loves to debate on a regular basis. Graham, would you like to lead that one? Yeah, I would love to. Uh, it's a common thing to happen on uh, DFR Lab Zoom meetings. We have staff that's spread out across five continents. We don't get to see each other every single day in person at the office, especially throughout the pandemic. Uh, and we also have had a lot of new staff join us over the last five years. We went from three people, now we're 40 people. Uh, and when I like to it, it, uh, talk about misinformation and disinformation, and how it works with a bunch of experts that are tracking this uh, and building standards for researching this online, uh, the best way to do it is just to throw an innocuous question, uh, sneak attack into staff meetings. And so one of the things that we get the hardest reaction from our staff on, or our team on is, is a muffin a pastry? Uh, so it's and on the what? whiteboard. Uh, we're very much welcoming your views on this. Is a muffin a pastry? Uh, you know, I just raised this question because a lot of people are asking. Uh, I think that there's probably a lot of viewpoints on this. Uh, and so I'm very, I'm very much looking forward to seeing what we come up with. Yeah, if you'd like to include an explanation on your sticky note as to why you firmly believe a muffin is or is not a pastry, we encourage that as well. This is why you come to 360 OS for the incisive questions of our day. There's uh, a technical definition, there's some vibes, <laughs> there's a lot of things to kind of work through on whether a muffin's a pastry, so. I mean, it really, yeah, there's, we, we could get into some questions about whether we want to get strictly definitional or we want to look at kind of the ecosystem that we're operating in. We're going to not debate this right now. <laughs> uh, with that, though, I want to pass it back to Graham to get us set up for the next round of things. Uh, a reminder to everyone while you're in this room, if you're taking coffee breaks and the live session is happening to uh, keep your voices down, uh, 
The lunch later today, as a reminder, is on this floor for folks in the main session. Uh, on the fourth floor, down to the left. Uh, if you ever have a question or you are a little lost, find someone with a black lanyard and they will get you taken care of. With that, let's get it started. Thank you so much. As always, thank you to the DFR Lab staff as well. This, this conference would not be possible without the entirety of the team chipping in. Uh, it's not typical that you come to a conference and get registered again by one of the foremost experts on looking at the online information environment. And so those black lanyards are a very, very good resource. Uh, for our first conversation for today, uh, we're very pleased to welcome, although be it virtually, uh, a really, really interesting conversation from a place on the planet that is an interesting crossroads that is on the front lines of countering authoritarianism, on the front lines of a bunch of the kind of big, big tech policy questions that we have ranging from industrial tech policy questions to kind of hardware, software issues, uh, as well as a, a robust democracy that has extraordinary digital service for its citizens. So. Uh, we're going to have a conversation with Digital Minister of Taiwan, Audrey Tang, uh, hosted by Lais Martins, who is the Persephone Miel Fellow of Niccolo Journalism at the Pulitzer Prize Center. So please welcome uh, the video. Hello, and thank you for having us for this important conversation as part of the 360 Open Summit and RightsCon. Um, if we could just get started. Hello, Minister Tang. Thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to get started with a question about Democracy 2030. So we have to account for what happened in the past two years of the pandemic. What concerns me particularly uh, is how governments, including ones that are considered democratic, have used this crisis as an opportunity to develop technologies with no regard for criteria and uh, principles such as fairness and proportionality. Consequently, ramping up surveillance during a very vulnerable moment in history where citizens have deposited in them uh, trust to guide us through these unprecedented times. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how this scenario imp impacts our prognostics for 2030 considering that we'll likely be facing more crisis in the coming years, uh, not only health-wise, but also environmentally. Uh, and more importantly, considering that Taiwan managed to build its digital-centered response while respecting principles and increasing and maintaining trust. Thank you for this very important question. Uh, in Taiwan, we countered the pandemic over the past two years and a half now uh, with no single day of lockdown, just as we countered the disinformation crisis uh, without a single administrative takedown of websites. So the idea here is to trust the citizens because to give no trust is to get no trust. The civil society generally weakened when a top-down measure of top-down, lockdown, shutdown, takedown uh, is imposed on citizens and the uh, ability for a community to self-organize, to be resilient against incoming challenges weaken when the state, although they do not have perfect information, try to make uniform decisions. So I think the main lessons uh, from the Taiwan model is that if you trust the citizens with all the data, that's published upon collection, as long as it's not uh, privacy or trade secret related, then the citizens closest to the pain actually make better innovations and better adaptations based on the same transparent available data compared to any top-down state. Forms, I'd like to move a bit into that area. Um, over the past few years, we have extensively documented as the press with whistleblowers, uh, how platforms mainly in the global south are being used to undermine democracy. So by radical actors, radical political actors, extremist groups. Um, but at the same time, we have seen uh, big examples also coming from these regions of how these platforms uh, enable citizens to organize and ultimately defend democracy in their home countries. Um, and I would expect these online spaces to be even more necessary in the coming years for this purpose of organization and defending democracy. Um, but in some countries, in some regions at least, and much led by the West, we are seeing uh, efforts to regulate platforms. So in the coming years, we will see uh, platform regulation coming. 
Um, in my country, however, uh, the attempt that we are seeing to regulate platforms has a collateral effect of uh, ultimately curbing citizens' freedom online. So there is a confusion between what platforms do and what citizens do. And in an effort to regulate platforms, we are regulating citizens. Um, so based on your experience, I'd like to ask you, how do we move on from here? Is uh, there a way forward that does not implicate in having governments uh, dictate how platforms will operate? Uh, is there a multi-governance model that you view as possible? Thank you. That's a really, really important question. Now, um, around turn of century, I remember uh, people like Bill Gates uh, saying that because it doesn't cost anything to send email, the spam problem uh, will consume uh, all the email bandwidth and we'll have to start uh, regulating and charging uh, postal stamps uh, for outgoing emails. Uh, otherwise, we'll all be swamped uh, with junk mail and so on, paraphrasing, not his words. Now, uh, I think that the point uh, I'm making is that Taiwan do not, even to this day, have a law or regulation against unsolicited email. On the other hand, we pretty much consider the spam problem solved. So, so what happened uh, during the turn of century to now? Well, people organized internationally into the spam house and many other um, technological communities. And then uh, through voluntary uh, participation. Anyone can flag any incoming email as spam, in which case the uh, fingerprint, the likelihood of an uh, email that looks like that uh, to reach other people's inbox decreases because of this voluntary contribution of flagging incoming email as spam. But because it's voluntary, uh, you're not forced to share this uh, signal to any organization, nor would you be punished if you do not share uh, this particular incoming email as spam. Maybe you treat it as a piece of art or things like that, right? So the point I'm making is that the internet governance and the internet community already have perfectly good ways to tackle this kind of uh, dangers on the internet. It's called multi-stakeholderism. Uh, the stakeholders joining together, designing better mechanisms for people to participate. Now, um, <clears throat> one of the reasons why many jurisdictions want to regulate the tech platforms. Um, I liken it to imposing a lockdown uh, on their citizens' freedom of movement is because they consider this information to be so rampant uh, at a stage of uh, community widespread um, transmission. Uh, and so lockdown looks like the, the only way uh, to tackle it. Uh, and my um, counter uh, to that is always that we need to vaccinate uh, everyone. So if we vaccinate a sufficient amount of people, as we do in Taiwan, uh, we do not have to impose lockdowns and we resume international travel as of this month. Uh, but if we do not have the antibodies uh, to the disinformation in people's minds, uh, then of course one single viral disinformation can cripple democracy, especially if it occurs on the week before uh, the presidential election, right? So what I'm trying to get at is that we need to get those viral vaccines uh, like humor over rumor, uh, notice in public notice. These are the Taiwanese playbooks to counter disinformation uh, to, to everyone and equip people in basic education and lifelong education with the equivalent of public health expertise, uh, which I believe would be journalism, civic journalism uh, expertise. Uh, because if you've done the contact tracing, uh, well, attribution and the sources, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you've done uh, the entire uh, analysis, uh, you're aware of the framing fact and things like that, it's far less likely for you to buy into the latest doctored photo and just blindly share it uh, to 10 other people. The R value, uh, the basic transmission rate, uh, decreases sharply if you have received even just the most basic civic journalism. So one of the key takeaways we have from this Global Voices and Freedom Monitor project, for which I participated as the researcher in Brazil, is how uh, digital authoritarianism or techno-authoritarianism has a borderless and or trans-border nature. Mm -hmm. So it's not really that it's attached to one state or one group operating in one country, but it's global. Um, in Brazil, for example, we are seeing a democratically elected government uh, use technology to advance its authoritarian agenda. 
So both on social media with the use of citizen data, controlling citizen data. But in other countries we monitored in this project, uh, this escalate may be coming from corporations or foreign actors. So I'd like to ask you what signs of digital authoritarianism you notice in Taiwan and how can a, a civic response or a civic tech response be built to counter these movements? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I have in my mind um, last May when we introduced the venue-based uh, 1922 SMS contact tracing system, it was a design from the GovZero uh, civic group uh, where people scan a venue's QR code with their built-in phone, no app required, uh, and people who do not have smartphones can manually text the 15 random digits uh, to 1922, a toll-free number. It's like a post-it note that stores in your local telecom, not to the state. Uh, and the contact tracers only piece together this random code from the telecom, the mapping between the random code and the venues, uh, and so on, uh, to reconstruct the exposure notification uh, information that is required. And we do reciprocal transparency. Uh, that is to say, uh, you can go to a website to view in the past uh, 28 days uh, how many municipal uh, or central contact tracers have looked at your information at which day, for what purpose. Uh, so it's like a mutual accountability, it's like a shared ledger. Now all this was baked in, was designed uh, on the very first day uh, from a lot of very privacy conscious uh, civic tech people. Uh, and we make public attribution uh, saying that uh, this is invented by the civil society. Um, and you do not actually have to trust your telecom if you trust, say, um, your municipal government instead use their QR code scanner. Uh, if you don't trust either, you can still do pen and paper or stamping your way in, uh, or later on use Bluetooth-based contact tracing. So it's a plural um, landscape, a plural ecosystem for contact tracing. Now, the point I'm making now is this uh, first made it harder for other parts of the state to then go to a more authoritarian use of these data. I remember a judge going um, public on the media in a blog post saying that the judge have received a search warrant to the mapping table between the venue code uh, and the venues because uh, through the legal uh, wiretapping as part of crime investigation, the investigator would really like this information because they can um, investigate the crime, I guess, more effectively. Um, on the other hand, the civic tech design actually said on each and every SMS that this is for pandemic control only. So it must not be used for crime investigation purposes. So it's a, a blatant norm violation. Uh, so obviously the judge denied the search warrant, so the police never received that mapping table. But then most importantly, because everyone understood the norm was not that, um, it enabled the judge to go public and say, you know, the Minister of Justice better stop doing this uh, and better uh, start issuing an interpretation uh, that uh, this is not a communication as per the wiretapping uh, act. This is a pandemic control measure that's deleted in four weeks rather than other kind of SMS which is deleted in half a year and so on. They're fundamentally different things. Now, if we look at our nearby jurisdictions where is the government introducing this technology, they often interpret and say, yeah, maybe let's use it for serious crimes uh, or yeah, maybe let's uh, use it for uh, this list of crimes that's uh, dictated, I, I don't know, by the uh, um, legislators or something, which is a, a, a fine response by, um, you know, democratic standards of uh, everything has to have a law um, backing it up. But because the original invention was not from the civil society, the, the citizens who detect this drift of purpose really do not have an immediate counter response because it was not plural. It was mandatory or it was the only way to do contact tracing in their jurisdiction. But in Taiwan, because if, uh, if uh, we only had that, then of course it limits our ability to respond. No, we, we have other choices. So the citizens can actually do a social sanction and uh, collectively go to other contact tracing methods unless the Minister of Justice reply very quickly to say, no, we promise we will never do this and here are 
are the technological proofs, which they immediately did. So we do have interpretation in place that says uh, these are not to be uh, considered part of wiretapping, should not actually get even the random codes uh, to the police in the first place. So that's it. Uh, I think a outside game, a vibrant outside game that is capable of not just demonstrating against something, but demonstrating with something, right? A, a demo, like showing viable prototypes. That is the key to the um, equal footing between the movements on one side of human rights and the government on the other side, so they can enjoy a co-creative partnership. Great, I think that's a great takeaway to end our conversation. Um, very inspiring, so many ideas that I hope people who are watching us can put into place in their own countries, in their own cities and municipalities. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Minister Teng. This was a pleasure um, to be here in this conversation with you. Thank you, live long and prosper. So I have to say, Mr. Tang, Minister Tang always uh, ends sessions like that. I hope we live long and prosper. Does the sign every single time? That session, I should say, uh, was the most diverse set of time zones uh, that we coordinated across this entire conference, uh, live from uh, Taiwan as well as Brazil as well as here in Brussels. And so, thank you all for taking the time. Or take, thank you very specifically to the minister as well as Lais uh, for taking the time to do that. Uh, it's no easy feat to gather this amount of folks virtually as well as in person, and so uh, getting that together was a fun scheduling exercise. Uh, the next session is about elections, and elections are core to what DFR Lab does. Uh, they are, uh, they've become kind of a lightning rod for the misinformation, disinformation, or the community that is dedicated to countering both of those threats. Uh, and a lot of the reason for that is because they're, A, calendared. You can kind of plan for them, uh, although I think our British partners in the room uh, would likely disagree today. Um, you can plan for them, and they're a moment that is critical to democracy. Uh, the, the process of democracy is what makes a democracy a democracy, and it depends on a shared set of facts uh, that folks can use to come together and make collective decisions. And so I'm very excited for this next panel. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, our partners from the National Democratic Institute, uh, specifically uh, Julia Brothers, to lead this uh, next session on election integrity. Welcome, Julia. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So as Graham was saying, um, you know, we know that genuine democratic elections rely on fair competition, on faith in electoral processes and electoral institutions, and on informed and inclusive participation. However, uh, the deployment of false or manipulated or disorienting uh, information in the electoral environment um, has been uh, undermining uh, some of these principles uh, in countries around the, around the world. We've seen it increase voter confusion, um, galvanizing social cleavages, skewing playing fields um, for political contestants, suppressing the participation of women and marginalized people, um, and really damaging and degrading trust in democratic institutions, and in some cases, the electoral results themselves. While disinformation campaigns and elections are not new, um, we've seen you know, propaganda and disinformation for decades and decades, um, particularly in semi-authoritarian and authoritarian countries. Advances in information technology has made them much more effective, essentially increasing the speeds and distances and volumes that information can move around elections that are unprecedented for every cycle before it. At the same time, digital platforms can improve the way people receive electoral information, reaching citizens where they are with valuable voter information, um, increasing access to and the quality of open election data, improving communications and efficiencies between and among stakeholders and constituents, 
and providing an alternative avenue to speak truth to power when more traditional outlets fail. Those who are working to support credible elections, oops, sorry. Uh, those who are, are working to support credible elections are adapting to a new environment shaped by digitization, which includes new and often transnational actors like tech companies or PR marketing firms, and threat drivers that are often a lot less transparent in the online space. It also means shifting and expanding timelines and skill sets to meet evolving tactics. This panel will explore the fundamental links between digital trends and electoral integrity, and we're joined by panelists that are working on elections occurring in their own countries um, this year. And they represent a, a variety of different perspectives, from watchdogs to administrators and regulators and beyond. So what I'd like to do first is introduce our panelists, and then I'm going to um, do a round of questions with them to kind of kick off the discussion. And then we'll open this up to a uh, Q&A. Um, and we'd really you know, welcome your all's participation in the discussion as well. So first, I'm pleased to introduce Ellen Weintraub, who is uh, a commissioner for the Federal Elections Commission of the United States. Next, um, Vukasava Chernyansky, who is the founder and executive director of the uh, Center for Research, Transparency, and Accountability in Serbia, uh, better known as CERTA, which is an independent, nonpartisan civic organization committed to democratic culture and uh, civic activism. Uh, next, we're joined by Caio Machado, who is the director of Instituto Vero in Brazil, which brings together researchers and digital influencers to build a healthier and more sustainable internet. And finally, we have Anis Somali, who is an elections and civic expert working with NDI, based out of Tunisia. So first, I'll start with Commissioner Weintraub. Um, can you give us your perspective on what you've experienced and had to address in the States? Um, how has social media and online campaigning sort of changed the way that we think about political and campaign finance around elections? And when we're really thinking about the upcoming midterm elections in the United States in November, um, where have you sort of seen improvements uh, in transparency and accountability, for instance, related to political ads? Um, but also, you know, where would you like to see um, more change? Thank you, Julia. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you to the Atlantic Council for inviting me. Uh, as Julia said, we've got uh, 21st century technologies that are an overlay on democracies which have existed. I, you know, you can go back to Athenian democracy, but in my country's case, uh, we have a system that was created in the 18th century. So now we're trying to adapt 21st century technologies to an 18th century creation of this uh, form of government. And um, the, uh, I'm, I'm really struck by the title of this conference, Contested Realities connect and, and Connected um, Futures. Futures. And I wonder if those two concepts are really compatible, because I think what we have seen in the United States is um, a real degradation of the ability to have a shared set of facts from which we could then engage in informed political debates about what, what do we do to address the problems that are addressing, uh, that are affecting our country. Um, digital technology has really um, uh, had an astronomical effect on the on the political ecosphere, on the information ecosphere. In 2016, it was you know maybe two to three percent of advertising in politics was done online. By 2020, it was up to 18 percent. So that's a pretty steep rise. This year, who knows? I think this is clearly the wave of the future for conveying information. After all, who actually watches legacy television in real time and sits through all the commercials? Right? That's not a very effective form of advertising, so it's not surprising that this is where the, um, this is where the trends are going. And um, perhaps the uh, philosophy of um, uh, moving fast and breaking things is not, again, something that is terribly compatible with democracy, which is not something that we want to break. And yet it is under a lot of stress because of the virality of, information, of, of the information that gets transmitted. And that is what's new. It's uh, propaganda, as Julia said. There's nothing new about propaganda or disinformation. We've, it, it goes on on cable news. It goes on through tabloids that, you know, again, date back to the early days of our republic. But it is the 
ability to spread like wildfire that uh, really changes the dynamic when you're talking about the internet and social media. Just yesterday, there was an indictment handed down uh, against some groups in the United States for a seditious conspiracy to try to overturn the election, and they organized on social media platforms. Not perhaps some of the better known ones that, uh, that uh, we've heard from here at this conference, but uh, still, social media can be this incredible force for good uh, and the internet for uh, spreading information. I remember in the money and politics field how excited everyone was when politics first started to take advantage of these technologies. And people thought this could be a huge advance in preventing corruption. You wouldn't need these vast sums of money. You wouldn't need to go hat, hat and the candidates wouldn't need to go hat in hand to big donors and ingratiate themselves and become indebted to large moneyed interests in order to get their, their message across because they could just come up with a great idea and it would spread like wildfire fire over the internet and they could really catch hold and have a very cheap and effective campaign. And that can happen and it has happened, but we have also seen less good information, conspiracy theories, provocative and outrageous content that also spreads like wildfire. And the one thing that we don't want to set on fire is our democracy. So what can we do about this? Well, I think, as some earlier speakers have said, this requires a whole of society response. I think that um, we at the FEC have bizarrely been struggling for over a decade to try and update our rules on how to provide information how to provide disclaimers that will tell people where the ads are coming from, where the information that they're seeing online is coming from. And it was a sleeper issue when we first started. But then around 2016, when we started to see the Russian government spreading disinformation to try and affect our election using these social media platforms, suddenly people got very interested in who was um, behind the information that they were seeing online. And there was a, a renewed interest in trying to get this done. Somehow those efforts have still faltered. But while I have been arguing with my colleagues at the FEC and trying to persuade them that yes, you can fit a disclaimer on an ad, even if it's only shown on, on a mobile phone, that the versatility of this technology should be an enhancement to providing greater information about where the other information is coming from, the tech companies actually stepped in and said, hey, we got this. And they, they showed us how easy it is to actually provide that information, to provide these disclaimers. Facebook does these little wraparounds where the information goes outside the ad, so it doesn't take away from the messaging opportunities. Uh, and Google has similarly uh, come up with uh, solutions for their platform. So in some ways, the technology companies are ahead of us in government in uh, providing better information, and I appreciate that. What I appreciate less is the way their algorithms are sometimes seem to be designed to promote the most provocative and perhaps unreliable content. And right around the election uh, in 2020, they changed their algorithm. Again, I'm just going by what I read in the New York Times, but reportedly they changed their algorithm in the, in the short period of time around the election to upgrade and promote more credible sources, more reliable sources of information, and to downgrade how uh, the spread of information that was less reliable. But they only kept that up for a short amount of time. And, I, and then they switched back, because you know what? They found out that people were less engaged, they stayed on the platform less time, because the information was not so provocative. Um, so, I would like to see the platforms be, take a more responsible position about trying to ensure that the information that they are spreading, again, as uh, somebody smarter than me has said, freedom of speech does not equal freedom of reach. They're the ones who are providing the reach, and they don't have to provide that vast reach to every crazy conspiracy theory that is out there. Uh, Congress could take steps to improve the disclosure, again, of who is behind all of the information that we are seeing on, uh, online, and there are several bills that have been introduced and unfortunately are stuck excuse me, in Congress and don't seem to be going uh, uh, anywhere, anywhere fast. Uh, and circling back to my own agency, because we need to take responsibility for our role in all this too, there is a, uh, another issue behind this that goes behind the technology. We can provide 
these little disclaimers. We can require that people provide that information to the public as to who's behind the ad, but often what they get is the name of an organization that nobody's heard of before and no one knows who's behind it. And we knew a need to do a better job of opening the, the sunlight on these organizations and providing better information to the public and ensuring that people do know who is behind the money, who is behind the advertising that is trying to affect our democracy and our elections. Thank you, Ellen. <clears throat> and one thing I would note about that is, is you know, these kind of measures that have been taken around um, U.S. elections to try to respond um, to some of the information that, that is occurring around elections and to try to amplify more accurate sources. Um, you know, that's also not something that a lot of social media platforms have been able to commit to in countries all around the world, right? Um, and so that's a, a challenge that remains. Next, I'd like to turn to, um, to VUCA. Um, I know as part of CERTA's kind of broader election monitoring initiatives that you've been monitoring both social and traditional media. Um, you know, in your opinion, how, how did the information environment really kind of shape the April elections um, in Serbia? And, you know, have you seen things kind of tactics changing or evolving? And, 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 you know, does this have any kind of implications for the broader region? Well, thank you, Julia. And um, I'm mean, like listening to you, I realize how far away we are from your position, you know, like, especially when we come to regulation. Uh, I'm here actually to remind all of us how traditional media is still so power, especially for the societies and environments who didn't or don't have a living experience in democracy. So I'm coming from Serbia and we are facing a serious backslide when we talk about democracy. So as I mentioned, no living uh, experience in functional democracy, although uh, we say for ourselves that we are a democ democratic country. Uh, but international organizations now uh, recognize us as a hybrid regime, that we have hybrid regimes, some semi-democracy. And uh, I would say that uh, just for your uh, um, you know, like understanding uh, the environment, uh, to give you a, a, a few sentences about the Serbia current situation. Uh, we are facing a, a centralization of power, so everything is concentrated in the president position. Uh, no, or like a lack of separation of power. Then we actually see a serious failure of institution when we come to protecting the, the rights or the, uh, the, the public interest or democratic capacities. Um, we are facing a lack of pluralism, not just in media, and I'll talk about that, but in public sphere, you know, like in, area, in any area where you would uh, expect that there is a pluralism, we actually face the uh, constant government attempt to marginalize or eliminate uh, uh, critical, any critical voices. And so, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, with no living experience, we are lacking actually demand side coming from citizens, you know, like to uh, actually fight for media pluralism or, you know, like democratic uh, institutions. So this is one of the major obstacles. And then when we come to this in information environment that you uh, mentioned, and I, as I said, lack of pluralism, um, the thing is that Serbian society is actually oriented toward the, the traditional media. Yes, I mean, like, only online media is important, and they're, like, more and more increasing, you know, like, when we are talking about getting information, but the traditional media is still so influenced. And then comes the questions, you know, like, what we do when the, the uh, you know, like, disinformation are so much, you know, like, spread at the main, uh, mainstream media, traditional media, and the main source is actually the government. So uh, just to again illustrate about our findings, and this is not related just to, to elections, it's a constant, uh, that for example a news program uh, at the channels uh, with the, you know, like traditional media that coverage the national frequency, um, actually the uh, representation of the government and pro-government uh, um, uh, people is 95% versus 5% of the opposition representation. And then it's not just about uh, amount or how heavily they are presented, it's about the tone. 
So majority of government representatives are actually represented in a positive tone, neutral and positive tone. And when we come to this 5% uh, dedicated to opposition, we are actually see them almost all time in negative, uh, presented in negative tone. So uh, again, you know, like uh, when we talk about information environment, then manipulation of facts, disinformation are heavily presented. And uh, again, just to mention government, constant government attempts to suppress critical and independent voices. So this is very important when you link and you know, like when you try to illustrate what's going on in the, in the campaign uh, during the elections. So um, it is important to monitor the media before campaign starts because there is uh, certain legislative requirements that uh, actually artificially creates pluralism in media. And then you know, like what we noticed, and we had the three elections in the same time, presidential, uh, parliamentary elections in the uh, capital city, Belgrade elections. Um, we actually saw that beside that, that the, the fake or artificial pluralism is created, or you know, like it was just the exercise of ticking the box because of these leg legislative requirements, um, we see that this uh, you know, like disinformation presence, especially you know, like, uh, uh, with the right-wing political parties, actually dominated the, uh, the media. Um, so, as I said, disinformation is one of the biggest problems. Uh, problems. Um, the thing about the uh, Ukraine uh, that significantly um, um, actually affects our campaign, uh, it's a question, or now we see how the government actually uh, used the Ukraine circumstances to actually gain the points and the right-wing parties who are actually glorifying the Russia actually use this fertile uh, grounds for spreading this information uh, constantly during the, the campaign. So uh, Ukraine actually overshadowed the all other topics. And uh, with this capture media and the position of the government that is trying to actually say that uh, Serbia is neutral when we come to uh, Ukraine and the war in Ukraine, uh, we see that actually this information dominated uh, in both traditional and online media. Um, beside uh, Ukraine and the glorification of uh, Russia, uh, another topic that was uh, really present when we come to disinformation was uh, economy. Again, economy to you know, like glorify, but not promote, glorify the work of the government and then uh, also in the same time to attack when we talk uh, uh, of the opposition accounts. When we, when we talk about the engagement in content, um, the comments were you know, like the, the thing that was you know, like, uh, um, used by, uh, by people, but also sharing. You know, like, and then uh, the further research is needed to understand actually whether this is the, the bot pattern, because you know, like, uh, those comments on the content was really like almost the same messages with uh, uh, little changes. And the sharing was really heavily presented. So I'm like, happy to answer on all your questions. I hope I you know, like, answered the, the main question. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> Thanks, Buka. Um, Kyle, so <clears throat> people are watching uh, Brazil's upcoming elections closely. Um, and I know it, democratic institutions in the country are mobilizing to thwart malign efforts to um, uh, undermine confidence in the process, including the TSC, the election, the main election management body um, in the country, kind of doing kind of pre-bunking um, of narratives and developing partnerships with tech platforms. Um, what aspects of the upcoming elections do you think are most vulnerable um, to disinformation and how are electoral actors planning around that? Um, and, you know, in your opinion, what kind of mitigation techniques have been particularly effective? Okay, great, great important questions. Um, so jumping directly to the first part of the question, um, the vulnerabilities. So I'd say the main vulnerability in Brazilian elections right now stems from a dichotomy. Uh, well, the elections are run by the electoral courts, 
So basically, their legitimacy derives from statutes, from the Constitution. And the networked, concerted efforts targeting democracy, uh, they use social mobilization exactly to target legitimacy. And this, this information plays an important role there. And this is also valid for other aspects of our democracy. I'll give you a COVID example, so not, not electoral. Our public health system is, is more than a public service, really. It's, it's a system, uh, it's an inclusive, participative system. It's grounded on our constitution. You have expert civil society, you have commissions to hear the population at the municipal, state, and federal level, super prepared uh, to deliver universal health care during the pandemic. Then all of a sudden, a network shows up the military forces have an interest in getting funds and producing hydroxychloroquine in their labs. Uh, private companies want to import Sputnik without the authorization of our regulatory agencies. The president sees an opportunity for populism and pity, pitting people against the experts. Another hospital sees the opportunity to produce bogus research and justify all this. Disinformation legitimizes stepping outside of the existing public democratic system and turning towards private solutions, which we know that there's a flurry of interests there, but there is a shared interest in sidestepping democracy. Um, so I think we have a similar case in the elections. Uh, another point of pride of Brazilian democracy is the fact that we use electronic voting since the 90s. We never had an issue with our ballots. They've been audited, they've been tested. We'd have very tense elections and they've been tested and retested. Um, and, you know, it's the few things that work and we're, we're proud of. But it's also something that is highly complex. It's grounded on norms. Most of the population does not understand how the ballot, ballots work. The information security aspects, the fact that they're not connected to the network, they're encrypted, they have all of these security measures which are highly technical, and surely the experts that audit it understand it, but the population does it. And that makes it easy for disinformation to target that, right? And legitimize, legitimize again, a solution outside of the system, such as a populist authoritarian attack. So moving on to the solutions and a few interesting things, two interesting things that uh, we've been seeing and that the electoral courts have been promoting, which I'm, I'm calling, let's say, a hybrid institution. So again, they're highly dependent on the norm. You know, the Constitution is a beautiful text, but they decided to bring everyone to the table and draft agreements, starting by platforms, Facebook, well, Meta, uh, TikTok, Google, and even Telegram, they brought, which is a first and a big achievement. Yeah. So they brought everyone to the table and said, well, great, we're, you're really welcome to work in Brazil. This is a democratic country. If you want to stay here, you need to agree with our, with our elections and you need to help protect it. So drafting crisis mechanisms, quick responses, and so on. Then uh, the electoral courts also turned to civil society. Uh, drafted a task force agreement, which, which we are a part of, uh, then with civil society and academia receiving information, measuring social media, uh, producing campaigns to inform the wider audience. We had the lowest registration of young voters in Brazilian history, with a lot of celebrities, social media influencers. My co-founder, who's the world's fifth biggest YouTuber, participated in this, and we, all of these organizations together, we managed to swing from the lowest uh, registration numbers in history to the highest. So now we have the highest rate of youth joining and voting. Obviously, the, the crisis of democracy isn't solved, but it shows that by establishing this dialogue between institutions and the broader audience, and, and doing this three-way thing between experts, government, and, and audience, and the broad public, we can rebuild trust. The second solution, and I promise I'm heading towards the end, uh, it relates exactly to the COVID example I, I mentioned before. The Senate investigated the federal COVID-19 response. So we had hearings, we had people summoned to testify, and something really interesting happened. A bunch of social media accounts that 
showed up that were created after our presidential elections in 2018, satire accounts with hilarious names uh, and individuals as well, saw an opportunity to participate in this mechanism of, public, of, of holding people to account. So they dug the dirt on the people testifying. They hinted and suggested questions to the senators, to the point that the senators would turn to Twitter and say, hey guys, so-and-so is showing up. Uh, what did he say uh, in 2020 about the pandemic? What should I ask him? So it became what, what is a highly institutional mechanism, uh, you know, Senate executive checks and balances, two powers, became this crowdsourced investigation. And just as a teaser, this is what we're, we at Vero are, want to leverage for the next election. We, we're, we're building something on that. But it, it's a hybrid form of accountability, which I also think is a very interesting solution that takes advantage of this network mo mobilization to, instead of uh, sidestep or, or hinder our institutions, to leverage them. So these are two solutions I think that are quite promising. We, we will have to see how it plays out. But I, I do believe this teaming up between institutions and networks can play at our favor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I'm really interested to see how the Telegram and TikTok, you know, kind of participation shakes out. That's something where we know in a lot of places repeat offenders who have been removed from some of the more mainstream platforms have found homes on, on Telegram. And, and so I'm glad to see that they're there in the fold. Um, Anise, I know you're currently working um, with nonpartisan civic groups in Tunisia to safeguard the upcoming elections. Um, are, you know, the politics of post-revolution Tunisia are always changing. Um, and in what way do you see kind of digitization influencing the upcoming elections? And in particular, how are civil society, you know, how is civil society sort of working um, to be uh, to push for electoral, electoral accountability and um, reform. Yeah, thank you. I mean, let me get back a little bit because I like telling stories. I mean, the, the, we, we always speak about the, the huge role that the uh, social media played in the Tunisian revolution. And back then, uh, Facebook in particular was a big tool for two things. One, sharing information and make sure that under that censorship, people were still getting their information about what was going on. And secondly, it was a very powerful tool for people to organize and to mobilize in the streets. Um, that led to toppling the regime uh, of, of the past dictatorship uh, of Ben Ali. And then that was the time when Tunisians were for the first time, at least for generations, uh, experiencing a real freedom of expression. So um, that freedom of expression over those social media tools, it was kind of a revolution uh, for, for, for the Tunisians uh, in two ways, both at the level of the engagement between citizens where people could engage with, with each other and discuss aspects or things that matter, uh, both politically but even for the Tunisian society, that are not dictated by a media or not dictated by a certain, a certain line. So that was quite a big thing. And the second thing is the possibility of engaging with decision makers and the possibility with an ease communication with the uh, uh, political actors. And that was really the way that the Tunisians opened their eyes to this uh, freedom of expression over, over social media. However, on the other hand, um, with time, um, users got somehow clustered in, in very homogeneous uh, uh, groups of people sharing almost the exact same point of view uh, with very little challenges to the way that they, they see things. And that contributed to a certain polarization in the Tunisian society. Uh, unfortunately, that also showed that uh, it developed a certain like extreme narratives um, which were uh, misused by certain political actors in order to kind of deepen uh, that, uh, that gap between the, the, the Tunisians and between the people that were engaging in, in, in politics. Uh, so it led to that situation where populist movements grew in Tunisia based on, on that, uh, on that uh, situation. Um, so, I mean, that, there were both a positive and negative aspect on that. Um, 
about the, the direct aspect of, of how it was impacting the elections. Of course, it was a very powerful tool for getting the information and for mobilizing voters. But at the same time, like the recent 2019 presidential elections were very negatively impacted uh, by that very famous um, uh, Cartage operation affair where there were almost 900 pages, groups, uh, fake accounts um, that were mobilized in a kind of a coordinator uh, uh, campaign for exaggerated information and misleading information that was attacking on certain uh, political opponents and, and political actors. Um, and it ended up by even expanding after the, the presidential election to other countries, which was the same firm doing that in Togo, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, uh, etc. Um, and by the way, there is a very good uh, report uh, on that situation about, uh, that DFR Lab has, has uh, published. Um, what's the role of civil society in all this? Uh, citizen observer groups in Tunisia and elsewhere has been playing a very important role in safeguarding the integrity of the elections. Um, they do field observation, they do deploy people, citizens, independent citizens, in order to observe all the electoral processes and they are playing their role in assessing the electoral processes, in making sure that they do inform the public about how the elections is going, but also in engaging in the reform process and making recommendations and being really there for making sure that next elections uh, will be better. And in the recent years, um, civic groups and, and citizen observers has, have realized how um, impactful the information environment online uh, was on the integrity of the elections and in the inclusiveness of the, of the electoral processes. So citizen gr observer groups have been in innovatively thinking about also how to assess that aspect of the elections uh, that was having that huge impact on the, on the integrity of the, uh, of the elections. So it was following the same approach of, uh, as you all know, elections is not only about a voting day, it's an entire process. It's made of several steps, and each one of them has an impact on the integrity of the elections and its outcome. So they've been observing the information environment or assessing the information environment based on that long-term observation in the pre-election period, trying to assess how it can impact the outcome. You can see how voter registration can impact, how campaign can impact the outcome of the elections. Uh, election day, of course, and after the election day uh, with how results are being accepted and what are the narratives that are targeting the credibility of, of the results. Um, and even international election observation missions have been including that assessment of the information environment um, in, their, in their work. So very briefly, and I'll finish here, um, the, the civil society groups and citizen observers still do need much more to continue doing the work that they're doing. They're in independently assessing the elections um, and they need better access to, ad to, to Facebook ads. They need better access to metadata. And, and they need to be considered by, by the big tech firms as real stakeholders contributing to the integrity of, of the elections that can provide that contextual knowledge of how the information environment and how these big firms are contributing to it uh, at, at, at the local level. So there is a big role that the civil society can play in that. They are trusted in their countries as independent observers, so they, they should have a bigger role in advocating for a better information ecosystem. Great, thank, thank you. you. So I think we have a few minutes for questions. I see one has come in virtually, so or we have a few. Um, so this first one is for VUCA. Um, when it comes to legislative requirements for pluralism in the media, what do you see as the fix? How can it be overcome if a government with an authoritarian verb forces the artificial um, this sort of information you refer to? Shall we pick up all the questions and then to answer all me too. Um, yeah, we can. Uh, let's see what the. Okay, so, and the, our next question is since elections are time sensitive issues, what steps should platforms take ahead of time to ensure online spaces remain balanced and reliable during election periods? And do we have any other questions? We can kind of throw them. Yep. I have a question for Rukusa. Uh, I'm coming from Montenegro, so we are neighbors. <laughs> Uh, good yeah. to see you here. So, um, uh, in your opinion, when the Balkan, Western Balkan societies will be mature enough 
so we can say uh, our countries have an electoral integrity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the question is when? Yeah, when? And which way? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Those are some big questions, so we can... Okay, why don't, Vuka, do you want to start yeah, and then we can... Yeah, let's start uh, <laughs> briefly. I see we don't have so much uh, time. So, uh, well, about the legislative requirements during the official uh, campaign, uh, what we measured and what we saw that didn't bring actually um, increase in, in like informing citizens subjectively. Because the thing is that, you know, like when you have in media with the national frequency, this, for example, half an hour for all representatives to actually present their messages. This is so boring <laughs> that people are just, you know, like uh, clicking and you know, like moving the program, not following that. And then what they are interested in is actually to follow the news uh, part of the program, where you have government dominates, as I, as I mentioned heavily. So, I mean, like, this way is not helping. And uh, it's really good to hear. And many things that on these panels we're actually discussing about how, uh, what are the benefits when you have civil society and government, you know, like, and other parts and actors in democratic society when they collaborate, when they, you know, like, work together. Currently, if we talk about, you know, like, uh, uh, organizations that are trying to really to defend democracy, the collaboration is not possible. Although, international community is pushing us to collaborate, which means giving up from the main values that you are actually promoting. So the question from my neighbor, you know, like in Montenegro, is about, you know, like building democracy in our countries. You know, like it's about the values. And this is what we actually are very angry when we talk about international communities, especially the West countries, who are turning the blind eye on what we have in Serbia right now. You can't sit on all chairs glorifying Russia and in the same time undermining the West, you know, like attempts to, uh, uh, to do what they do. So I'm just saying that, you know, like when we build enough, you know, like the political culture, when we, you know, like build the, the demand side for real democracy, I mean, like the question about when is really difficult when you have so heavily present disinformation, pro-Russian actors in, in our country. So I think we will need time. But the very important message is actually, if we lose the EU perspective, you know, I think we will not be able to democratize Serbia. Thank you. And then maybe um, a question for maybe the rest of the panel, uh, so a about sort of how the platforms can plan ahead around elections, and maybe when should that be happening, and what should that look like? Ellen, I bet you have some thoughts. <laughs> I do. Actually, I'd like to talk about an issue that is very in the weeds in the United States, and I'm not sure uh, whether this happens in other countries, but there's this phenomenon of micro-targeting, where, uh, and I, I imagine it actually does exist in other countries because it's part of the platform's business model. They suck all this data out of all of our clicks and our likes, and they use that to sell ads. As Mark Zuckerberg uh, famously said to uh, a Senate panel once, uh, Senator, we sell ads. That's how we make money. Uh, the problem for democracy is when they're selling these very micro-targeted ads where they, they use all this data that they have accumulated in order to sell um, uh, to their advertisers, we can, we can find the most susceptible audience for your message. And just you can, you can make sure that your message only goes to the people who are most likely to be receptive to it. And the problem with that is that nobody else sees it. So one of the basic premises of our uh, uh, free speech principles in the United States is, well, if you don't like what somebody else is saying, then you should come up with a better message and, and in the marketplace of ideas, your message will win if it really is better. But you cannot contest somebody else's information, their disinformation, if you never see it. So uh, one proposal that I have made to the, uh, to the platforms is that when they are engaging in this business model, when they're selling their ads, they should make sure that they are um, uh, going to a 
broad enough range of people that they will be available for debate and that not only the people who are most likely to say, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me, no matter how crazy the idea is, uh, uh, they will not be uh, in their own little bubbles there where nobody else gets access to the information and is able to uh, put forth the counter arguments. So that's my, my uh, small scale uh, issue. But you know, I wanted to circle back to a, a larger issue that I am really fundamentally very concerned about, and that is just faith in democracy. Mm -hmm. Democracy rests on faith. As, as uh, one of my co-panelists said, you know, this, it's very technical running an election. People don't really understand how it works. But for over 200 years, people in the United States have believed that the public-spirited, nonpartisan, professional, you know, these boring little bureaucrats who sit there and they compose the ballots and they count the ballots, that they're doing their job professionally. And when they announce the results, they are right. And, and, you know, you win some, you lose some. If you lose, then you say, okay, we'll do better next time. But I think that we are heading into a very dangerous time right now where people are unwilling to accept the, any results that they don't like. And their go-to response is becoming, well, the other side cheated, that it, it wasn't counted properly, there was fraud. There's no evidence for any of this. And again, I think the, the, me the social media platforms have a responsibility to not elevate these kinds of conspiracy theories because uh, I think we are barreling towards a place where, and it's a dangerous place for our democracy, where uh, nobody on either side is gonna trust the results if they lose and democracy can't function that way. Thank you. Any other final thoughts? Yeah, Kyle. Okay, so answering the question of what platforms should, should do, I, I don't think there's any space for uh, black, box black box decisions anymore. And I include here the algorithms which are, which are materializations of company decisions, right? We can get into the discussion of machine learning and so on, but at the end of the day, these are uh, organizational decisions. And uh, this black box issue, at the end of the day, comes back to bite. Uh, I, I can give another a, a good example of that. Back in 2018, uh, civil society and academia brought evidence that WhatsApp was being used uh, to spread misinformation in Brazil. Uh, the response from the company at the time was, oh no, you're moderating hundreds of groups, that's not representative, here's the numbers we have, we won't share the data, even though you're asking for it, but you know, believe me, that's not true. Fast forward a couple of, couple of years, evidence amounts we know it's true, WhatsApp is like, oh, maybe we should cooperate, and, and the company is doing a good job now in, in cooperating. But now, regulators are talking about very, very stringent regulations. Other groups want to piggyback right on that, including the media conglomerates that are saying, well, you know, let's not regulate the media, we have enough competition there, let's regulate the social media platforms. In fact, let's make them pay for journalism and we'll receive that money. So, you know, all these interest groups are taking advantage of the lack of trust that was built because of that defensive position. So, uh, where I'm getting at is we need to have collaborations. Things like uh, Commissioner Vi Weintraub brought that the, the social media companies nudged, tweaked the algorithm uh, during elections. I think that's great, but we need to understand what's going on, what is the tweak, what are the blind spots. We need to have a better report there. So then we can have proper accountable and legitimate decisions. And, and that way we can keep a healthy ecosystem and not build or, or you know, leave a problem that will come back to bite us in a, in a few years. Okay, well, unfortunately, we are out of time, I'm but sorry, I wanted man. to uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to thank our I'm panelists so um, and, <laughs> uh, and all the thoughtful questions as well. So, great. I thought we All right, thank you so much, Julia. <clears throat> so we have one more session uh, before heading into lunch break, and I'd like to welcome uh, DFR Lab Senior Fellow, Iria Piusa, to, to intro it. Thanks, Graham. Uh, good morning. I'm Iria Puyosa, visiting research, uh, 
fellowed in the different lab. And in our work here, we strengthen uh, democracy and center human rights. And that uh, is the reason why this particular panel is going to follow is, is important in our agenda. Um, we have seen in the last uh, decade how authoritarian regimes around the world are uh, weaponizing the internet to um, um, undermine democracy and to um, go after dissidents around the world, especially in the global south, Latin America, where I am from, while democratic uh, countries are kind of falling short of uh, in, using the internet to foster democracy. And one of the areas in which we really need to improve is uh, providing access for all the population. What, one part of the war being done to foster democracy and to defend human rights globally is done by civil society and uh, social activists. And for them to succeed in their war, they need increased access, reliable internet, secure internet. Part of the war for doing that depends on government investments. And some organizations in the civil society, global civil society, are working to uh, persuade governments to advance in that agenda. One of those organizations is Connect Humanity. And we are inviting Johai Ben Avi to uh, join us in the stage to uh, moderate the panel on investing in democracy, uh, in investing in the internet, sorry. Uh, they are all connected in my mind. Uh, Johai is uh, the uh, Norrison, Norrison Fellow in the Atlantic Council. He was also the founder of RICONS. Uh, welcome, Johai. Thanks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for being with us. My name is Yochai Benavi. I am the co-founder and chief executive of Connect Humanity. We are a fund to accelerate digital equity. And as you heard, a non-resident fellow at the Atlanta Council's DFR Lab. Let's start with a sobering truth. Even under the most generous accounting, three billion people lack access to the internet. That number from the ITU, which you might hear sometime, counts anyone who has used the internet at least once in the last three months. When you add people who don't have reliable access, the number goes up. When you count people who don't have high-speed access, that number goes substantially up. When you add people who can't afford the internet, the number goes way up. When you add the people who lack the digital literacy to meaningfully use the internet to improve their lives, the number goes even higher still. And estimates to estimates of the cost to connect everyone range from $428 billion to an excess of $2.2 trillion. And committing those funds has never been more important. During the pandemic, we've seen just how important the interest is, sometimes painfully so, right? Those numbers hide the fact that what we're talking about is kids being able to go to school. It's about folks being able to work remotely and provide for their families, to engage with their communities, to talk to their doctor and find access about the vaccine, to participate in democracy, and so much more. What we have is a world where billions of people are falling further behind just by staying where they are. Connect Humanity, the organization I'm privileged to lead, was started by a group of colleagues who came together by the overwhelming feeling that it doesn't have to be this way. We generally know how to connect the unconnected. That's not the hard part. And we generally know that traditional telecom operators, your AT&Ts and Vodafones of the world, have not and will not connect everyone. It's simply not in their business model to do so. It's not a problem the market is going to solve. And so at Connect Humanity, we focus on non-traditional operators, the sort of community networks, cooperatives, municipal networks, smaller operators, folks who are more grounded in their communities, often community-owned, who have different business models and different incentives. But most of these communities and most of these operators struggle nearly universally with access to capital. They're often too big for philanthropy and microfinance and too small for uh, direct foreign investment, international aid organizations, and commercial bank loans. 
Our existing funding mechanisms, simply put, have a much easier time funding a large company to build a billion-dollar submarine cable than to give a million dollars or even $100,000 to an underserved community. And even for the many governments of the world who are looking to connect their people, there are few choices. Indeed, often the only choice for the governments who want to invest in connecting their people is Chinese financing. In Africa, Chinese investment in ICT infrastructure surpasses spending from African governments, G7 nations, and multilateral agencies combined. Chinese financing often comes with Chinese vendors and construction companies, Chinese hardware, Chinese software, and Chinese control. For many, if not most of the world, their first online steps will be on Chinese infrastructure owned by Chinese-controlled operators, with all of that data available to the Chinese government. In doing so, China is expanding not just their surveillance capabilities, but also their influence over vast swaths of the world. A huge part of this is through the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, and at least 146 countries are currently receiving support from China through the Belt and Road Initiative. And as we'll hear from our panel today, this raises real challenges for democracy, human rights, economic opportunity, and ultimately national security. And I should add that at a time when climate change is increasingly being recognized as a national security threat, and network equipment produces as much carbon dioxide emissions as the airline sector, we must also think about the energy resources that will be used to connect the other half of the world. And whether it's climate change or awareness raised by the pandemic about the need to expand reliable, affordable access to the internet, the democratic world largely has not come up with a compelling answer to Chinese money, with democracy, human rights, economic development, and national security hanging in the balance. And with that, let me bring in our panel. I'm joined today and honored to be uh, joined by the U.S. Ambassador to the EU, Mark Gittenstein, Malavika Jairam, the Executive Director of the Digital Asia Hub, and Carolina Escobar, the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Makaya. Let's start with Carolina. I know it's late for you. I uh, appreciate you being here with us today. Your organization, Makaya, has been doing great work to connect the unconnected and underserved communities across Colombia, especially in formerly FARC-controlled territories. Maybe you can set the stage for us um, by describing what internet access in Colombia has meant for the peace and reconciliation process, economic development, and political participation, and why is it that a nonprofit organization like yours is connecting people and not the large telecoms in your country? Well, hi, everybody. Um, Johai, thank you for the introduction and for having me here. Also, um, hi to my fellow panelists. It's very great to be here. Actually, it's not late. It's early in the morning. It's 4.30 <laughs> in the morning. So um, I'm based here in Medellin, Colombia, but super excited to be virtually here. So to answer your question, so a little bit of background. So Makaya is a nonprofit organization created and based here in Colombia. Uh, we've been up and running for 16 years, and our purpose is to build capacities for social development using technology and innovation. So why did we end up doing a connectivity project in the peace zones in Colombia? So we actually have worked in two of the municipalities that have been determined to be essential for the peace process in Colombia. But the reason why we ended up uh, doing connectivity is because, I mean, at the beginning, it wasn't like, oh, let's do a connectivity project in these two municipalities. The reason why we ended up there is because we wanted to do a technical support process for coffee growers in those municipalities. So the purpose was not connectivity itself. The purpose was to be, bring tech capacities, digital skills to coffee growers. Uh, we started in one of the peace zones. So it started as a, as a digital skills project. When we went to the zone uh, in the first visit, I actually went to that first visit, we realized that it was impossible to do a digital skills and tech capacity project because there was no connectivity. 
And when I say no connectivity, it's like no connectivity at all. Um, our cell phones didn't work when we were visiting the coffee growers. So we sort of had to go back to the basics and said, okay, um, what are we going to have to do here? We were super fortunate that the funder it was flexible because when funders are not flexible, it, these type of unexpected circumstances are very difficult to manage. Uh, and the funder was Lavazza Foundation, the Lavazza, like the coffee company, because they wanted to engage coffee growers more and better into their value chain. So we went to Lavazza and we say, hey, there's no connectivity, we need to start from the basics. And they said, okay, do whatever you have to do. Um, so I think that there's one lesson learned and is that funder flexibility is super important in these type of projects. So um, I guess, so, so we ended up connecting a, a five coffee farms and some schools using TV white spaces. Uh, the legislation had recently passed in Colombia. So it was like a really, really good moment to do a pilot using TV white spaces. Um, and I think another lesson is that um, it was connectivity with a purpose. It wasn't connectivity just for providing connectivity. It, it was connectivity to improve uh, the quality and the efficiency of the coffee value chain. So we were connecting coffee growers uh, to teach them about prices, about quality, about a uh, how to engage with Lavazza, which is their final purchaser of the coffee and things like that. We, um, and then we replicated this project in another peace zone, in another peace municipality in Colombia. And I can talk more later about the, the, the small cooperatives that are starting to provide internet access. But going back, Johai, to your other question, why do large telecoms don't engage? Actually, our first thought was, let's go to talk to the telecoms and ask them to bring internet access to these municipalities. It was not possible. After many conversations, we realized that for them, a, a, basically the, the answer from them is there's no market. And when they just say that, it sort of closes the door for any possible future conversations. And that's why we are so aligned uh, to the Connect Humanity purpose that small operators, cooperatives, coffee grower cooperatives are really the solutions for these uh, isolated communities around the world. So uh, that's why a nonprofit ended up doing a connectivity project because we needed connectivity for a specific purpose. And now it's being transferred to local small uh, cooperatives that are doing the connectivity. And as I said, I can talk more about Thank that you, later. Thank you, Catalina, I appreciate it. And I think this really emphasizes again how it's not just network operators who can build the internet, right? It is, you know, people search the internet not for connectivity's sake, but to improve their lives. And so we see coffee growers who are developing their own internet networks to meet their needs, often where the market won't otherwise solve for that problem. To continue our, our sort of scene setting, and Mr. Ambassador, I hope maybe I can turn to you. During your time as ambassador in Romania, um, you supported some extremely successful civic tech programs. Um, could you share a bit about what happened and why and how important the internet was to those efforts? <clears throat> Well, thank you, Joe. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to give credit to your partner, Chris Warman, who helped me uh, come up with this idea. But it was 2010. I came to Romania as U.S. ambassador in 2009 with a mandate to deal with the issue of anti-corruption and rule of law, which is still a problem in Romania, but there's been tremendous progress, primarily, by the way, because of its membership in the EU. It's one of the reasons I wanted this job. Um, so it's late 2010, the Arab Spring had just started. About a couple of months before that, I had seen something very surprising in Romania. By the way, the infrastructure in Romania uh, for the internet was actually pretty good. Uh, but social media was just emerging in, in Romania, and I became aware of the fact that the fastest growing Facebook market, probably in the world, certainly in Europe, was in Bucharest. 
But the other thing is, around that same time, there had been an activist uh, NGO-sponsored event countrywide in Romania. It was actually designed to clean up the trash on a single day. And they got hundreds of thousands of Romanians on the street a single day. So I thought, watching what was happening in the Arab Spring, where social media drove a lot of activism, I said, why can't we do this with anti-corruption in Romania? And into my office popped Chris Warman, who was then running TechSoup Romania, uh, which we can talk about later if you want. TechSoup is a great organization that uh, focuses on many of these issues. And I told him, I said, why can't we have a moveon.org in Romania that's focused on, on anti-corruption? He says, well, here's an idea. Let's find some money. Turned out there was $90,000 available. Just shows you how a small amount of money can have a huge impact. In, and in one of our accounts in, at the embassy, and he says, why don't we do what he called a competition? And so we sent out a communication to almost every activist in Romania. Before it was over, it turns out within a couple of weeks, we had reached 1.2 million Romanians out of 18 million. There's only 18 million people in Romania. So it was pretty remarkable. And they came back. And the idea of the competition was give us an idea uh, for how you can use social media to fight corruption came back with 150 ideas, and then we had a con conclave of, uh, and had a voting system where if you were invited, you got to vote on the best ideas. We narrowed it down to 10 ideas, and then uh, we had a vote. I think we funded five ideas. And between the cost of, the, of, the, of getting everybody to Bucharest, paying for their travel, et cetera, and the money, we had maybe $10,000 for each of these internet websites, which in Romania was a lot of money. And one of those, uh, they were all very successful. But one of them you may have heard of, Funky Citizens, uh, is a, a great organization that has since become one of the most important uh, organization, activist organizations in Romania. I think one third of all people online are on fun the Funky Citizens website. Uh, and in, after I left in 2012, uh, I learned that not only did they create their own moveon.org, it's called Click It, I think, or Click On. Uh, that's 1.2 members, million people online. In 2017, you may have read about this, uh, there was an effort by uh, the new majority party to undo all of the work we had done on anti-corruption. And through this organization, between Click It and, and Funky Citizen, I got 600,000 people on the street in Bucharest. It was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And they basically reversed what, happened, what was happening in Romania. Uh, it was all spontaneous. Uh, but we built, what we did is we built social media capability to fight corruption, and it's had a huge impact. By the way, of funky citizens, I just learned this t this morning. I, the, Elena Callistro, who runs Funky Citizens, had mentioned this to me, but I was stunned by it. Within two days of the war, they raised six hundred thousand dollars online, which in Romania is um, a huge amount of money. So they sent fifteen semis full of food and help into Ukraine, and they have moved out tens of thousands of refugees just through that organization with Sean Penn's organization. So here, $90,000. And that's what we were able to do with $90,000. A small amount of money using infrastructure. Now, the Arab Spring didn't turn out so well, <laughs> but uh, it certainly served as a good model. Maybe I can ask you about a, another model. I mean, this is, I think, really demonstrates the power of civil society and yeah. civic tech, but really yeah. only possible in a country with ubiquitous access. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I know Chris and you have spoken uh, about sort of the role of the SEED Act yeah. in helping to sort of catalyze that kind of investment uh, in Eastern and sort of Central Europe. I wonder if you could speak briefly about what the SEED Act uh, is, was, and sort of the role it played, and then... Yeah, the I can't remember what the actual letters mean, but the SEED Act, I can tell you what it... It was passed in 1989. I actually just researched the legislative history coming over in the car just now. 
It's passed in 1989. It's back in an era when there really was bipartisan collaboration in the Senate, unlike today. And I, wa I actually read through the debate. By the way, Biden then was the chairman of the European Affairs Subcommittee of the Foreign Relations Committee. It was his uh, substitute that actually passed the Senate. And it had two big elements in it that were very relevant. One, it was designed to provide money to Central and Eastern Europe. This is right after the ball came down. Uh, for things like social media and internet. The internet was in its infancy in those days. But also money for what was known as enterprise funds. And enterprise funds uh, were in effect venture capital funds created in each, initially in just Poland and Hungary and then expanded to all of Central and Eastern Europe. And these funds were designed to fund, in, in effect, tech companies but uh, other enterprises. One of the companies that they funded in Romania was Bitdefender. I don't know if you know what Bitdefender is, one of the top cybersecurity companies in the world now. That money in turn, when the money came back into the venture fund, was used to fund a foundation. That's where Chris is today. He's on the board of that foundation. Uh, and so that's become, and this happened in, throughout Central and Eastern Europe. The most successful actually was in Poland. Uh, where they actually created equity markets, powerful equity markets, which are driving democracy and free markets in Poland, and uh, it's now happening in Romania. So the Seed Act was a small amount of money that was put in each of these countries uh, to fund private sector, but also public sector, but very targeted and focused on capacity building. By the way, the $90,000 was Seed Act money. So it's, it's an incredibly smart investment by the U.S. in both free markets and democracy capacity building. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Yeah. I think that's a, a fascinating model and one we can learn from and I think also speaks to the type of flexible funding that Catalina was speaking of earlier. Um, it's a model that I wish we would see more of, you know, in, from democracies around the world. Can I, can I just add yeah. something to that? The reason it worked is because Romanians activists were making the decisions. They were not being made in Washington. Very important. I think that's essential, right? I think it's about empowering local communities to be, yeah, yeah. you know, in control of their digital futures. And we right. need to always be keeping that in mind as we think about funding these kinds of efforts. Yeah. Um, speaking of people who are not thinking about that, you know, to the extent that any nation is really investing the billions, if not trillions of dollars that it's going to take to connect everyone, Frankly, it's China, uh, which brings me to our final speaker, Malavika. Um, I was wondering if you could hopefully comment on sort of what is the scale of China's investment in global internet infrastructure, and how does that fit into the country's broader geopolitical strategy, and how worried should we be about this from a national security and human rights perspective? Thanks, Yokai. Uh, thanks, Rose, and everyone else for having me here. Um, this is a really contested and polarizing topic, so I'm really glad we're discussing it here. Um, even in the framing of the question, you go straight from mentioning China to going to what does this mean for human rights, right? So the fact that those two things are so intimately tied, I think, makes this a really important conversation. Um, on the question of scale, I mean, you can look this up and find all kinds of data on, you know, Wikimedia and uh, all of the interwebs, so I'm not going to bore you with statistics, but I think qual qualitatively, when we think of scale, um, You've all heard of what's now the Belt and Road Initiative, what was formerly known as One Belt, One Road. And I want to bring that up first because I think even the name change is really significant when it comes to understanding China's political ambitions. Um, there was criticism, e even though it literally translates in, you know, from Mandarin, from Idai Ilu, which is One Belt, One Road, even though that's the literal translation, there was this sort of PR job done to it, which assumed that the idea of thinking of it as a singular idea, a singular belt, a singular road, was problematic both as a narrative, but also as an actual fact, because there will be five roads, there will be many belts, many roads. So I think moving away from the idea of the singular was also very powerful, because it was implying that there is something pluralistic about this idea. There is some kind of element of inclusion attached to this, and it wasn't China trying to capture the single road uh, or the single narrative, but that it was open 
to influence. It was open to negotiation, it was open to conversation and dialogue. Um, and so it was felt that this would be a much better name for the initiative, so Belt and Road was less uh, contested. Um, and I think that's also interesting because even the word initiative implies that it's a work in progress, right? It implies that it's not fully baked, it's open to what partners want, and the thing that's very compelling, I mean, you can have all kinds of statistics about, you know, 100 and countries, 180 countries have signed deals, uh, it affects so many countries, so many places already have infrastructure, but I think what's very compelling is this narrative that pushes it into the context of a trade war. Right? You're bringing it into the context of a competition, not just between competition for who provides infrastructure and funds it, but a competition around ideas and ideologies. Right? Do you go the American human rights respecting, freedom-oriented approach, or do you want the authoritarian Chinese human rights violating approach? Which, as all binaries are, is a very reductive, terrible way to start, but that's often how it's seen. Right? And I think you'll find the truth might be somewhere in the middle or maybe skewed a little closer to one side. Um, but, but despite the fact that it's a very binary narrative, you'll see a lot of stuff about why is China buying up all the ports? Why is Sri Lanka you know, now enthralled to global debt trap diplomacy? Um, why is China using Trojan horses to enter Europe? Uh, or Macron saying, uh, roads are not a one-way street, right, or words to that effect, that it's, it's a two-way thing. So you still have these very emotive, very powerful narratives that pitch the Chinese effort as sort of, you know, dead on arrival, uh, which belies the actual influence it has in the region. And I think that's particularly dangerous because in an era when there's a lot of love of strongmen in Asia, a lot of love for dictators, a lot of feeling that you know, we need to stand up to countries, especially as America's power in the world is seen as a little diminished relative to what it used to be. Uh, I mean, nature abhors a vacuum. Apparently, so does China, right? It sees an infrastructure deficit and says, why don't we go plug that gap? America is involved with internal affairs, domestic politics, uh, not so outward looking as it used to be, or at least so, so goes the narrative which we can uh, dispute, uh, why don't we go and plug this gap and actually start building out infrastructure that America currently isn't interested in, Europe isn't interested in, right? They're busy drafting the GDPR, why don't we just go and like flout data protection policies around the world and build out this infrastructure? So I think that's kind of the context in which um, we're seeing this. Um, I also want to point out a couple of other things, which is that we, we act as if surveillance is the monopoly of a country like China, except that, as we've been talking about throughout this conference, it isn't, right? We have the term surveillance capitalism as being one of the most touted words we use today. That's a very American phenomenon. It's very linked to a particular economic model, a very particular political ideology. You don't have surveillance authoritarianism. You don't have surveillance neocolonialism or neoimperialism. Right? So the fact that surveillance as a business model is so closely tied to a Silicon Valley approach to capitalistic ideas around data extraction, exploitation, uh, I think we need to sort of name the fact that it's not an us versus them. Surveillance is an endemic problem the world over. Um, having said that, to what extent do backdoors that China might provide or Chinese telecom companies provide or the fact that the data is available for the mothership to view, to what extent does that, to the second part of your question, to what extent that does, that does that affect human rights? And I think that is a very, very grave danger. We've seen with you know, the hacking of the African Union headquarters, entirely built and financed by China, uh, and so many other examples. Uh, that the idea of like ET phoning home is not, you know, something in the movies, it actually happens. So I think that risk is inherent. And I think the other risk that's really, really important is the extent to which civil society is placed under personal physical risks, uh, even to work in this space, to advocate for inclusion, to advocate for connectivity, uh, even just connecting coffee growers, right? when there are political interests at snuffing out coffee growers and handing over that land to powerful you know, uh, property barons. So I think the idea of data infrastructures, surveillance capabilities, 
is very, very real, uh, and the extent to which we don't adopt infrastructure with, and, you know, and be agnostic to the sort of social construct in which it's built, the politics in which it's embedded, I think that's really key to understanding what China's trying to do here. Absolutely. I want to pick up on the point, though, you raised about the, the idea that the perception that the U.S. and the EU are more focused on domestic concerns at the moment. In that void, we are seeing China and, and other authoritarian mm -hmm. step in. It's not just China, although obviously massive compared to anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, Ambassador Ginstein, Secretary Blinken recently called China, quote, the most serious long-term challenge to the international order. In the face of this kind of massive investment, these kind of partnerships with apparently 180 some countries, um, you know, and, and doing so that increase in influence of, uh, you know, surveillance capability of control over the online experience of billions of people. What is the U.S. government's approach to countering the Chinese government in the internet infrastructure space? Well, first of all, picking up on a point that both of you just made about the investment in Belt and Road. 146 countries, I think you said? Yeah. 156. 156. But you took the names of those countries and laid them against the last UN vote? I bet you it's almost completely coterminous. That tells you part of the answer. I mean, remember what that vote was on. It was, there were two votes, actually. One was on sanctioning the Russians, you know, uh, publicly for what they had done in Ukraine, and the other was on the Human Rights Council. <laughs> the notion that Russia could sit on the Human Rights Council when they're murdering people in Bucha is appalling. And yet, many of the recipients of that money voted against us. And what it, if you count up all the population in those countries, 70, 60 or 70 percent of the world actually disagrees with us on what's happening on our position on Ukraine. What does that tell you? And, you know, it's not simply an issue of democracy versus autocracy, which my friend the president likes to use, I use it myself. But it's a rule-based order, as that great uh, diplomat in Kenya points out. You know, if, if boundaries are no longer sanctified, if they're no longer respected, any country in the world is subject to being basically taken over by the neocolonialists. And I'll, to be a little demagogic here, the real colonialists in the world right now are the Russians and the Chinese. They're doing what the Europeans did uh, in the 19th century. They're, taking, they're buying countries, taking over countries. Uh, and the Belt and Road Initiative is not some uh, uh, done out of the kindness of, of Xi's heart. It's, it's done to take control of these countries and the narrative in these countries uh, and to counter the de democratic and humanitarian interests of the West and the Europeans. Uh, and the United States, and it's extremely dangerous. And what is the United States doing? Not enough. That's all I can tell you. Uh, I think the, you know, I would like to see uh, the, the global South to be at least where Romania was when I got there in 2009, which means an independent infrastructure uh, in the internet. And I don't know if that's possible right now. I think uh, we're never going to match. You know, I've seen the numbers: 10, 20. $30 billion spent by the Chinese alone uh, in the Global South or in Africa alone, uh, we're not going to match that. But maybe if the private sector gets engaged and we take the issue more seriously at, at every mission in Africa with every U.S. ambassador, which we're not doing right now, it would have an impact. Mm. We're going to run out of time on this mm. panel, unfortunately. I feel like we could talk about this for hours. Mm. And so maybe... Uh, we can close by asking what would it like? What would, if you could wave a magic wand uh, to really help meet the sort of funding need that exists here? As I say pretty much every day, Connecting the Unconnected is an incredibly capital intensive business. Uh, and so I wonder, maybe Catalina first to you, um, you know, if you could wave a magic wand to help support folks like yourself who are connecting communities that the markets and governments have often sort of left behind. What do, kind of support do you need? Thank you. I think there's, there's I've been thinking a lot about this, and I think there's, there's two things. I think one is like, I don't know if this is a, the right word in English, like demystifying the access issue. 
because, for example, here in Colombia, people believe that everybody is connected because, yes, the big cities and the main municipalities are connected. So I think that demystifying this, that everybody is connected. So talk more, advocate more about uh, all the unconnected people. The recent report from the Alliance for Affordable Internet talks about a, a, um, a topic that I really like and is uh, the meaningful connectivity. So it's not just having people connected, mm -hmm. but with the adequate device, with the adequate skills, and all the capacities to really, really take advantage of the connectivity. In Colombia, it's 26%. So only 26% of the people have meaningful connectivity. But when you go to the Ministry of the ICT or you go to the, to the telecoms, they believe that everybody is connected. So we need to talk more about the unconnected. And the other thing that um, I feel that we need, of course, is funding, but funding for the fundamentals. Because um, it seems like digital skills are not attractive enough or for, the, for the international community. And people think that youth are digital natives, but Yes, they could use technology, but are, are they using it for the right things and for the right reasons? So I think that we need to demystify a lot of things. And um, the other thing about funding, and I'm going to finish with this, is that we seem to be living like in two worlds. So it's like when you talk about funds, it seems like the big investors are, are trying to put their money in the metaverse and in other like super high technology solutions. But that is just gonna be increasing the gaps because there's this whole investment around these super high end technologies that is needed, but we can never forget the other end of the world that has no connectivity, no skills, no knowledge. So I would summarize it, uh, Joha, in those two things, a lot of advocacy, and funding for the fundamentals, digital skills, digital access that needs to needs to be on the agenda again because it seems to be out of the agenda lately. Sounds like you have a lot on your wish list, Catalina. But I think that <laughs> yes, uh, I demonstrates the complexity of this topic. Um, we're going to run out of time in just a few seconds at this point. But Malavika, maybe final word, uh, sort of responding to what would you like to see if you had that magic wand. What would you do? I think I would like to see people in the Global South treated as equal collaborators and participants in their own futures, like you mentioned. Not as victims to be saved by someone else. Not as, you know, uh, passive uh, people. Uh, not as recipients of largesse that someone else decides somewhere far away. Uh, and actually help design the products, the solutions, the services that they need. So I think that that's kind of biggest on my wish list. But I think the last thing is also that we need to look at how people actually use the internet after it's been provided. Uh, we often see connectivity as a destination. And once the connection's been switched on, it's like, OK, we're done. Our work here is done without actually looking to what happens, how they actually use it, where they meet roadblocks, what Jonathan Donner calls an after access lens. Uh, I think that's really important to see where actual problems exist to keep iterating and improving on them. Absolutely, and that's why Connect Humanity, we often talk about digital equity and not just connectivity, right? Mm -hmm. um, thank you to our panel. Thank you to our hosts for a fascinating conversation. I think what we've heard is that digital equity is one of the great challenges of our time. And if we care about advancing democracy, human right, protecting human rights, expanding economic opportunity, and defending national security, we must confront and offer viable alternatives and substantially more funding to solve this challenge. And yet, despite virtually all democratic countries having interests affected by increasing Chinese control of the internet, the democracies of the world have largely been on the sidelines. That said, there are good models, like the CDAC that we heard about earlier today, that we can learn from and leverage as we think about how to meet this funding gap. And it's not just a matter of pouring money into this issue. Our existing funding mechanisms and telecom models, as we've heard, won't be sufficient to connect the unconnected to achieve digital equity. And so we need to evolve conventional understanding of what a network operator looks like, might be coffee growers, uh, and can deliver funding in the sizes and structures that operators require to meet the needs in their underserved communities. Thank you so much for this conversation. 
and looking forward to working with many of you as we work on this challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yohai. <clears throat> thank you so much, Catalina, for joining us so early in the morning. Thank you to Malvika. And of course, thank you to Ambassador Gittenstein and the European, uh, US Mission to the European Union, who is a presenting partner for this conference. Uh, quick housekeeping before we break for lunch. Uh, number one, we're going to lunch right now. Uh, where it is, is the fourth floor down the hall to the left. Uh, Sherlock's have food down on the third floor. Uh, it's the same food, so if you want to go down there and check out what the Sherlock's are doing, you're more than welcome to. Uh, if you know that you have side programming during the lunch hour and a half, uh, then go downstairs to the third floor. DFR Lab staff will direct you to the, sp uh, to the spot. <coughs> the other quick things are just a reminder about the whiteboard over by coffee and tea. Uh, take your answer to whether a muffin is a pastry uh, so that we can figure out what the deal is with that debate. Uh, we'll be back at 1.30 for an important conversation about violence against women online, which keeps too many leaders out of the public sphere. Thanks so much. <laughs> How are you? Oh, of course, yeah. Let me take this off really quick.
嘿嘿嘿嘿嘿嘿嗦，嘿嘿嘿，嘿嘿嘿嘿嘿嘿嘿嗦。Klinkt dat klinkt dat een beetje goed, Leen of nee? Oei. Ja, doe maar, doe maar. Ik heb tijd. Ik heb tijd. Pio heeft geld. Geen we. No worries. Ja, ja. Hey, 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 so. Hey, 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 hey. Alles wordt live gestreamd. Je ziet dat, hè? Dat is, uh... <laughs> hey, hey. Ja, oké, okay, oké. Okay. Hey, 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 so. So, hey, 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 ha, hey, hey. Dat is ding, want so, hey, 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 hey. Oh, dat was een uh, verkeerde. Hey, 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 hey. Nu is dat beter. Moet ik uh, een beetje luider spreken of zeg je, is het in orde? Of? Blijven gaan, blijven gaan. Want het is wel lunchpauze, hè? ik heb honger. Hey, 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 hey. Dus ding, want zo. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, oh. Hey, hey, jou zo, hey, ciao, ha, hong, hong, hong. Hey, 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 yowza, hey, hoong, hoong, hey. Maar ja, normaal zou dat toch wel, kijk. Ja, het is nog altijd, hè, dus. Dan ga ik daar gewoon technisch een beetje oplossen. Ik ga daar gewoon naar achter de schuif. Zo. Zo, niemand gezien. Kijk, dan staat die man ook beter, want dan staat hij. Die... Zo, hé, hé. Hoem, hé, hé. Kijk, nu is het al een stuk beter. Hé? Huh? Ja, ja. Klein stuk zuurschool. Hé, jou zo, hé. Hé, hé, jou zo, hé. Ja. Nou, al is als die kijken, als ze zo bij elkaar staan en dan gaan ze zo spreken, dan is het niet veel meer. En eindelijk moeten ze of eindelijk tegen elkaar staan, of ze moeten gewoon uit elkaar staan. Ja. Hé, hey, jou zat. Ja, dat is ook. Het oh. zijn dezelfde, die kunnen we gewoon. Uh, Wat? Ik twee verschillende landen, dan wordt ook. Uh, is dat 10 oh. elkaar wow. zeggen? Wat? Uh, wow. Dat is 800 nog wat eruit.
kind of tried to rock it yesterday and wore the London t-shirt. I was like the only one. Like, I was there, man. I did, I was like, I was not in Berlin because I had a concert. You know, I didn't rock a Berlin shirt. something low. It's like the only, yeah. I was like, that's cute. I really like that. $25 for a t-shirt? And then yeah. I see the Versace and I'm like, oh. OMG. Because I am owed $25 for a t-shirt? Kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. That was perfect. That was perfect. Her pants is also from a thrift store, they and they're like a French designer, and I like them so much, but couldn't find them anywhere because they're like a French designer who's obscure. I like you. <laughs> you found them on Thread Up? And check on Thread Up, because if you go with European brands, Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope lunch was filling. I'm Alyssa Kan, I'm a research associate at the DFR lab. We have a very fascinating set of conversations this afternoon and I'm just gonna delve right in. So, um, amid global democratic backsliding and the curtailment of fundamental human rights of women, it could not be more important to have a vital conversation about the ways in which we can make our online spaces more conducive and inclusive for civic engagement and political dialogue. Online threats, bullying, harassment, intimidation, violence are all obviously unacceptable. And yet this is a reality that women face every day. It's one that often seems inescapable in order to participate in public life online. This set of issues um, is one that presents a great opportunity for governments, civil society organizations, and tech companies to work together. This set of issues is not easy to fix, but it's necessary, it's fundamental for democracies, for everyone to be able to participate. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Moira Whelan. She's a non-resident senior fellow at the DFR lab, as well as the director of the democracy and technology team at NDI. Thank you. Well, as we've already covered, for democracy to thrive and for politicians and all people to participate fully in their government, you first have to feel safe. To, with, and, and not have the fear of violence. So NDI works historically with political leaders around the world. And what we've realized over the past few years is that this new emerging threat of, of digital violence is the number one barrier that we're seeing to people participating in political life. And to our knowledge, in more than 50 countries in which we work, we've anecdotally talked to women around the world, this is the number one 
attack that women in particular are facing, not just on the issues that they address, but their looks, their abilities as a mother, their sexuality. In fact, not one woman in public life that we've talked to can claim an abuse-free digital experience, not one in the entire democratic world. So what that tells us is that this isn't a woman problem. This is a democracy problem. And what they often hear in these attacks is that it's not physical, right? So it's not that big of a deal. And that it's the price you pay for being in the political arena. That's not just things women are told. That's things women tell themselves. And what we then see is that that sentiment is weaponized to diminish entire classes of people from participating in, in, uh, in political life because traditional gender tropes are manipulated, false and misleading information is piled on top, and what we end up seeing is that women who are leading the edge on resisting strongman regimes are smeared because they are just simply trying to present a future that's more inclusive and more democratic. Threats of, of rape by uh, anonymous trolls chasing after a pesky journalist who is on to a story, those threats are not just directed at that journalist. It's meant to silence women in general from participating in the political process. It's deployed globally by authoritarian actors because it works. We know that women are put off by going into public life because they see what other women are experiencing and fail to, and decide to not participate. If you're a member of a minority population, if you're a woman of color, if you're a young woman, if you have diverse sexual orientation or a different gender identity, it's even worse. But in the words of our patron saint of digital Sherlock's, Madeleine Albright, and the patron saint of NDI, this is a solvable problem. And we have reasons to be worried optimists because ending the structural, structural drivers of online violence against women is in fact a solvable problem. And here, as we're talking about contested realities and connected futures, just a few hours ago, we met with a group of technologists, uh, experts from around the, the world, and we came together to come up with some ideas that we could really work together to implement going forward to change this fundamental problem once and for all. So over the past year, we've been doing this work. We've talked to 90 women in politics at seven different roundtables, or seven different roundtables we held in different countries. We looked at 26 different interventions in the field of uh, government, civil society, and technology companies. One thing I will point out is that of that population, just 16% of the women Pro, that we interviewed and talked to said that they felt like technology companies and the government had been responsive when they had, ha, had been attacked. So we've got a lot of work to do. And what we, what we also know is that what we're trying to do is fix this not just in New York, here in Brussels or in Washington. What we're trying to do is fix it in Georgia, Mexico, Taiwan, Nicaragua, and all of those women participated in this. Over the course of the next few weeks, NDI will be sharing a lot of our findings. We'll share these and some additional statistics of what we heard and the path forward. But what I want to do here today is welcome up a number of women who helped us through this process to not talk about the challenges we face, but to talk about the solutions available to us. Because NDI really does believe that if we can address online violence against women, it will be a game changer for democracy. And in this year of action, that's really what we're committed to. So I'd love to welcome my panelists up to come and talk to us. So joining me as they take the stage is Amalia Toledo. She is an independent expert from Colombia who examines how technology development and policy can impact and benefit uh, human rights and gender equality. Um, we're also joined by Nagat Dodd. Nagat is the founder and executive director of the Digital Rights Foundation, a nonprofit working on digital freedoms in Pakistan. She is also a member of the Facebook Oversight Board. And Tracy Chow. Tracy is an entrepreneur and software engineer known for advocating for diversity and inclusion in tech. She is currently the founder and CEO 
of Block Party, which all of you should go download right now <laughs> if you haven't already, because everyone in this room needs it. Um, and she is also the co-founder of Project Include, a nonprofit working to create a tech ecosystem where everyone has a chance to succeed. Finally, we're happy to welcome Helena uh, Mulgard Hansen, who is the Deputy Tech Ambassador in the office of, in Denmark's Office of, of, of Technology in Silicon Valley. So uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we're looking forward to a great conversation. And I want to start with a... <laughs> I want to start by bringing us into the real world and start with Amalia. So I just gave you a little bit of the, uh, the, the theoretical concepts behind this. But Colombia, where you're from, is uh, in the middle of an election. And some of these gender dynamics are really at play in the current situation. So can you talk a little bit about that and then also tell us what you think about this issue and, and what we need to do to address it. Yeah, a, a few um, clarifications. I, I'm, I live in Colombia. Oh, sorry. I'm not Colombian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Puerto Rico. I've been living in Colombia for the past 10 years. Um, I, another clarification, it wasn't in my bio. I asked not to add it in my bio because I'm not speaking here on behalf of Wikimedia Foundation, but I know that the, the agenda says that I'm <laughs> part of Wikimedia Foundation, and I am, but I'm also a researcher on gender and tech issues. I've been working on this uh, since 2014, focusing my work on, on Colombia and the Latin American region. Um, so with those qualifications, <laughs> now I can go to the answers and, and to my answers. Uh, well, Colombia right now is, uh, since the beginning of the year, there have been election, uh, campaigns on, on for the elections, on the legislative, and now on the presidency. And it is clear that it uh, doesn't matter where you are in the political spectrum, if you are a woman in, in politics, you will receive a lot of violence online. And this is clear in, in, in Colombia. We have seen it. Um, but it's also clear that not everyone received the same amount of violence. <laughs> there are some factors there uh, that also uh, plays a role in here. If you are a woman in politics that are questioning the status quo, mm -hmm. the patriarchal system and, and the, the different oppression system, then you will get a lot more <laughs> violence than if you go with the win, you know? And, and just as an example, right now, uh, we have two uh, for the runoff of the second round of the presidency, we have two women that are vice president candidate. The two women are black, are Afro-descendant. It's the first time that this is happening in Colombia. But the differences are huge from these two women. One is urban, one comes from the academia, has a PhD, has a very valuable professional and academic experience. The other one is from the rural area, um, she used to be a domestic worker. Um, she was a team mother. Um, she is uh, uh, an activist on environmental issues. Uh, and she is the embodiment of feminism, in, in, uh, Afrofeminism right now in Colombia. Uh, and she claims that as she presents herself as someone that is very proud of, of her Afro-descendant roots. Uh, and she is all that the politics is not. <laughs> you know, she comes from very humble um, um, background, uh, and she had made herself very much uh, the symbolism in the country of a new way of doing politics in, in Colombia. And she has received, I cannot tell you, how much hate, attacks, violence, uh, death threat, as any other woman in, in the country. She has received so, so many, and it's because of she's challenging absolutely everything. She's challenging who can be in politics. She's challenging the death policy, uh, politics that has pre prevailed in Colombia forever <laughs> with the conflict. Uh, she is also from an area in the country that still live in the conflict, in the armed conflict. Uh, and she's a displaced woman, and I can keep telling you how many other boxes she you can tick with her. And she is being subject to so much violence because she's challenging all the status quo that is uh, prevailing. And, and people are not, you know, they don't know how to deal with that. And, and not only 
society as a whole, but then government doesn't know how to do to deal with that. And then platforms, of course, <laughs> have no idea how to deal with that as well. Mm -hmm. And it's so sad because I've been working on this for quite some time. Nidak también, and uh, uh, as well, sorry, I mixed the <laughs> Spanish here. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and, and so many other people are working on this, and we'll be researching and speaking about this, and we still don't see big changes here. Yeah. You know? So I'll leave it there, and, and maybe well, we can have more discussion later. And I apologize for, for the mistakes of the <laughs> moderator. I probably made many more. Um, but Nagat, if you could pick up where Amalia left off, uh, you also focus a lot, just for our audience to understand, on the legislative changes, on, yeah. on some, and the double-edged sword there as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, a lot of conversation that I have heard here during uh, the last two days, um, there has been a lot of uh, talk about regulations. And, and I, it's so important to uh, contextualize uh, when we propose while sitting in Western democracies where rule of law is strong, think about the jurisdictions where the same regulations that uh, Western democracies, Global North, propose here, sort of, co they, our governments replicate those laws and then weaponize against the activists, journalists, human rights defenders. And we have a case study in Pakistan where in 2016, a Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act was enacted in the name of protecting women and girls against online harassment. And the same law has been weaponized and abused against journalists, women journalists, women human rights defenders, and the women who spoke up in the Me Too movement. So we have lessons learned there. And honestly, it, 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 it scares me when I hear all the conversation around regulation here in the Europe, and I'm like, oh, all right, so Pakistan or India or Nepal or Bangladesh will be like, oh, so Western democracies are doing it, why can't we? And that's the justification that they give it to us, who, who are on the ground and who are raising voice. Um, so we have seen the regulations are not always the answer. But I'm not an anti-regulation. What I'm saying is that I think we really need to take in account the global you know, trends and see what we are doing in one jurisdiction will have an impact in other jurisdictions with bad uh, governments, bad rule of law, and oppressive regimes. Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. <laughs> I'm going to switch now over to TAC. Right? Because Tracy, you have a perspective on this. It, you know, we like to think that tech is a dumpster fire, um, but there are innovators who are creating tools, and, and we like to name and fame here. So we wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about not just the product, but also what inspires you and where you see the market value here. I'll start first with a little bit of my personal story and then how that led into working on Block Party. So I've done a lot of work around diversity and inclusion activism in the tech industry, which has then drawn a lot of online harassment, <laughs> not surprisingly. Uh, and so I've been on the receiving end of this sort of gendered violence, uh, targeted harassment, stalking, had to experience the psychological harms and this trauma. And I've also gone through the um, very frustrating experience of trying to report to platforms and getting no response, and then having to appeal to my friends who worked at the platforms, and then getting response then, but being even more frustrated that I could have special access, which is the way that it works now. Like you know somebody, you can get something done. Having had the perspective of working at platforms as well as an engineer, I worked at Pinterest, I worked at Facebook, I worked at Google. I also understand how things work from the inside and what are the incentives of the platforms. And I think one of the biggest issues in um, trying to advocate for change with these tech platforms is the people who have never worked there are trying to propose things that would never make sense from inside. As an engineer who has actually had to go through like, tech leading a project and defining product, I understand more of these constraints a bit better. And so coming to work on Block Party, which does automatic filtering, provides people with mass blocking tools, just gives people more control of their online experience, it's this third party solution that sits nicely on top of other platforms and solves for things with a different incentive. If you look at the big platform companies, 
Their motivation, their business incentive, their whole reason for existence is to monetize that engagement and growth. Safety will never be their number one priority. It can be a third or fourth priority, a tenth priority. It's never going to be the number one priority. For another company like Block Party, our entire focus is safety, so we can solve much more for that end user, centering the experience of people who are experiencing harms. So the way Block Party works, um, and again, like looking at that experience of having to deal with some of these harms, where in the past people would just say, like, well, ignore the trolls or just mute and block them, or you know, why can't you just report? The harm is already done by the point that you can go and mute and block. Like you've already had to look at it. And so one of the things we're doing with the automatic filtering is making it so you don't have to see that by default. We sort it into another folder that you can go review later if and when you want to, if you need to have situational awareness of good things, legitimate questions from constituents if you're a politician, or if you need to be aware of the downsides of somebody making real threats against you. Like just pretending this stuff doesn't exist is also not a solution. But we can filter it out so you don't have to deal with it real time. One of the other um, insights we had was so much of platform design right now puts the entire burden on the person receiving the abuse. So say you can report, it's like, sure. Uh, when 4,000 trolls descended on my Reddit AMA, I did not want to go report each of these 4,000 one by one. It is possible for other people to help if the platforms are designed in such a way that they are not right now. One of the things we built in Block Party is a helper function where you can delegate access to other people that you trust to review content for you. It's less traumatizing for someone to review this content when it's not directed at them. Still not pleasant, but much less painful than when it's something targeted specifically at you. So you can delegate access to other people to take action for you. There's automatic evidence collection because we're storing it all in this folder, which is another issue that we've run across with reporting. I've also been through the process of having to go to the police multiple times to follow reports. It's traumatizing and re-traumatizing to have to go collect all the evidence. It's very painful. Oftentimes, people would just want to delete everything because it's so difficult to look at, but then you remove the evidence record. And so we're doing automatic collection of this, which makes it a lot easier. And other functions, like a watch list function, so that if you need to keep an eye on somebody who's persistently harassing you, like that's, that's there for you as well. Um, some of our newer features allow you to take more preemptive action. So if you want to mass block, block all the people who've liked a tweet, that is harassing you, like you can just preemptively block all that, or if people um, kind of out themselves as being obnoxious by liking or retweeting a particular tweet, preemptively block all those people so they can't engage with you. So it's a form of setting much stronger boundaries. Obviously, I know with politicians, there, there can be other considerations around whether or not you can block people from a public account. Um, that's why muting exists as well, so you can filter the notifications. Um, but we also know there are cases where people will block anyways because there's so much abusive behavior from someone that it requires a block. As long as you've documented that and can defend it, that's also fine. So we have documentation for block reasons to make that a bit easier. So really trying to center this experience of the people who are uh, receiving the harm. The broader version of what we've built on top of Twitter right now is these like third-party tools that exist on top of all platforms. And this is one place where I think regulation can help. A platform like Twitter is very open. They have these APIs or application programming interfaces to allow other developers to build tools like what we've built with Block Party. Other platforms, and specifically uh, Facebook, Instagram, the meta-owned uh, platforms, are not very open, which makes it difficult for researchers to understand what's happening. Uh, difficult to hold platforms to account, and it's impossible almost for anybody else to build solutions. There are still some ways to try to work around it with Chrome extensions or like other technical hacks, but it's a lot more difficult than if the platforms are fo forced to open up and enable third-party developers. If you think about um, app stores like Apple's and Google's, they're so much richer for third-party developers being able to build applications on them. If we were limited only to what Apple and Google would build themselves, whether it's like the weather app, the timer app, and then that's it, it's just, <laughs> it's just not that useful. Um, and right now, with safety tooling, we're kind of restricted by what the platforms themselves are willing to build on, in most cases. I think Twitter is leading the way. There's a lot more that Twitter can do. but. The fact that they are so open to allow Block Party and they're so supportive of us, I think, is a good template that other platforms can follow. If they don't want to follow or move in this direction because they don't see it as a business incentive, then this is where regulation can add, actually force a level of openness to enable more safety tooling. And I think this will also address some of the issues around um, 
in different markets, a lack of prioritization because the platforms themselves are never going to spend as many resources in all these different countries as they do in the United States or these major markets. Uh, distributing that um, access around developers can enable people in different markets and different countries to build their own solutions. Thank you very much for like everyone, get blockchain app like now. <laughs> but I want to turn because you really made some great points about where regulation can help level that playing field in a lot of different ways. So Helena, I wanted to turn to you to talk about what governments can do and what is happening right now. Yes, thank you, Maura. And it's fantastic to be on this panel with, with all of you. I think it's really evident from, from the stories that we heard that um, this takes place everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're based in Colombia, Pakistan, or Denmark, where I am from, we're seeing the exact same challenges. There have been some recognition of it, and increasingly so, I would say, but nevertheless, it's a problem that exists that we need to, to address. And the Danish government, um, to this end, launched the Tech for Democracy initiative last year which was in response to the Biden administration's Summit for Democracy, really trying to create a platform where tech, um, where tech and meets with, oh, can you hear me? Oh, you still can, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, to make tech work for democracy and human rights, as opposed to against it, we've seen the dark side, some might say, and how new technologies can be used against human rights. And, uh, and we really want to create some emphasis on that and, and um, put together some momentum to, um, uh, to address this, these challenges. So specifically, we have the Copenhagen Pledge that everyone can sign on to. The key word here is multi-stakeholder approach. It's really something that we believe strongly in. So we need participation from everyone, civil society organizations, private sector, academia, um, and everyone is welcome to join the course. We have a line of action coalitions, which are multi-stakeholder partnerships. Um, and I will tell you a bit more about that after, uh, specifically one of them. And finally, we are creating a funding facility that will be launched later this year to really address and to strengthen this area and bringing together all the people that had the knowledge. Because from a Danish perspective, we do think regulation is an important tool in this space, but we need to do it the right way. How do we do it the right way? Well, then we need inputs from everyone industry, civil society, governments alike. Well, do you want to hit your last point and tell us a little bit about uh, an exciting development and one that many of us are working on in this space? Yeah, sure, I would be happy to. So I mentioned the Action Coalitions. One per, uh, specifically that we have launched together with the US is the Global um, Partnership for Action on Gender-Based Online Harassment and Abuse. And within this action coalition, um, we, we work together to address online gender-based violence and to protect women and girls online to really strengthen them. The partnership has three strategic objectives for now. Um, and let me also say this is work that we, we're still, um, we are still formalizing the specific objectives, but what we have identified uh, so far as the needs, and this has been challenged early on the round table this morning, which is excellent, that's why we're here, uh, is first and foremost to develop shared principles. Second is uh, to increase targeted programming and resources in this field. And finally, to expand reliable, comparable data, because we do think that these things are uh, missing, missing and the access to it. Now, we heard from the industry at the roundtable this morning that lots of things are happening in this space right now, which is fantastic. We want to put it together and, and just really set some speed on the process, right? Because it's a problem, as we mentioned, that exists, even though we're aware of it, it still exists. How do we tackle this? We need to do this now. So um, we have an advisory board uh, as part of this action coalition, and this is where we would love for everyone to, 
to come with inputs. So if you have any ideas, please see this as an open invitation for everyone to join and we would love to get all your inputs and insights. So it's really open and it's led by Denmark and the US, as I mentioned, and then we have other countries on board, um, Australia, Canada, uh, Kenya is there together with the UK as well. So that was my fast speech. I don't want to take all the time, of course. And that's great. And I have to say, uh, this has been a labor of love for a very long time at NDI. My colleague, Sandra Pepper, has been leading this work for, for a number of years at NDI. And what we really thought this year is that we're catching the wave of a more positive approach to this and really looking at the solutions. We were kind of done with telling everyone what a big problem it was. Um, so, so now that we've all accepted it's a problem, let's move on to solution. And on that front, I would really love to just get a sense from the panel um, it, you know, one of the great things about this process is we identified solutions in the government space, in the tech space, uh, and within civil society. Um, and, and I'd love to get a sense from you as to like, what, what's the one that wakes you up? And it's like, if we could do that, that, that would make a huge difference. And that would be something we can mobilize behind. We asked this question of a lot of different women around the world. So, you know, we'll get kind of a representative sample. Um, before you do that, I just want to also say at the outset, I, I tried to make it clear, but I'm going to clarify it even more. We all take the approach that if we can make the world, this digital space, better for 50% of the global population, we are opening the door to really learn more about how we do that for marginalized groups, be they dis disabled, organi or disabled organizations and representatives of uh, politically active uh, uh, people in the disabilities community and minority populations and, uh, you know, uh, to, to make it truly the inclusive internet that we, that we want. Um, but I want to start, anyone want to jump in with like, what's, what's the one that jumped out at you? Maybe even Nagat at, in your round table, what, what jumped out at you? Yeah, um, so um, uh, I would like to talk about two solutions. One which was endorsed by the woman, Pakistani women who were uh, at the round table. Um, and as I mentioned about the regulation, there was a lot of opposition against uh, another a new law and um, a lot of suggestions around amending the current one that we have. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there, was, uh, there was a concern in terms of uh, trusting uh, law enforcement and the government bodies, the way they have reacted in, in the last couple of years. Uh, so we have a cyber harassment helpline. It's a local solution, right? So we started in 2016, where um, a woman from all over Pakistan can call us if they are facing cyber harassment on online violence. Um, and then we provide them um, digital security advice, legal advice, and mental well-being counseling. So this has been really, really uh, successful. Um, and uh, I, would I would like to talk about the global solution that I'm part of. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a member of oversight board of Meta. And, uh, and I know there are like lots of uh, sort of, you know, uh, concerns around, you know, such a solution by the company. But, but I think uh, uh, being part of the board for the last more than two years, I feel that the kind of decisions that we have made um, and the recommendations that we have given, 108 recommendations, and those recommendations are binding on the company. So it's the board which sort of uh, looks into the content moderation decision of uh, Facebook and Instagram. So the recommendations that we have given, what we have seen in, uh, in our uh, reports that we have released, uh, the imp partially implementing or the fully implementing rate of those recommendations are 64 percent. So at least we are seeing success. And I think this is one, one of the first uh, self-regulatory model of a company that, uh, that I'm being part of. And I think this is one kind of solution that the other companies can look into. There is no one solution to address online violence against women. We all need to play our role as a civil society, as companies, governments, um, yeah, and, and, and uh, legislature, and also the Global North organizations. One thing that I really, it's very close to my heart, we talk about Global South a lot, and I would like to say we are not Global South, we are Global Majority. And it's so important, <laughs> it's so important when we talk about, it's a lot of labor 
that we women activists do on the ground. But when it comes to sharing resources, you know, we are always left behind uh, because the way our governments behave, the way we have regulatory repressive models, and the way we cannot get those resources. So I think something that maybe Helena can look into, that uh, when the Western democracies join hands together to address some solution, don't leave us behind, because we are the ones who are doing the work on the ground. <laughs> Amalia or Tracy? Yeah, I am very excited about being able to build technical solutions for a problem that has maybe not been created by technology originally, but definitely amplified. It's not as if politicians in the past didn't get heckled or receive abuse, but what's possible now at digital scale, consumer web scale, is that all these people can dogpile pile on. And so whereas before you might have had a square full of people mad at you, heckling you. Now it can be thousands, millions of people coming at you online. And so when the problems are at this scale, the solutions also have to be, at least some of the solutions have to be at this scale. Mm -hmm. Um, and what we're doing with Block Party is very exciting to me as like one version of this, like starting to automate things using technology to defend against some of these attack vectors. Um, the thing that I really want to keep harping on is we need technology platform companies like Meta to open up much more so that we can continue building these solutions. Mm -hmm. What's happening right now with some of these platforms is they'll say like, okay, we, we hear you. It's a priority, but not a priority, because we have many other priorities. <laughs> and we're not going to build these things. But we'll also not allow anybody else to build anything. And then we end up getting stuck, where there are people who actually want to build solutions and can't, because the platforms have locked down. And so the fact that some platforms are starting to move in this direction, Twitter is one, Twitch and Discord, um, they have these moderation APIs that allow people to more programmatically control their spaces and define safety for themselves is very encouraging. But I think regulation can move us along much faster. Well, and Amalia, if you, I, I think also your perspective on how this impacts democracy, right? Um, and how we sort of use it as the game changer to, yeah, to make uh, a difference on that front. This is, at the end of the day, this is a social problem, so no one is going to solve this alone. We need to join together and do, try to work on, on, on thinking how we can um, improve <laughs> the online space for women uh, and, and many other <laughs> people that cannot be there safely. Um, but one thing definitely coming from a region that is with such disparity as well, I always think about Central America, how Central America is so forgotten from funding, from platform, from everyone. And, and there are people there, there are activists there doing a lot of work, very important uh, work, uh, putting themselves on the line of, uh, of defending whoever is having a bad situation online on platforms uh, with very little resources or no resources at all. Uh, they don't get to be heard by the platforms. And when they reach out to the platforms, they feel like they're not listening to me. I don't get any answer from them. Uh, and that's important just to, to be present in these in this other communities, in this other country that maybe is not your market, but the problem is still there. <laughs> it's happening there, and they, they need to be present as well there, because it's a huge problem there. Um, at the same time, I think that we need to hold people accountable, also the politicians and, and our governments. Uh, one good news, maybe, to share is last week in, in Colombia, a court decided that um, um, political parties and political movement are responsible to sanction um, their members when violence occurred toward to, to others, uh, 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 opponents or opposition. Uh, in particularly, the case um, is framed with a woman journalist that complained that it doesn't matter where <laughs> the political spectrum of the political party, they were getting a lot of uh, uh, online harassment and nothing was happening. No one was saying anything. So the, the, the decision is basically saying to political parties and also to the National Electoral Commission, uh, like, you know, you have to work on this uh, because this is perversive for women. This is not uh, um, 
you know, it has an effect in democracy as well. Uh, so this is one good uh, <laughs> decision that we have. We have still to see how it's enforced, but at least we have a core saying like recognizing how big the problem of gender-based violence online is and, and how, how political parties are also responsible for that. Absolutely. I want to, uh, we're running really short on time, so I want to like take questions, but maybe like take two and then let our panel kind of answer them and, and wrap up. Does anyone have a question? If not, I think we have one. Um, I can kind of read it. Um, <laughs> I can. Let's see. Death wrecks are illegal in the same jurisdictions. Okay, so I think we're talking a little bit about, um, oh, thank you for that. Um, um, what do you see, what do you see for identity and managing harassment online? Um, does opening up more third party developers also increase the chance of risky features and tools? So, right, I, I think in both cases, what we're talking about is the, the, the challenge that we have here is that, one, we have to bring these three entities together to work together. Two, every environment is different, right? Some places legislation works, other places it absolutely does not. Um, and some tech solutions help, but they come at a cost, right? Like we even heard about Twitter's new adaption today, added eight more, qu you know, eight questions from four, but it's a better system. So which do you, you know, we're, we're making choices and we're still learning. Um, so um, I guess I'd open it up to the panel and see if you guys have any comments on either of these two questions. I'm happy to talk about this third party developer question um, around the potential of like risky features and tools. We're always looking at trade-offs in all of these tools we build. Even for platform native features, if you think about some anti-harassment controls, they often then trade off misinformation or other things. So for example, Twitter has a um, feature to allow you to limit replies, which can really cut down on harassment, but often that is also the space that people fact check misinformation. Um, Facebook has tools to allow you to block certain keywords, which is very good for blocking certain types of harassment, but it also can be used for censoring discussion around particular topics that you don't care about. So all of these things come with trade-offs. Um, even for some of the anti-abuse tooling we're building for Block Party, we have to consider that it can be abused. And past implementations of things like shared block lists have been abused where certain people were kind of like snuck onto these lists that got widely disseminated and then they were locked out of all the conversation. So it is important to think about all of these potential ways in which even anti-abuse tools can be abused. I don't think that means we don't build them. I think that means we are more thoughtful about what can happen, what are the mitigations. Um, one misconception people often have around APIs and opening up platforms is assuming that it's all or nothing. It is also possible to open up selectively things like muting and blocking and reporting, which will maybe not be as damaging on the front if they're not allowing people to automatically post or friend people on your behalf. Um, but it's more around defensive measures that can't be automated. The other question um, was around the role of identity in um, abuse and is it important that like, we consider identity for trying to create consequences? Um, and it was talk the question I think was talking about in different jurisdictions, like it is illegal to issue death threats. I would call out that there is a difference between um, consequences on a platform and consequences offline in certain jurisdictions. So you don't necessarily need to unveil somebody's identity to restrict their access on the platform so they can't post anymore or they don't get distribution through the algorithms that are recommending their content. So there are other types of consequences that can be created on the platform side. And then we can also talk about what it translates to in the, in the offline world. I think there are a lot of risks in being able to unmask people. Uh, and again, this is one of those things where it can go either way. Like there are activists or dissidents who really need to have anonymity. Yeah. And so allowing you know, law enforcement to be able to ask for the unmasking is actually very dangerous in different regimes. Um, and I think there's often this false link between identity uh, or lack of identity online and bad behavior. Plenty of people do bad things under their real names. Yeah. <laughs> so just saying that like, you know, we're gonna associate your real identity to does not mean it's gonna make harassment go away. And trying to remove anonymity can have a lot of other very negative consequences. Any last words before I sort of wrap it up? I know we didn't have 
as much time for questions, but everyone is here. Like I said, NDI is going to be sharing a lot of these interventions uh, that we've been working on. Um, before we wrap, I just have one more announcement, and that's because, you know, we all got here. We spent a year doing this. Uh, I'd like to thank my colleagues who helped on that. I mentioned Sandra, but I'd also like to mention Kaylee Schwabe, who's sitting right up here in front and doesn't know that I know it's her birthday today. So if you'd all join me on three and wishing Kaylee a happy birthday. One, two, three. Happy, happy birthday! birthday. <laughs> So like I said, I'd just like to thank our panelists again for joining us, and please look forward to much more great work from all of them, and thank you all for joining us in addressing this solvable problem for democracy. <laughs>
Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. Hi everybody. Welcome back from the coffee break. We're gonna go ahead and get started uh, a little bit behind schedule. Uh, I hope that you're well caffeinated. Uh, we're gonna begin a segment now with some of the leaders in government who are doing some of the most important work uh, in doing, actually doing the work and implementing a bunch of things uh, from government at the crossroads of democracy and technology. Uh, now, after the session that we're about to have, we're gonna join our friends at RightsCon live uh, and hear from the U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken and Nobel Laureate Maria Ressa. But first, we're really excited to welcome back to the stage uh, again. Last year, we were lucky enough to have two of the leading drafters of the European Union's soon-to-be Digital Services and Digital Markets Act to talk to us then about what they had in mind, what they were trying to accomplish, and what they expected. Now we're on the eve of passage of these genuinely transformational potential laws, once in a generation rewriting of the digital rules. And we're lucky to welcome them back on stage to share a little bit about what they think comes next, how they're looking at implementation, and all sorts of other things that I am not going to pretend to make up for them. So without further ado, I want to invite first Kate Klonick, who's a professor at St. John's University, up to the stage to get us started. Thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rose. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Kate Klonick. Um, I'm a professor at St. John's Law School um, and a fellow at the Brookings Institution and the Yale Information Society Project. Um, and my research and writing for the last decade have focused on content moderation and online speech governance on private pl platforms. So I am especially excited to be here to moderate what should be a fascinating panel, the Digital Services and Markets Act Package, What Happened and What Comes Next, Two of the leading drafters, with two of the leading drafters of the regulations, Prabhat Agarwal, head of unit of digital services and platforms at DG Connect European Commission, and Gerard de Graff, director for digital transformation at DG Connect at the European Commission. So welcome to you both, and thank you for being here to talk to us about the DSA and the DMA. Um, I wanted to start with a little bit of framing and perspective. So it was just a year ago, as Rose mentioned, that you were, had joined this conference virtually to discuss the process of framing the DSA. For those uninitiated, the Digital Service Act, or the DSA, aims to protect users' rights to freedom of expression while also empowering them to report illegal content, protecting their privacy, and allowing them to see why certain online ads or content are shown to them. 
its companion act, the Digital Markets Act, or DMA, which establishes a set of narrowly defined objective criteria for qualifying a large online platform as a so-called gatekeeper, is a type of competition protecting, uh, competition protecting bill. And these EU bills are the first of its kind, comprehensive regulatory framework for governing digital services. The DMA and DSA provide rules across a range of topics, from liability to content moderation, from transparency reporting to competition, with global implications as numerous other countries attempt to tackle the same issues. I wanted to start out by asking both of you, on the eve of this act, like rocketing through drafting, um, what your thoughts have been on the process generally, but in the last year in particular since you joined this conference. And I'll start with you, Prabhat. Thanks, Kate. Uh, well, it's been a roller coaster, I have to say. You know, so first of all, I, I I would say there's been an amazing amount of support for the kind of uh, initiatives and ideas that we put forward. Since we spoke last summer, um, we took um, the proposals to the Council of the EU, which is where all 27 member states come together, and um, both the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act <coughs> were supported unanimously. Uh, by all member states uh, in a very relatively short period of time after we spoke, so less than 12 months after we presented the proposals in November um, of last year. And then a, a very short period after that, in December of last year, um, the European Parliament voted its position on, on these two acts, also again with overwhelming majorities. So I, I, I think the highlight really has been um, this amazing amount of political support that we had across all political parties, across all member states for the kind of ideas that we are putting forward. That's, I think, the highlight for me in the last 12 months. And of course, then it led to a, a, a very quick agreement um, early on in the first quarter. And now we're in the finalization process. So the main takeaway was when I spoke to you, oh, together with Gerard last, last time here, I think we didn't. We knew that there was a lot of support. We didn't quite anticipate that there was this much support. You know, that's how I would, uh, I would say. I, I would fully uh, agree to that. I, I think what was particularly heartening was to see that the approach which we had taken, which was a systemic approach, so and a, a kind of the, the platforms needed to be regulated on the systemic risks that they pose to society. That that approach which in a way was actually inspired by banking regulation, was st strongly endorsed, uh, that it's important that platforms have kind of risk management in place, that they have due diligence obligations. I think that, so the discussion wasn't on what we call the architecture, on the fundamentals of the proposals. It was more, and, and that was another interesting fact, is we thought we had made an ambitious proposal in December 2020, and, and, and typically what you've have in, in a negotiation with the council and the parliament is that they try to put it down a little bit and then you end up somewhere around the original proposal. Here we had both the council and the parliament saying it's ambitious, but it's not yet ambitious enough. So the, actually the end result, the, 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 the kind of the, the, the measure as it was adopted at the end is even more ambitious than we would be proposed in December 20, 2020. And I think that's, that's uh, unique. I mean, I don't think we have uh, lived that very, very often. I think on the DMA, a bit the same approach here to say, look, we, we cannot rely on antitrust rules alone. I mean, the movement, I mean, the, the, the market is, 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 is moving very fast. We need to kind of to equip ourselves with uh, an instrument that can actually address these issues up front in an ex ante way, I think also there was a lot of support. And similarly to what happened on the DSA, I mean, we put forward, actually, I mean, Prabhat and I, we discussed, like, is, I mean, we put 18 unfair practices in the original proposal of the DMA. And I think we often ask ourselves the question, well, is this going to fly politically? Is this, is this what the market can bear? And, and interestingly, yes, and, and, and some of these proposals were further reinforced in the, in, in the process. So can we talk a little bit about how the DSA is going to be implemented? I think you've just, people have described it, you've described it as having a multi-layer process with many different like parties and stakeholders implementing different parts of it. Explain kind of how you got to that solution and how you envision it kind of playing out. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I can start. I can start um, maybe. First of all, 
just a sort of fundamental difference between the, the DSA, which deals more with um, content moderation and speech-related issues mm -hmm. and illegal content, disinformation. Of course, naturally speaking, language issues are a big factor there. You know, disinformation in, in one member state is very different from, from another member state. So the role that member states play in, uh, in the Digital Services Act is very different from the Digital Markets Act, where we're talking about unfair practices. And what's unfair in one country is also unfair in another country. So from the outset, the Digital Markets Act had foreseen a, a centralized enforcement by the European Commission of the rules on unfair trading, but a decentralized enforcement of the Digital Services Act, giving member states across, uh, across the European Union um, the main power. Now, like Gerhard was saying in the previous intervention, actually, during the negotiations, member states said, well, actually, we would really like to bundle this power in the European Commission as well yeah. and have the European Commission be the primary enforcer. So that's one layer. Of course, we still have to work with member states' authorities because we don't speak all the languages. We don't understand all the national context and the nuances, and we see particularly in the field of disinformation, enormous sophistication of actors in, uh, in spreading disinformation which requires local and cultural context. I think there's a second element to this is that multi-layer enforcement means that action by the regulator. It also means actually um, in empowering third parties like civil society actors to uh, uncover things, and we've seen journalists' investigations or civil society investigations in the United States, you know, organizations such as ProPublica have shown the light on, on some of the shortcomings or some of the, you know, problems out there. We, we have seen that these are very powerful levers for actions and for change. And so we've built into the Digital Services Act, but also into the Digital Markets Act, powerful transparency and accountability levers that, that actually activate this. This is a second layer, I would say, of, of, of enforcement. And then there's, of course, uh, new powers for the users uh, here are, that we put yes. in as well. Huh? I mean, there'll be notice and action. So all of us, we will have a role. If we see something on the platform and we think it's illegal or it's, it's disinformation, you can notify that. And then the platform has to, it mm -hmm. becomes aware. Uh, it will have actual knowledge, which in the European Union triggers the, the, the liability, or at least uh, removes the liability exemption. And then there's a, a, an interaction, then the platform will have to explain what it has done. Has it removed it, not removed it? Also, the person who posted it will need to be brought into this discussion. So that's certainly something that is empowering, that uh, allows all of us to play an active role in, 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 in ensuring that kind of what is on the internet is safe and at the same time our fundamental rights are, are preserved. There's other elements there, the access of researchers, for example. For example, there's a legal base that gives researchers uh, a right of access, vetted researchers a right of access. They can look under the hood of the, of the platform. They can uncover uh, situations that uh, so far have escaped uh, our attention. So a platform can't say, sorry, but you're, you, you mean I'm not going to give you access. There's a, a, a legal ground for access. We will have independent audits. At least once a year, a platform will need to go undergo an independent audit where the auditor comes in and a bit like what an auditor does in a company or in a financial institution, in a bank, it just looks at all the systems and it will find also certain vulnerabilities that then will need to be addressed by the, by the platform. Uh, there will be reporting. Uh, the, 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 at the moment, there is reporting, but is it the kind of meaningful reporting which we would like, like to receive? We as regulators, I mean, the civil society, I mean, uh, the, the member states, I mean, that's, there, there will be kind of clear mm -hmm. templates for what we think is meaningful reporting. And then you can see also from the reports what platforms are in terms of, for example, content moderation, how much they are investing in content moderation in minority languages, as, a, as an example. So this is a multi-layer. It's not just the European Commission, which of course will be the central enforcement authority, but it is a multi-layer, multi-stakeholder kind of uh, enforcement uh, structure that I think can, can work if we all contribute to, uh, to, to making it work. And I know we are on a quick timeline today because we have something coming up on this shortly. So I'm going to skip to kind of the DMA and speaking about the DMA, if we come back, I'll, I have a couple of follow-up questions on the DSA. But um, one of the things that, um, that the DSA has kind of, or the DMA had, uh, one critique of the DMA was that it effectively kind of forfeits competition and consumer choice as a way of shaping platform behavior in favor of having kind of more heavily regulated entities. And 
obviously the DMA is an important answer to that. And so can you talk a little bit more about how the DMA and particularly explain the gatekeeper function and the gatekeeper label and how that will work for the companies? So um, the notion of a gatekeeper actually simply uh, is meant to reflect the fact that um, there are certain situations where platforms intermediate access between an enormous amount of end users, you and me, and, and a large number of businesses. You know, one of the clearest examples are app stores. So app stores, there you have millions of developers and, and billions of users of app stores, you know, but you only really have two app stores at least in the, in the, in, in the Western, Western world. So that, that actually means that in a gatekeeper function is that somebody who sets the rules of the game at the same time you know, has n leaves no opportunity for people to go around it. So uh, we have this notion that there is a, there's a dependency relationship between uh, um, business users and end users by a gatekeeper, through a gatekeeper, that there, um, there is a certain amount of financial power associated with this uh, um, relationship. Um, so it needs to have a, a certain amount of turnover to qualify uh, uh, as a gatekeeper. And the situation needs to be entrenched. So it's not just a, a quick uh, a flash in the pan like situation, but over multiple years, the situation persists. And, and these criteria are spelled out in the law, in black letter law, they're back, backed by uh, an impact assessment where we looked at the, the different market characteristics that, that were going on. And what is really meant to ref be captured here is the unusual network effects, data-driven network effects that lead to a kind of a, this particular situation of, of, of lock-in or dependency uh, and, and, and that, that characterizes the, the platform economy. Okay. Gerard, would you, characterize, would you characterize how the DMA thinks about platforms as thinking of them as utilities, thinking about them as regulate, regulating them as, as in the US as we refer to as common carriers or some type of like basic function that is necessary to be regulated rather than left wholly up to competition? Well, I mean, they are gatekeepers. So if you are like a small business or you're a small hotel, I mean, it's very difficult to be successful uh, if, you, if you don't partner with Booking.com. or you've, It's very difficult, very hard to be successful if you ignore Amazon as a marketplace so because you, 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 you basically forego a very important part of potential turnover. And then we have observed practices like self-preferencing, um, tying uh, certain conditions that are being imposed. You cannot offer better deals for your hotel outside of the, of the platform that we have. And, and so the political uh, decision makers in the European Union have now defined as unfair and, and therefore should be prohibited. There are other kind of practices. So these are the don'ts, is the do's. Uh, companies that say, look, I, I, I'm providing services for example, through the App Store. I'm a, an editor. I sell a newspaper through the App Store. I have no idea who the customers are. I have no relationship with the customer. I can't get the data, even kind of consistent with the GDPR. I cannot find out who the customers are and then maybe tailor a bit my product more to, to their expectations. So that, that, that's a do. Uh, giving access to, to data is a, is a requirement, interoperability, that is also foreseen. So those practices, I mean, now need to be implemented. It will have a fundamental effect on, 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 on the business models of these gatekeepers. I mean, think about sideloading, uh, the App Store. You will, in, in the future, you'll be able to download apps that do not come through the App Store if you have an iPhone. So in a way, we break open that ecosystem. Well, that would be fundamental changes, but we think these fundamental changes are necessary. And the argument like regulation is per se bad for competition, well, it's the other way around. We, we don't see another way, I mean, through competition policy, for example, to, to get rid of what we, 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 we consider these uh, unfair practices. We believe that this will unleash a lot of innovation, a lot of competition, benefits for, for the user, benefits for businesses, benefits for, for app developers. So the argument, oh, this is regulation, and therefore must be kind of constraining and, and reducing innovation, we reject uh, completely out of hand. So one of the, finally, I think this will be our last question, but one of the final kind of critiques or one of the major critiques of um, the, the GDPR um, and now the DSA um, and DMA is that EU is essentially regulating 
um, for the world for, from this place of, of kind of, of market power and also kind of an ability. You actually have a, function, a, semi, a mostly functioning uh, legislative process, unlike other countries I won't name. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, but there is uh, just, can you say a little bit about the criticism around the Brussels effect and, like, and whether or not like, that's even necessarily a bad thing in this context? And I, I think the fact is that other regions are struggling with similar problems is, is, is not a kind of secret. You know, and people around the world share problem analysis on how, we, how, do we, how do we fight, you know, fake news or disinformation campaigns while preserving freedom of expression? How do we ensure that the markets that are dominated by these very platforms with very strong network effects that we maintain possibilities for competitive entry and, and fair, fair practices? You know, we're not the only jurisdiction that, that has kind of strugg struggling with this. So I would say that the problem definition is really widely shared uh, uh, across the globe. Now, the fact is not everybody is going to come to a solution or is not necessarily going to come to the same solution. I think that's also normal because there are different legal systems out there. For the DSA, where fundamental rights are at stake and freedom of expression is at stake, I think it's very important that we kind of orient ourselves with international human rights norms. That's what we try to do um, in, uh, in, in, the, in the drafting of the process. But even looking beyond, I think that these are also opportunities for cooperation at a global sc uh, stage, you know, in the next stage during the implementation. And one thing I often say is that the DSA in particular is, a, is going to be a, a huge data generation ma machine. And I think we'll need um, to cooperate across borders <coughs> to, uh, uh, to harness that data and to create insights, you know, and, and this is a little bit how we view in this context, the Brussels effect is not necessarily us imposing rules on everyone else, but just to creating a platform for collaboration on important issues. Gerard, do you know? I mean, our, our mandate is to regulate for Europe. Uh, we don't regulate for the world. Uh, even though some of the companies are outside of the European Union, they target the European Union and therefore they are within scope. When we were kind of making the proposals and when they were regulated, we were mindful of the kind of, at least say, the that the DSA and the DMA could become a reference point for other countries around the world. And I think if you look at, at it rather broadly, you see three models, particularly in, in terms of like the, the, the regulating the internet, less so for kind of the, the DMA. And one model is the, the Chinese, Russian, Turkey model, which is a very repressive uh, model. It's a very kind of authoritarian model. You have the European model, and then you have a model which Hopefully, it will be changing, but it's, of course, that depends on, on kind of political developments, which is a laissez-faire model, which is the U.S. model, at least until quite recently. And we think that, as Prabhat said, there's a lot of countries. We're being approached very, very intensively by countries around the world who want to know and ask many of the questions that no doubt cross your mind. Why this? Why not that? Etc. So we are spending a lot of time on explaining because these countries are also looking to regulate, are looking to legislate. So they're looking for a source of inspiration. I mean, we have therefore also a very important responsibility to make sure that it works, that it can work. So the implementation is going to be very critical. But we will want to offer I think as democratic societies, and, and, and we work a lot with the US in the TTC, and the problem analysis I think is shared, we will need to offer to, as democratic societies, an attractive alternative to those countries who kind of are either already implementing kind of repressive policies like China and Russia, but there's a lot of countries who are like on the fence, who in the next, say, couple of months and years are going to decide which type of regulatory model are we going to join. Is it the Chinese, Russian, Turkish model or is it like the European model and hopefully which will kind of the more, more kind of intervention also on the US side. I think that is the key question for the next couple of years and if that's called the Brussels effect, it's fine for us. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was, um, this was fast but wonderful and I think that we got to do kind of a very high level kind of understanding of both the, draft, the role of the drafting and the multi-stakeholder nature of it, the multi-stakeholder nature of implementation. Um, and uh, we will see where the DSA is next year, hopefully. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. We're hustling up here because we are just about to get to the most exciting part, although that's unfair to say to the people that just left the stage, one of the most exciting parts of our conference, 
Uh, we're about to hear from RightsCon. We're going to beam them onto our stage. We're going to have a little bit of a conversation. We're going to hear from the White House that's here with us, the actual White House. Uh, and then we're going to hear from the Secretary of State in conversation with Maria Reza. Um, I think any moment now, we're going to get a little ping, and we should see Melissa Chan somewhere on our stage. So then we'll get to say hi to them. As we're getting ready for that, Graham. <laughs> Could not be more excited about this uh, conversation. Uh, the thing about RightsCon, uh, we've partnered with RightsCon throughout this entire conference. Uh, there have been sessions that have been live streamed to RightsCon, which is Welcome happening. Welcome oh. to day two of RightsCon and in conversation the next 30 minutes. That's exactly right. Secretary Welcome to day two of RightsCon. Anthony Blinken as well as 360. And Nobel Peace Prize the thing about technology. and journalist from the Philippines, Maria Reza. Now, we're doing this slightly differently. Uh, in this segment, we are actually partnering with the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Lab, That's who us. are having their summit in Brussels. It's called 360 Open Summit, and there is Rose Jackson and Graham Brookie right now. Hello. Hello. Hi, guys. How's it going? How are you guys doing? We're doing great, and we've got an awesome crowd here in Brussels that are really excited to see you. We're hoping that we'll have you up on the screen here soon. How's RightsCon been going? I don't think I can hear you guys on my end. <laughs> Is this where we're all supposed to make jokes about how anything that has to do with technology requires nothing to work on technology? This is the intersection Hello, of and democracy. Graham. I'm so sorry, but I can't hear you guys. I hope. <laughs> it's, uh. For the in-person audience, this is the intersection between democracy and technology, very clearly. <laughs> this is why we're trying to solve a bunch of problems here, including the live stream. There we go. So unfortunately, for technical reasons, I couldn't quite hear Rose and Graham at all. But I presume that they've uh, introduced me and said hello. And of course, just to let you know a little bit about what's happened in the, next, uh, in the last day at RightsCon, uh, it's been amazing. Uh, for those of you who don't know, in Brussels, right, on is an incredible summit. More than 8,500 participants from over 150 countries and hundreds of events from workshops to panels have been taking place in the last 24 hours and for the rest of the week. Uh, no surprises, a lot of the concerns uh, in Brussels are also be being discussed here, including surveillance, whether it is authoritarian surveillance uh, but also surveillance capitalism, for example. Uh, people are also very concerned about facial recognition technology, artificial intelligence in general, uh, and so on. So it makes a lot of sense for the two organizations uh, to host this joint event. Thank you, Melissa. I'm not sure if you can hear us yet, uh, but just to say that we're super excited to have this partnership as well, and all of the issues you just talked about are the same things that we're talking about here. And we're even more excited to be able to partner together to bring common programming on many of those topics themselves. I want to make sure that I don't waste any more of our time and bring on stage with us. We're very lucky to be joined by the Senior Director at the White House for Democracy and Human Rights and a special assistant to the President, Rob Bershinsky, who's going to come up and share some remarks before we get to the main event of the Secretary of State and Maria Reza. Rob. Welcome, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Hi, everybody. I feel like that was uh, kind of the equivalent of what we've all experienced in terms of giving our speech on Zoom with the, with the mute button still on. So uh, thanks, thanks, Rose. Uh, thanks, Melissa, if you're still out there, and to uh, everybody at RightsCon. Uh, and thanks to DFR Lab for putting on uh, this session and for the opportunity to join you uh, to introduce uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and Maria Reza. It's been a real pleasure to have spent the last two days participating in discussions at the forefront of democracy and human rights. And I say that really with everyone here in mind, but particularly with respect to those truly on the front lines who have felt the impact for the struggle for human rights and democracy in deeply personal ways. These are women like Lena Al-Hathul and Kareen Kanimba, someone I had the chance to speak in depth with a couple of nights ago, and also the woman that we'll hear from shortly, Maria Reza. Before we turn to that interview, I want to take a few moments to reflect on what President Biden and so many of you, both in the room and at home, know is a key challenge of our time, demonstrating that democracy rather than autocracy is best poised 
to deliver for its citizens. In December, as I hope most in the room know, President Biden hosted 100 governmental leaders, democratic opposition figures, activists, and business and civil society leaders from around the world in what we termed the first Summit for Democracy. Both Secretary Blinken and Maria Reza spoke at the summit on a panel focused on media freedom and sustainability. And that issue alone reflects the ramifications that technology has had on the world around us. A free media is, of course, the bedrock of pluralistic discourse and a healthy democratic society. But in the digital age, as many of you also know, uh, has fundamentally altered the business model that has sustained and enabled independent journalism now for decades. One recent study suggests that the move to digital advertising alone eliminated nearly $24 billion in annual advertising revenue for public interest media between 2017 and last year, 2021. The economic vulnerability of media has resulted in its capture and closure around the world. And this trend has, of course, been further compounded by governments who seek to silence critical voices through internet shutdowns, censorship, digital harassment, and political and regulatory pressure that incentivizes acquiescence or leads to media capture. At the same time, digital technologies have enabled individuals, groups, and governments to create, disseminate, and amplify manipulated information for their own political, ideological, and commercial interests. So now we're at a point in time where the costs of producing high-quality journalism are high, while the costs of disseminating false information and silencing critical voices, like the one we'll hear from shortly, are relatively low. And communities around the world are being impacted by this every day, not least in the United States, where an estimated quarter of newspapers have closed in just the last 15 years. And that means fewer local, trusted voices informing our debate. So all of us joining in the 360 OS and, and in RightsCon are keenly aware of the human rights impacts of this and other technology-enabled challenges. And while this could be a moment of despair, the breadth of debate, discussion, and participation at events like this reflects another new trend, one where governments and activists and companies are increasingly working together, trying to break down their silos to productively design for and mitigate the risks from new technologies. And we know authoritarian governments and other actors will continue to develop and abuse technologies for their own political and financial benefit. We know they seek to rewrite the rules of the international system and the norms that govern technology. So that's why the Biden administration is driving an agenda in which critical and emerging technologies work for and not against democratic societies. To give one example, two months ago, the United States launched with 60 of our partners around the world the Declaration for the Future of the Internet. It's a political commitment among declaration partners to advance a positive vision for the internet and digital technologies. We're backing our political commitment with expanded investments to support internet freedom, as well as digital safety and security for targeted groups while improving cybersecurity. And in parallel, under the auspices of the Summit for Democracy, we've launched hundreds of millions of new dollars in programming to expand our support for free and independent media, to fight corruption, to bolster democratic reformers, and defend free and fair election processes. And in the wake of Russia's aggression against Ukraine, we further expanded our investments in Europe and Eurasia in, in these thematic areas. We're also working to more effectively hold to account those who abuse technology to unlawfully surveil and harass human rights defenders journalists and opposition leaders, just as Melissa was uh, mentioning in the intro in terms of the discussion at RightsCon. Yesterday, panelists stood on this stage and detailed harrowing accounts of being targeted via commercial spyware technology, among other forms of what we in the US government are increasingly referring to as transnational repression. The United States views the unlawful or inappropriate use of this technology as a national security issue 
So in October of last year, we updated our export control rules governing items that can be used for malicious cyber activities. And then in November, we added four foreign companies, including but not limited to NSO Group, to the Department of Commerce's entity list, based on evidence that these firms developed and supplied spyware to foreign governments that then used the tools provided to maliciously target government officials, journalists, business people, activists, and embassy workers. And we intend to do much more in this space using all the tools at our disposal. At the same time, we're placing renewed emphasis on supporting multi-stakeholder initiatives like the Freedom Online Coalition and the OSCD's work on reinforcing democracy. Just over one year ago, we joined the Christchurch call to eliminate terrorist and violent extremist content online. And then in November, we announced our support for the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace. And we're working also with key allies and partners on new initiatives, like the Global Partnership to, for Action to End Online Harassment and Abuse, and as those in, here in Brussels know well, the US-EU Trade and Technology Council. Yet we know that no single commitment, program, or action is going to resolve all of the challenges that we've been discussing over the course of the last few days and that we'll hear momentarily from the US Secretary of State. Russia's aggression in Ukraine underscores the importance of taking a holistic approach to continuing threats to democracy, diplomatically, militarily, economically, and in the information realm. But by working together, by doing exactly what all of you are here doing today, governments, advocates, researchers, and the private sector together across disciplines, regions, and responsibilities, we can and we are driving change that's going to prove to be asymmetrically advantageous for democracies. We're pursuing efforts to close the gap in digital access and driving innovation in ways that are going to foster inclusion, equity, and accountability and support human rights rather than undermining them. So momentarily, Secretary Blinken will provide more on the breadth of efforts that the US is taking to advance this agenda in his interview with Maria Reza. Maria and her team at Rappler and so many other journalists, human rights defenders, and activists, including many of you here in Brussels and online, have demonstrated courage and commitment against a global tide of democratic backsliding. So with that, I'm very pleased to announce a woman who epitomizes courage and conviction, Nobel Peace Prize winning journalist Maria Reza in conversation with the US Secretary of State, Tony Blinken. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much again. I'm Maria Ressa from the Philippines. What an honor to have U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken with us today at a crucial moment for all of us working ah, for a better digital rights world. Secretary Blinken, thank you for joining us. Maria, great to be with you and great to be with everyone. Um, this is uh, really a pleasure for me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be uh, hosted by uh, RightsCon, to be talking to you. I want to say greetings to everyone uh, from the uh, 360 uh, Open Summit and from around the world uh, who is in one way or another um, logged on, tuned in, uh, and joining this conversation. Uh, you know, it's so important from our perspective that the United States, like-minded governments, uh, but especially with civil society, uh, with NGOs, with think tanks, with the private sector, um, work to protect human rights online, uh, work to demonstrate that um, our democracies can deliver for people as we navigate this extraordinary digital transformation that is having an impact on the lives of virtually everyone uh, on this planet. One thing I wanted to say at the outset before we get into a, a conversation is I am very pleased to announce that for the first time uh, the United States will become chair of the Freedom Online Coalition um, in, uh, in 2023. Uh, we want to strengthen the coalition. We want to bring uh, more members on board. Uh, we want to make it a center of action uh, for ensuring um, a free and open digital future. Um, and this, in part, is going to be building on Canada's terrific work as the current chair and, and uh, really trying to carry it forward. So I'm really pleased to do that, uh, to be able to announce that. And Maria, it's great to be with you. Um, you have been, you are an extraordinarily uh, courageous champion of um, freedom of speech, freedom of the pre uh, of press and media, and freedom uh, for a, um, a digital future that we all want 
uh, and uh, we hope to build together. So thank you for being uh, willing to have this conversation today. Well, you know, that that's really great to hear from you, Mr. Secretary, for, for exactly at this moment in time when, you know, there, it, it seems at times hopeless. And you never want to be hopeless, right? So let, let me ask you, you, you've been very outspoken about the, the way digital authoritarians have used tech to abuse human rights, you know, a growing trend, people like us on the front lines, increasingly defenseless. I mean, what have you seen globally and, and what can you do about it? So you're right. Unfortunately, that's exactly what we're seeing. Look, I think, uh, as in so many ways, when we saw the emergence of a lot of this technology starting mostly in the 1990s, the early 2000s, I think there was great hope uh, that it would be uh, inexorably a force for openness, transparency, freedom. And of course, in many ways it is. But we're also seeing, of course, the abuse of this technology in, in, in various ways, including by repressive governments, trying to control populations, to stifle dissent, uh, to surveil and censor. Uh, we see that, of course, in, um, uh, in the PRC, uh, with uh, technology being used, for example, for mass surveillance, including uh, of the, uh, the Uyghurs and other minorities. So the question is, what is to be done? Uh, what do we do about it? And there are a number of things that we need to do, and in fact, that we are doing. One is to start by calling things out. Uh, that's the, often the basis for everything. We have to call out the abuse of technology, uh, including digital authoritarianism. Um, second, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to be taking on the chairmanship of the Freedom Online Coalition. We're working to strengthen it. And this is an important vehicle to try to protect and advance Internet freedom uh, and to push back against digital authoritarianism. Um, very practically speaking, there are a number of things that we, uh, countries, NGOs, and others are doing to, for example, get anti-censorship technology into the hands of uh, people who need it so that they have the tools to push back against the misuse of technology uh, in an authoritarian way. Uh, we set up a multinational fund uh, to do that uh, at the Summit for Democracy that we hosted last year. Uh, and then, for example, putting export controls on surveillance technology to make sure that technology that we and other countries are producing that could have a dual use and be misused uh, for the surveillance of populations, that doesn't get into the wrong hands. That takes working together. Uh, one country alone can't do it. Uh, and in fact, governments alone can't uh, effectively do it. We need to build these coalitions to make sure that we identify uh, where technology should not go because it's being misused, and then work to, uh, together to make sure that it doesn't get there. No, that I, I agree with working together. Mr. Secretary, you know that early on I said that uh, the tech platforms that took control uh, became the gatekeepers from journalists, abdicated responsibility mm. for protecting the public sphere. And in some ways, it's taken so long to get government regulations that in a way, governments have also abdicated responsibility. We're mm. just starting to see the beginning of these rollout in the spring from the EU, right? And, and yet we know the impact of disinformation. Um, the Philippines, we have seen disinformation repeatedly change our history. It's that Milan Kundera mm. quote, you know, the struggle of man against power. Well, we've forgotten really quickly. Mm. And this information is being used to manipulate our biology. Uh, where do you see what can you do about this? And how do we fight back, given that there are more than 30 elections this year mm. and you can't have integrity of elections? if you don't have integrity of facts. Mm. Couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, this has been one of the other changes that we thought was going to be totally for the good. Uh, but of course, that hasn't been the case. In the United States, a few decades ago, uh, information that uh, most people used on a, in their daily lives, there was a common foundation um, because there were actually uh, a fairly limited number of sources of the information that people got. We had three television networks back then. Uh, we didn't have cable. We didn't have an internet. Uh, we didn't have talk radio, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Um, and the hope, of course, was that the democratization of information uh, would be um, a, a good thing overall. And fundamentally, I believe that's still the case. But as a result of this, as a result of this disaggregation, uh, you've lost exactly what you said, which are sort of the trusted uh, mediators uh, who um, can make sure that information to the greatest extent possible is actually backed up by the, by the facts. Um, and 
at the same time, the technology itself uh, has allowed uh, the abuse uh, and the spreading of misinformation and disinformation in ways that we probably didn't fully anticipate uh, or imagine. So uh, we see authoritarian governments using this. Uh, we see it, for example, right now in the uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine. We saw it in 2014 uh, when uh, Russia initially went at Ukraine and was using information as a weapon of war. So in that particular instance, and in this instance, we've actually reversed this on them precisely by using information, real information, uh, to call out what we uh, uh, saw them preparing uh, and, uh, and, uh, and working to do. Uh, and being able to, to do that and to bring to the world uh, everything that we were seeing about the, the planned Russian aggression and to lay out exactly the steps they were likely to take, uh, and which unfortunately they did, I think has done um, uh, a profound service to making sure that um, uh, credible information is what carries the day and uh, disinformation is, uh, is undermined. But there are a number of things that we can hear again and we are doing to combat the misuse of information. Uh, again, we start by exposing it uh, and we start, we start by sharing the information that we have. Uh, working with others, again, in a coordinated way, we have at the State Department uh, something called the Global Engagement Center, uh, which is focused intensely on uh, finding, exposing disinformation, the techniques uh, that are used by those who are propagating it, and in a, a coordinated way, working with other, other countries, um, pushing back on it and giving people the tools to do it. Um, it's critical for us that we also build the capacity of partners around the world, uh, both governments, but also uh, journalists, uh, NGOs, civil society. Um, there are a number of things that we're doing. We have initiatives to help give people fact-checking tools uh, to make sure that the information that they're, they're, they're getting actually is backed up by the facts and to show when it's not. Um, digital literacy training, which is so critical um, uh, to understanding what people are, uh, are consuming and uh, being able to separate the wheat from the chaff, the true from the misinformation and disinformation. Bolstering independent media, this is so critical. Uh, the, the single best check and balance against misinformation and disinformation is an effective independent media. And we have initiatives to do that, including uh, as appropriate uh, financing and, and other things. We see that there's a, a deliberate attack to take down um, independent media, to take down uh, NGOs that are operating in this space. So we're putting in place protections, for example, Countries actually try to use legal means, or I should say legal in quotation marks, legal means uh, through lawsuits, as you know very well, uh, yes. and uh, through regulatory challenge. Well, uh, we're putting in place uh, programs, funding uh, to enable people, institutions, media organizations to actually push back on that. Um, all of these things together are um, part of what we need to do. And finally, uh, it's so critical that we and you, this entire community, work with the platforms to find ways uh, to more effectively uh, ensure that they're not being abused and used as a means of propagating misinformation and disinformation. Of course, it's primarily uh, on the platforms themselves to take the steps necessary to push back against that. I hope very much that we can continue to do that in a collaborative fashion and sharing the information, what we're seeing, for example, with the platforms, we've found that when we've been able to point them to malicious actors using the platforms in abusive ways, um, they've been responsive in making sure those actors can't do it. But of course, it's a moving target. And for every, um, every bad actor that you take off, uh, maybe it comes back under another guise uh, or something else pops up. So we have to be vigilant. We have to be um, re relentlessly focused on this. And I hope uh, that we can do this in a cooperative, collaborative way. Well, that's certainly what we're trying to do. But what we've seen in the last, uh, you mentioned 2014 until now, right? Uh, the disinformation, that splintered reality that allowed Russia to invade, to, to annex Crimea, mm -hmm. and then eight years later to invade Ukraine. Those meta narratives were seeded. The platforms were told about it. Not much was done. And the question, of course, is would we be at this place mm -hmm. if more was done, right? But but I guess this is this goes to the last, the crucial question, which is, we have had impunity in the virtual world and that impunity 
you have mm-hmm. a thousand page document from the Senate that that outlines what Russian disinformation mm-hmm. did in 2016 in the United States. Um, that impunity has filtered into the real world in, and really severed the checks and balances that are there. I guess that and here to quote Shoshana Zuboff, where she just says, we live in one world. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have rule of law in the virtual world, you know, how can you have rule of law yep. in the real world? Yep. And this goes back to what is your democratic vision? I think that's what's been missing is that we don't have a democratic vision uh, for the 21st century with this technology that we have. What is it that, that you have? Yeah, uh, Maria, you're, I think you're exactly right. And first, let me say, look, we've been awoken to this challenge uh, over the last years. And I think uh, for me, it certainly started particularly in 2014 with the initial Russian aggression against Ukraine and the, uh, the use of misinformation and disinformation as uh, a weapon of war, as critical to their campaign. And then, of course, we saw the interference in our elections. And all of that has created, a, I think, a, an increasingly um, a greater consciousness of the challenge and the need to do something about it. But doing something about it starts with exactly what you said, which is advancing a positive vision, uh, an affirmative vision, of what this future should look like. Um, A vision of an open, free, global, uh, interoperable, uh, secure, reliable internet. One of the ways we've done that is with this declaration for the future of the internet that now some 60 countries have joined onto that actually lays out what this positive vision is. Um, We're working in concrete ways though, not just to put out the vision, but to realize it. So what are the concrete steps that that you're taking? So much of the work that we're doing is to make sure that we and other like-minded countries uh, are at the table when so many of the rules and norms uh, that are going to uh, shape the future of the internet are being decided. Um, And we're doing that in a variety of ways. We've come together with the European Union through something we've stood up called the Trade and Technology Council to make sure that we're working together uh, to advance uh, these different norms and standards. There's growing convergence between the United States and the European Union on this vision for the future. Now we put that in practice by bringing our combined weight together everywhere these rules and norms are being shaped. Um, we're making sure that we're investing in our own capacity to do that. Here at the State Department, over just six months, we stood up a new bureau for cyberspace and digital policy. Uh, we will soon have an, a, a senior envoy Uh, to deal with emerging technologies, to make sure that to the extent values are infused in technology, uh, there'll be liberal values, not illiberal ones, Uh, and making sure the technology is used for the good and to advance uh, democracy, not uh, not to undermine it. We've been working to make sure that after last year's Summit for Democracy, we make this year a year for action in terms of implementing many of the concrete um, initiatives that were announced at the summit, including some that I mentioned a short while ago in terms of supporting independent media, giving people uh, the tools they need to combat censorship, uh, making sure that journalists uh, and other organizations under siege uh, can uh, fight back and have the tools and the means to do so. Um, We, as I mentioned, uh, have uh, initiated a declaration for the future of the internet with 60 countries uh, so far, making sure that we're all aligned in a shared vision and trying to advance it. And finally, the institutions that are actually doing this work, that are deciding how all of the, the technology that we share is being used, it's usually important that uh, people who share this vision, share these values, are uh, running these institutions. There's a usually important election uh, for the, uh, the head of the um, International Telecommunications Union coming up. And uh, the candidate we support, Doreen Bogdan Martin, is someone uh, a vision and a value uh, who um, uh, can help advance this shared perspective that we have. Um, so it's one of those one of those things where probably 99.999% of people have no idea uh, what the ITU is or how important this election is, but we're very focused on it and making sure that uh, someone with a shared vision uh, can drive this forward. Last thing I'll say, Maria, is this. I think everyone present today Um, is at the heart of this effort. Civil society, NGOs, the private sector, 
uh, independent media, working together, holding governments to account, uh, and then ideally all of us joining forces. When you put all that together, it's a very powerful force. And it's one that I'm convinced can carry the day in making sure that the future of technology and the future of the internet is one that actually advances freedom, uh, that advances democratic principles, uh, and that makes sure that um, together we can build um, uh, a future that reflects the values that, that we share. So the work that every single one of you is doing in uh, ways big and small, uh, that's what really counts. And I'm just pleased for the opportunity to spend a few minutes talking about how we see it, how we think about it, especially Maria uh, with you. So thank you. No, thank you so much, Secretary Blinken. Can I quick to throw one quick question? You, so you mentioned leading in. Um, Cheryl Sandberg just said that she would be leaving Meta mm -hmm. this uh, at the end of this year. Um, these are American companies that did have values that were infused into their design, and mm -hmm. again, probably not by their design, that encouraged the death of democracies in mm -hmm. many parts of the world. Um, in in Norway, just last week, I, I kind of thought the next two years will be critical mm -hmm. uh, for the survival of democracy. And there were people from Kiev, from Ukraine, uh, who, who really said that they received the most help from ordinary people. You've just asked us all to work together, I guess. You know, is there a timetable? You know, the long term, yes, education, medium term, yes, laws. In the short term, how how can we stop what Ann Applebaum called autocracy inc from taking over in this period of chaos? Marie, I think we all have to be seized with the 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 fierce urgency of now. Um, and yes, many of the things that we're talking about will will play out over time. Um, much of this is not flipping a light switch. Uh, or turning on or off a computer. Uh, it does take time. But if we bring to it together a sense of, a sense of urgency and a sense of determination, um, that's usually important. And if this entire community is galvanized, um, I think we can, make, we can make a real difference. But that requires day in, day out vigilance. Uh, it requires day in, day out action. And I think what we'll see if we, if we, if we do it right and do it in a sustained way is, you, you, you take a step and you look and it doesn't look like you've traveled very far. But my hope and expectation is that over the next few years, we will take many steps together and we'll actually recognize that we've traveled a great distance. The hard reality that we face, and it's a, it's a cliche, but it's profoundly true. Um, technology itself isn't inherently good or bad. How it's used determines uh, whether it's uh, for the good uh, or for the bad. And if we marshal all of our forces together, I think we, we carry a great weight into this fight to make sure to the best of our ability uh, that technology is used for the good, uh, that it's used uh, to advance a more open, more free, more democratic world, uh, and that it's not misused and abused to undermine those basic principles. But I think we have to have exactly what you said, a real sense of urgency about that, uh, a real sense of vigilance, uh, a determination to call out misuse and abuse, the determination on the part of NGOs and civil society to hold governments and hold the private sector uh, to account. Um, and I'm, I remain optimistic that marshalling all of these forces together with that sense of urgency, uh, we can make a difference and we can shape a future that is um, uh, more, uh, more open, uh, more tolerant, and uh, actually supports and defends freedom and democracy and doesn't undermine it. That's the objective. But look, we have to show all of us in different ways that we can actually deliver on this. So I recognize declarations are, are, are good. Uh, calling things out are good. But what really counts is action that makes a change, uh, action that deals with the problem. Um, none of that is easy, but we're determined to do it and we're determined to do it together. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Secretary Thanks, Lincoln, Maria. good luck. Great to see bye you. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. The unenviable position of following a Nobel Peace Prize winner and the Secretary of State for the United States. Uh, so we'll do our best to 
hopefully not disappoint you. Uh, we will have more technical errors for you, I'm sure, <laughs> proving our point about technology. Um, I think it's really important, though, that we just heard uh, a few things. Number one, we just heard from the U.S. government a recommitment to all of the places and all of the issues interlocking that we're discussing at this conference, a commitment to driving for democratic action and putting its force and political will behind those things. For everyone in this room in civil society, that's a call to action to stand up and take the U.S. up on that offer. We're really lucky, again, to have been joined by Rob Bershinsky here to shed more light on that. I also think it's worth noting and really important for us to all acknowledge that Maria Reza wasn't on stage with us today, not because she didn't want to be here, but because she's not allowed to be here right now. She is facing spurious charges against her from the cyber libel law in the Philippines. And I think it's worth noting as we talk about technology leveraged for harm, we also have governments leveraging their tools of power to stifle the opportunity that technology and the independent voices of people like Maria Reza provide as a threat to their power. The laws that were created to stifle Maria were literally created for that purpose. They weren't designed for a wider purpose. The cyber libel laws were passed uh, at a time that she was doing aggressive reporting about her own government. And so it's important to think about, you know, Maria has been here at 360 every single year that we've done it. And she's been here in person. She's a close friend. She's a close colleague. She very much wanted to be here. But every single time she travels, she has to find approval. And so when we're talking about stifling voices, this is literally stifling voices. She didn't get approval to change an itinerary to call United or whoever to join us in Brussels. And so that's a very, very, very important point. Uh, we very much hope that Maria can join us in person next year. Uh, we've worked with her since she uh, designed the Hold the Line campaign, and we're very much standing with her as, as she works on Courage On. So the next session uh, is leading into the final portion of the day. Uh, we're going to hear from, you just heard from the Secretary of State, how important a thing called the Global Engagement Center is. And the Global Engagement Center is designed to understand and counter uh, foreign influence operations, especially by malicious state actors. And so we're very, very, very pleased to welcome to the stage the head of the Global Engagement Center to talk about their work, Leah Bray. Welcome to the stage. Super good afternoon, everyone. As Graham uh, kindly said, my name is Leah Bray. I'm the acting coordinator of the Global Engagement Center at the US Department of State. It's an honor to be here among so many experts, scholars, and uh, fellow government representatives. I'd like to begin by taking a moment to acknowledge what an extraordinary time we're in. Disinformation, propaganda, and malign influence have been with us for as long as people have understood that lies and distortion are potent means of shaping popular perception and achieving desired outcomes. What is new and what makes this so moment so pivotal is the proliferation of the inexpensive, easily accessed communication mediums that enable today's purveyors of disinformation. With virtually no barrier to entry, state and non-state actors alike now have the means to inject deception and confusion directly into the nervous system of a community, a city, a country, on a scale with a, and with a rapidity that eclipses anything we've ever seen. There is no denying the transnational reach and indeed global scale of today's disinformation operations. With a few key strokes in St. Petersburg, confidence in the results of an election anywhere in the world can be destroyed. Popular support for essential public health measures can be wiped out. For those of us at the forefront of the fight against information manipulation, this reality introduces additional complexity to an already challenging national security policy concern. Responsible governments operate within the confines of the law and with respect for international boundaries. Information, however, is unbound by these constraints. And as so long as there are governments willing to employ lies as a means of statecraft, it will remain incumbent on the more responsible members of the world community to come together in pursuit of shared solutions. Putin's war of choice against Ukraine and the false narratives the Kremlin has spread in a vain attempt to legitimize an unjust war are an echo of Europe's past and a time when dangerous dictators use lies to justify horrific crimes and predatory ambitions. 
This history is especially noteworthy to me as an American, speaking to you here at the Atlantic Council in Brussels today, just a day after June 6th, the anniversary of D-Day. It's hard not to look back on the historical lessons of World War II and see parallels in the challenges we are collectively facing today. We've seen the courage of the Ukrainian armed forces, the same strength, resolve, and resilience of those who stormed the beaches of Normandy and fought throughout Europe to defeat the scourge of fascism. The Kremlin, too, recognizes the evocative power of this moment in Europe's history. Shamefully, the Russian government has cynically exploited the memory of the Holocaust and the Second World War and distorted history itself to serve its current aims. In messaging to the world and to the Russian people, Moscow has used disinformation and a fictionalized historic record to twist and mischaracterize the Allied power's success in defeating the Third Reich in hopes that somehow a self-serving redrafting of history will legitimize an illegal, unjustifiable, and brutal war against a sovereign neighbor. There can be no doubt among the community of nations the Russian Federation's stated objective, a so-called denazification of Ukraine, is an utter fabrication. The idea that Ukraine, led by its democratically elected Jewish pres president, is somehow a fascist state addled with Nazi influences defies both fact and logic. To the contrary, as we all know, Ukraine is a proud, multi-ethnic, multi-faith democracy, yet the Kremlin and its proxies continue to promote this and other lies. The denazification lie is especially pernicious in that it trades on the very real evils of anti-Semitism, Holocaust distortion, and other forms of racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism that continue to plague our societies today. The outrageousness of these narratives and their centrality to Putin's war against Ukraine illustrate the depth to which command over the information domain has become as essential to the Kremlin's achievement of its geopolitical goals as dominance in any traditional military domain. But the Kremlin's disinformation is not limited to Ukraine, and its target audiences are not limited to Europe. The Kremlin's disinformation activities present an ongoing challenge to democratic societies across the globe. And to effectively counter this disinformation, it's important we recognize it when we see it and understand and expose these malign tactics for what they are. We know the Kremlin is using official government communications, state-funded global messaging, cultivated proxy sources, weaponized social media, and cyber-enabled disinformation to influence the societies of both its perceived friends and foes. This activity is not limited to official government entities, of course. We are keenly aware of the activities of Kremlin-linked actors like Evgeny Prigozhin, Konstantin Malafayev, Alexander Malkovich, and Alexander Dugan to finance and operate pro-Kremlin disinformation outlets and troll farms. We have seen this especially in the activities of Evgeny Prigozhin's Project Lakta and its Lakta Internet Research, or LIR, troll farm, formerly known as the Internet Research Agency. Project Lakta is a known practitioner of the disinformation for hire model, in which troll farms and other social media operations are outsourced to third parties in order to obfuscate who is behind and benefited by the messaging campaign. According to multiple media reports, the LIR has previously established short-lived troll farms that use third country nationals in Ghana, Mexico, Nigeria, and the Central African Republic to create and spread disinformation what is likely an effort to evade governmental and private sector measures put in place to detect and shut down such operations. When it comes to countering Russia's disinformation, our objectives should be centered on creating an even greater understanding of the disinformation threat, strategically exposing to the public examples of how Russia uses its disinformation and propaganda apparatus, and developing and exporting best practices consistent with the rule of law and democratic values to partners with less experience in countering disinformation. As we all know, disinformation and exploitation of the information space by foreign actors for strategic effect is not a fleeting challenge. Raising awareness and building resilience to disinformation will be a critical component of any long-term strategy to manage and mitigate its effects. As with all tools of war and statecraft, Russia's employment of disinformation has evolved, both in its sophistication and application. In 2016, we saw Russia-based actors mount a large-scale influence campaign targeting the United States against the backdrop of our presidential election. Disinformation was at the heart of that campaign, 
And while there were no open hostilities between the United States and Russia, the intent of that disinformation was to sow societal discord and undermine faith in our country's democratic processes. In the context of Ukraine today, Russia is using disinformation as a weapon of warfare. The trend over time entails increasingly bellicose ends and the undeniable adoption of information space operations as a permanent feature of Moscow's relationship with the world demands a galvanized, deliberated response from the community of responsible nations. Russia's use of disinformation both in peacetime and now in war is a collective wake-up call for all of us to the seriousness of the threat posed to the information space by malign state and non-state actors bent on agitating division and chaos, undermining governance, and rendering objective tr truth an unknowable construct. This is the time to meaningfully address the vulnerability and vitally important integrity of the information space. And we have a good foundation to build from. Many countries have begun to focus attention and capital toward their own information ecosystems. I attribute that in some measure to COVID and the infodemic that accompanied the global health crisis. I think we all saw in that moment how precarious the modern information environment is and how little it takes to manipulate the passions and thinking of even reasonable people under circumstances of extreme stress and difficulty. It goes without saying that national security threats are dynamic and ever evolving. This work is rewarding expressly because the tactics shift, the technologies advance, and the threats change. That said, there should be no delusions. Taking disinformation on as a national security threat is going to be difficult. The technology challenges are real, the legal implications are complex, and the inherently transnational nature of deployed disinformation is yet another complication. Importantly, we must ensure that our approaches to countering disinformation do not inadvertently undermine the principles that underwrite our democracies and our obligation to respect freedom of expression, including for members of the press. Our actions must underscore the vital importance of independent media and access to reliable information, as well as respect for the rule of law. Here, our collective efforts under the Summit of Democracy to bolster independent media globally, guard the essential work of journalists, and strengthen coordination among fellow democracies and with civil society in the private sector on disinformation will go a long way towards strengthening our response and resiliency to these threats. Governments, the academic community, and civil society all play a crucial role in countering disinformation and safeguarding the information environment. All of us here have been entrusted with responsibility for building a shared resilience to this new, enduring 21st century security challenge. The United States is committed to working together as none of us can accomplish this task alone. Thank you again for the warm welcome and for continuing the good fight. There is nothing easy about the disinformation problem, but getting this right in terms of policy, international coordination, and unified voice is essential. A vibrant democracy is sustained by objective truth. That's why malign foreign actors are threatened by it, and that's why we must preserve it. I look forward to hearing from the experts on the panel. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Leah. So we're going to continue the conversation on influence operations and the threat democracy faces under them. Uh, but before we begin the session, I'd like to uh, welcome my colleague, Tessa Knight, research associate, associate all the way from Cape Town, uh, who's going to introduce the next panel. Tessa. Thank you, Andy. So as Andy said, I'm Tessa. Um, I focus primarily on Africa and African influence operations. and I think for a lot of us, disinformation research and funding for disinformation research began because we uncovered a lot of the big influence operations targeting primarily America and the UK. So in my work, I've, I've looked a lot at how foreign governments and malign actors have tried to promote their interests in Africa, from Sudan to Mali to the Central African Republic. These campaigns are not only destabilizing democracies, some of which are in their infancy. They're also actively supporting and encouraging military coups or backing up violent regimes by attempting to influence narratives and by spreading propaganda. 
And in the upcoming panel, our speakers will unpack how influence operations have their impacts on the rest of the world. So without further ado, I would like to welcome um, Eliza Dwaskin, and she will introduce, sorry, <laughs> she'll introduce the rest of the, the panelists. Welcome, everyone. everyone. Just one moment. I actually did not know I was going to be introing the panelists, so <laughs> I need to call them up and get their bios right. I can't touch the floor. Apologize. Apologies, everyone. This will take two seconds. This is all designed to help us feel uh, less we can nervous. Do it yeah, now ourselves. it's like, I, I truly I truly didn't know, even though there there was a... Uh, you can always make us introduce ourselves. We're also happy to do it. We do it yes. all the time. We can make us introduce each other. That'd be really yes. do, do you want to introduce yeah. each other? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a little... Uh, um, no, it's, a, it's right here. So first, I'd like to introduce right next to me, I'd like to introduce... Uh, David Agronovich. Um, he's the director of global threat disruption at Meta, the company formerly known as Facebook. Um, so he coordinates the uh, identification and disruption of influence operation networks across Facebook. Um, and prior to joining Facebook, he served as the director for intelligence at the National Security Council at the White House, where he led the U.S. government's efforts to address foreign interference. Um, Next to him, we have Alicia Wanless, uh, who we're meeting for the first time. Uh, Alicia is the director of the Partnership for Countering Influence Operations at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She researches how people shape and are shaped by changing the changing information space. She conducts content and network analyses and has developed original models for identifying and analyzing digital propaganda campaigns. Um, and then, um, we have T.T. Cat. Um, you'll have to tell me how to pronounce your last name. Um, how, do, how do I pronounce your, la um, your last name? My last name is Wu. So it's kind of easier. Uh -huh. uh, but then my first name is Ming Xuan. Perfect. All right, just go back Better to T.T. Cat. Right? Better than I. <laughs> He's, yeah. the, he's the co-founder and CEO of Double Think Labs. And they're really at the forefront of the effort to track Chinese and Chinese language dis, uh, disinformation. He's an activist and a campaigner. Um, around a number of social movements in Taiwan, including the anti-nuclear movement, environmental, LGBTQ, and human rights movement. Um, and as I said, is on the forefront of tracking uh, F disinformation by China. So I want to jump in and say that um, when Graham asked me to do this panel, he said it came out of a conversation he and I had last year when I had just come back from Israel. And I was tracking a disinf disinformation for hire company uh, not going to say the name because it's related to a forthcoming article in the Washington Post. But um, this company essentially is one of many that have proliferated around the world that uh, governments or political actors can hire if they want to run a disinformation campaign um, and they want to outsource it somewhere. And I called Graham because I was thinking about how much the world has changed since we first, our, myself and other journalists first, um, started reporting and uncovering Russian interference in the 2016 election and the platform's very weak response to it. Uh, just kind of wasn't prepared, wasn't prepared for it. And so I wanted to spend some time chatting with you, you guys today, uh, you guys and Gal, about how different the world looks today than, than the way it did, how different the defenses are, how different the, attack, the attackers are, and how the landscape has changed. And then what are the responses to that changing landscape, both from governments and from platforms and from civil society? Um, so I want to start with the question we're all talking about, the most pressing reality, which is the war in Ukraine. And David, ask you, how does the world look different from where you sit um, at Meta than it did before February 27th, before the war? Yeah, thanks for kicking us off. I think it's a really topical question, particularly given how much Ukraine is focused on the conversations here at the conference over the last few days. Um, 
maybe just for a little bit of grounding. Uh, my team has been working across the company with our threat investigative teams to look for, identify, disrupt, and then build kind of resilience into our systems around influence operations for the last several years. I joined the company back in mid-2018. That, that effort was already underway after the 2016 elections. And so some of the things I'll talk about in terms of what we saw from particularly Russian influence operations around the uh, February 24th invasion of Ukraine are predicated on the trends that we've observed over the last four or so years of Russian activity. And I'll break this up maybe into three main categories. First, kind of what looks different from a preparation perspective, okay. um, what looks different from a response perspective, and then what looks different from a capabilities across society perspective. On the preparation piece, I think one of the biggest differences here was in the weeks leading up to the 24th of February, you saw a substantial shift in the ways that both platform companies prepared for you know, Russia crossing the line of control in eastern Ukraine, as well as the way that governments and civil society were engaging around the possibility of influence operations, disinformation surrounding the crisis. When I was still at the White House, um, I was working on the global response to the poisonings in Salisbury in the UK of Sergei Skripal and his daughter. And at the time, it, it was really hard for governments to share information about what we thought people were going to push as disinformation narratives. Um, and it was very difficult to kind of get ahead of what at the time felt like a very agile disinformation apparatus surrounding the Russian government. Ahead of the 24th of February, you saw these somewhat unprecedented strategic disclosures that narrowed the operating space of Russian disinformation operators um, by the US government, by NATO, by the Ukrainian government, and others. Um, on the platform side, several platform companies spent the weeks in the run-up to the 24th of February preparing for what we expected to see, what would we need to detect, refreshing our investigations into known Russian-linked disinformation operations we had previously detected. And so when the 24th rolled around, there was already this very constrained operating space, right? and this is the response piece. And there were platforms ready to look for them, civil society researchers, NOSINT researchers who were already out there with, cap with capacity to look for this stuff. And so though we saw several influence operations linked to known Russia-linked disinfo networks, they didn't seem to get much traction either on the platform or in the broader media ecosystem. That's not to say that there isn't a threat there, but rather that the defenders were more prepared. The last thing I wanted to touch on was the capabilities piece. The strategic disclosures, the preparation work, that gave us fertile ground to continue our work in kind of constraining this type of influence operations activity. But now that we are in the post-initial invasion phase of the operation, the war isn't over. Right? Neither is it over on the ground, nor is it over in the information space. And so I think what we'll need to focus on is ensuring that these early victories of essentially constraining the success of some of these operations aren't lost as kind of global attention continues to shift from issue to issue. And so that's an area I think I hope we'll have a chance to focus on a bit here. Right, because the world, of course, was actively debunking Russian disinformation in the beginning of the war. Um, and there were so many, you know, the, the whole of the world was responding. And now that the world isn't paying as much attention, that's where perhaps these influence operations then can get more traction. Alicia, what do you think? Uh, well, I've been looking at problems like propaganda and disinformation since about 2014. And so the longer tail of that is that I think that the bigger change now, even since 2014, but not necessarily because of Ukraine, was uh, a greater awareness that we have problems in an information space. Um, when it comes to Ukraine, I think what it's demonstrated is a lack of a multi-stakeholder response, that we really didn't have a strategy, particularly in the West, that could bridge the gap between, say, industry, civil society, and governments. Um, and in that way, they were working in their own field, their own sector, but even within each one, they tend to work in their own area and we're broken up by topics. So one team over here might be working on disinformation, it might be foreign originating, another one might be strategic communications, another one would be cybersecurity, and all of these things are part of the information environment. Um, and even within companies, they work on single policy enforcements. They've got teams that do singular and different things, and those don't necessarily come together. But then between those stakeholders, the trust between them, the languages that they're speaking, they are not usually the same, and they haven't really collaborated. There's been more tension than not before the conflict. So what we do have here is a unique opportunity, if there is a will, to build a stakeholder response 
that actually helps create efficiencies in terms of how things are coming in. So for example, um, what we see is maybe governments making multiple requests to companies and not coming together. Well, maybe multilateral institutions would be the better bet to do a singular briefing, but also companies providing greater information to stakeholders like civil society and the government as well in advance um, to be able to get ahead of a threat. But the key here is that we have to find, we have to find standards and systems that make this safe and collaborative and that there is some sort of, of a, an outcome with lines in the sand because ultimately this is the thing we're missing the most, rules of engagement and a strategy. Well, it's interesting because I, you know, I saw actually, and Dave and I were talking about this before the panel, that the companies were willing, at least the platforms were willing to draw a line in the sand um, you know, and take, take a side, uh, which is different. But to your point, you know, you have Google um, that decides they're going to ban any content that distorts real world events and Facebook has a different policy and they're gonna you know, allow people to criticize the, the Putin and potentially Russians and you know, they were all, you know, there wasn't a uniform response from the companies even though in some ways there was, there, there um, was maybe more uniform response than we've seen in the past. What, what do you think, David? So I, I think know you brought I, that up with me before. I, I do think that there's coordination um, between kind of the threat investigative sides of companies that's grown out of the 2016 period. And so you saw this around elections, whether it was in the US or in the Philippines or in Brazil or in India. Um, but in particular, I think one of the, the challenges around setting these types of content moderation policies, and I know Emerson and Katie talked about this yesterday, is in these fast changing periods of, of potentially global conflicts or ethnic strife, it's difficult and, and I think perhaps not always the best position to rely on the platform companies to be the leading indicator of where we want those lines to be drawn. Um, this is actually, I think, a place where civil society, where governments particularly can lead because these types of decisions have effects on people's lives and having a clear kind of norm setting across the industry would be really useful. But I feel like in this case there was a war and pretty much the whole yeah. world, civil society and the companies were against it. I think that's right. So is this something that, you know, we talked before about how um, this is unusual for platforms to draw a line in the sand like this politically? Mm. I think that, I mean, there's some helpful guiding principles here. And I'd be interested in kind of Alicia's take in particular of how we take this from just like platform <laughs> policy to like strategic. Mm -hmm. um, but the guiding principle is how do you protect the people who are using your platform? Um, and in the context of people in Ukraine, right, that is, how do you protect their accounts? How do you give them tools to lock their profiles down so that if the city that they're in is taken over by an invader, they can quickly hide the information that might get them into trouble. But it also means how do you protect, for example, dissenting voices in Russia, where being, we're talking openly about the war might result in physical security risks or risks of imprisonment and the like. Um, and so I think that that guiding principle that I would argue pretty much all platforms should have, right? how do you protect the people who are using your platform, um, can help you know, bridge some of the differences in how the platforms approach these types of problems. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Uh, well, I'm not going to comment on that specifically, sure. I, but I do think that there are also other areas where it makes it painfully apparent that we aren't really coordinated. Now, stepping aside from Ukraine, bringing TTCAD in, this is something that we talk a lot, quite a bit, in terms of even just the research community. So you have a, a very wide and diverse group of people who are working on research related to influence operations. They might be in civil society, nonprofits, think tanks, they might be academics, but all of them are almost entirely working in isolation, building up their own data pipelines that don't necessarily get reused. And we're talking about research that's really engineering resource heavy, and that's extremely costly. And we haven't really found a mechanism to come together to be able to share that type of resource, build up data sets that we can use together and have representative samples. And this is, this is just one example in where we lack coordination. Me? All yeah, right. just, I'm giving you the <laughs> yeah, right. so, um, She's just looking at you. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> right, so um, uh, especially we are talking about the data, it's not only on Facebook or Twitter, which they, uh, they grant a certain um, access to the research group for the API. We are also talking about a platform like a, uh, Weibo or WeChat or TikTok or Douyin, that's even harder, right? So, um, and uh, they are um, consistently changing their rules for uh, people to collect in those data. 
And uh, in fact, I actually um, uh, I know that um, there's a business model for industry when they collecting those data. They will actually exchange those data set from company to company, so they can build up the more data for the all their clients. Um, and we don't have those exchange. Uh, mechanism in our community. So I think that's also very hard. Um, just quoting one like a very um, good <laughs> Ukrainian partners here I just met last night. Uh, they say he found uh, four different group of people in this summit are collecting the same data set with them, really? right? So um, we are all collecting data and burning money and also build up those dashboard and we definitely need some uh, more coordinated efforts um, from our community. So that's a really interesting idea, like us creating a central repository of all information influence operations and evidence of them across the platforms mm. that any researcher can use. Is it feasible? Uh, yeah, uh, but, but also it's like we spend a lot of money to collecting those data because we think that collecting those data will be able to help us to uh, investigate what's happening um, inside those data set in the future. But actually we are collecting the data more than what we can do for analysis because we're also facing the capacity issue for the um, analysis of this data. So, um, yeah. This is a question actually on that, which is, um, you know, Russia will be taken to court for war crimes. And what happens to all the, all the, um, the, the content that platforms deleted uh, because they were fighting these influence operations during the war? Uh, can that be retrieved uh, in, in legal cases? So this, I was just going to say, this, is, this here is another massive gap that we have in terms of regulation that governs how we actually deal with our modern information environment and the information within it, and who actually gets to dictate that. Um, most laws, as I'm not a lawyer, so I'm going to qualify this, tend to happen at a national level, but we don't necessarily even have that in place right now, much less some sort of international agreement of, of what could happen and where. So again, we have this massive gaping hole that we weren't prepared for, and yes, it takes takes years to build up for that. My hope is that with something like Ukraine, it's enough of a force multiplying factor that we come together and we're aware of this. We're aware of the wider information environment, the lack of guidelines that we have in it, the lack of norms, et cetera, and that we suddenly, hopefully, have impetus from governments to, to take a charge on that and do something. Maybe just a plus one that. I think it's, to Tita Cat's point, the industry's responses to particularly the question of how do you archive and enable research have, are very different platform by platform. Like, in no small part, as Alicia noted, because there hasn't been a lot of clear guidance from regulators or democratic governments of like what people actually want to see and how they want that data shared and with whom they want that data shared. Um, similarly, right, so my background is more in the traditional security, cybersecurity space. The law and the norms around information sharing for like cybersecurity threat indicators, as folks who work on the cybersecurity front know, is much clearer. Right? There are vehicles explicitly designed to enable companies and research organizations to share information about cybersecurity threats. We don't have that in any clear form whatsoever around issues like influence operations. We don't even have it for data sharing for research purposes, although I'm really hopeful for that Edmo report. Um, yeah. If I may. Yeah. Um, but, uh, um, bottom line is that um, those public opinions or whatever the content that push um, your platform or other platform, essentially it's not the data owned by the uh, tech company. It's the data about our own society, our countries, what's happening there, what the people are talking about there. Mm -hmm. So it should be public available or at least um, for a research group to understand what is happening to our cities and what are they talking about, what are they producing, right? But you know, yeah. you're right, it's a societal, it's a societal record. Yeah. But then it kind of, it actually comes back to the question that I think sparked this panel in my conversation with Graham, which is, okay, we're just starting to have these global frameworks for cyber weapons and laws, but disinformation influence operations, they're weapons. And there's no framework, both in terms of sharing data, um, how government should handle it, um, and it seems like it's a void. And then one, you know, the example here, do, do you all think that there should be that, that a government or global governments or an international body should come in, therefore, and like mandate, for example, that platforms archive? influence operations, that they share it publicly in, in uniform ways. Do you think that that should be mandated by governments? 
Can I start? I think we yeah. should start with the first step, which would be transparency or operational reporting of online services to understand what even data they have beyond that. Because influence operations and disinformation is one part of the problem. I mean, we, I'm sorry, David, I'm picking on you now. Uh, we don't understand how the policies are developed. Well, people who didn't work for the companies <clears throat> don't understand how the policies were developed. We don't necessarily <laughs> understand how they're enforced or what research is happening. And then this research comes out in leaks and it erodes more trust in our information environment and these things need to be rectified. So first step I would say is that governments should regulate um, operational reporting to inform how companies are working. It would be ideal if a number of countries came together and broadly harmonized that. Maybe a place like the OECD leads on this and that would be extremely helpful and expedite things. That would inform researchers on what information is available to research and also inform policymakers on how we can do regulation to actually control things and archive stuff like that then it wouldn't be as fun for journalists because we depend on leaks. <laughs> um, what about um, uh, a question on, um, what about, you know, we, we haven't talked yet about the disinformation of our higher industry, but it's something, David, that Meta has actually talked a lot about in your reports, which is that um, it used to be, you know, that governments would pay for this directly. Now they're increasingly outsourcing it. Um, Tell me, tell us about that world, and how does that world get regulated? What what can prevent this from happening? This gray space. So it's a difficult question, in no small part, I think, because disinformation for hire, definitionally, and PR agency, <laughs> are not hugely different definitions, right? It's more what those companies end up doing. But that said, right, we so so our teams put out a report last year about surveillance for higher industry, right? Your NSO groups, your black cubes of the world. And one of the things that I think worried us the most about these surveillance companies was not only are they engaged in these egregious abuses of people's privacy by hacking their phones, hacking their accounts, hacking their email addresses, they do so for commercial gain for any customer that's willing to pay. And in doing so, they hide the people behind them, right? Oftentimes, if you look at our surveillance for hire report, you'll notice that in almost all of those cases, we weren't really able to identify the clients. We could tell you exactly what company was providing the services, but the whole business model is hiding who that ultimate client is. Whereas if you look at our influence operations reporting going back a few years, there's a ton of this very specific attribution to governments, to intelligence services, including some of the very sophisticated services in Russia. And so one of the big risks around Disinfo for Hire is that it creates this whole industry that essentially just hides from all of our views, whether you're an OSINT researcher or, or an investigator at a platform company who's actually paying for, who is driving these operations, and, who, and why are they targeting the people they're targeting? How do you regulate them? Some of the challenge here is that we've taken down a handful of disinfo for hire firms. We've banned them from our platform when we find them, because their business model violates our policies. But I can't think of a single example where the people who ran the operations at the firms, or the firms themselves, faced any meaningful business impact for doing so. Right, those people still work in the PR industry. Um, the firms themselves still have very large clients all over the world. Until there are some actual costs for engaging in this behavior beyond Facebook taking down your accounts and trying to embarrass you in a public blog post, it's hard to imagine that a profitable business model isn't going to continue driving that type of PR and ad agency activity. And the politicians benefit from using it. This happens quite a lot, and maybe not the politicians, but in Taiwan. Yes. <clears throat> so, um, lots of a different tactic that um, um, by the Chinese uh, info information operation um, mode is that um, uh, we published a report last year. There's a four different uh, um, uh, one that people are commonly uh, noticed that those like stay in front of the media. They do a lot of propaganda, working with other media outlets, or you see a lot of uh, um, uh, patch addicts or uh, the, the, the cyber troop. Um, they're trolling the people around, but that's an easy one, right? So, um, but the, the hard one is what you just mentioned, that um, when they hire people, I actually, in your society, in your country, that um, the people who create those content is Taiwanese, or the people who promote those ta content is also Taiwanese, how you differentiate them are um, be higher, or they just people have a different idea or different political opinion with you within your democratic society. So, um, in, to increase um, the cost for uh, those activities and also strengthen their business model or profit model, I think it's essential um, that uh, to prevent those things because 
um, um, in the end of the day, they are the one. Whatever they do for politician or for business, for makeup company products, um, what they do is they input a lot of uh, inauthentic content. Opinions and pretend that it's generous、uh, to the audience、uh, in your society. So I think that should be at least a social norm that you don't engage with those、uh, PR firm or marketing company who provide us a service at all. Yeah, I've done some reporting on this in the Philippines, and I really felt like this disinfo for hire. Individual, it's like a hot new job for a twenty-something in the global south because you can make money, you can be online,、um, you can become an influencer, or if you were already an influencer, you can get paid for political sponsorships.、Um, but yeah, it just sounds like, from what you all are saying, I don't. It doesn't sound like there's really any incentive from any government to actually stop this. I would like to distinguish between the people who work in the bureaucracies and the politicians, because my experience has been those inside the government would like to do things and they would like to clean up the information environment and make it more reliable. Politicians don't have the vested interest usually.、Um, I want to open it up for questions in a minute, so would love to see your questions. If anyone wants to come up to the mic,、um, or you can send a question already. Uh, Titi, while while people are teeing up their questions, I did want to I did want to go back to Russia and Ukraine,、um, because you've done so much research on China's involvement in that conflict, and I wanted to ask you about how you see China walking a fine line in terms of the disinformation it will echo,、um, and where it diverges. Um, right. So、um, ever since the war started,、um, well, back to February 22nd, that our team started a、um, special task force. Everybody work. Over hour、um, and publish the digest every day、um, and look at it, how China state media influencers and also those nationalist media outlets are pushing those narrative、uh, against Ukraine. They copy a lot of things from Russia.、Um, they translate a lot of things. They tweet,、uh, they twist、uh, whatever Zelensky say、um, to another meaning and push that to、um, the Chinese speaking citizens. Um, first of all, I want to say two things here. One is that、um, uh, often time when you heard like something like this, it feels like very exhausted, right? So it's like something far away.、Um, but the, actually, those disinformation or propaganda campaign in Chinese language is not only about the China people. It's also about the Chinese speaking word, like in Malaysia, in Singapore, in Taiwan, in Australia, Canada, and everywhere. Their diaspora community. Ask your friend whether they,、uh, what news outlets they are、uh, reading in New York, in um, um, Vancouver,、um, and all this place. They read the news on the WeChat and also all this like、uh, um, whatever Chinese news available there. So first of all, it's not only about the people within Chinese. Uh, China. Second, think about what they do.、Uh, start from the war until now, it's over 100 days.、Um, they are pushing this narrative,、um, dragging the, those Chinese audience away from Western country, Western value. They attack NATO, attack Ascension. Whatever they do, they are preparing the environment, the information environment. That's exactly what Russian did in 2014. They start to demonize uh, uh, Ukraine and prepare those propaganda. Of course, some people don't believe, some people don't believe, but that's just right now, 100 days, right?、Um, how about two years later? How about four years later?、Uh, when they keep pushing those narrative,、so you're, um, you're talking about preparing for an invasion, of, laying the groundwork for an invasion of Taiwan. I don't want to make jump that. Conclusion, but I I would say they are preparing for whatever things they want to do. It's because it's all pre-justified. They don't need to explain to their citizen why we don't want to help Ukraine anymore, right? Why we want to help Russia today?、Um, yeah, because they already、um, there's already a lot of a narrative and a, the justification out there、uh, by those disinformation. They, then you, yeah. well, they see the information environment as a system, and have for a long time. They're not quibbling over definitions like we are in debating this. They have a center of gravity to understand it, and they have a strategy. We we don't. But、uh, you know, Tidikat, when we were talking earlier, I thought it was really interesting how you said, you know, there's so many limits to where Chinese disinformation will go in support of Russia. How you said that they they will not they will not mimic the narrative around independence in the Donbas、yeah. region. Right.、Um, <clears throat> 
um, there's an ecosystem, right? So there's an ecosystem for um, if you want to make profit. Um, I can recommend uh, this new gig for you guys um, because we have a lots of uh, white people here. Um, <laughs> Make a video or a TikTok video that uh, promote how great China is. Then you will become an influencer. That's how they work. <laughs> so this nationalism uh, create a hu huge uh, nationalism um, interest, uh, become a new business model. So China government doesn't have to pay you as an influencer. Uh, once you follow their narrative, um, follow their state media, whatever they are talking today, you open the uh, People Daily, uh, CGTN, whatever on a hot, hot topic today, you just follow it. Then you gain followers, you gain traffic, you gain uh, profit. That's how they work. So this whole button up or decentralized uh, network is what we're dealing with right now uh, for uh, the space. And why is it not as profitable to be an anti-government influencer? Oh, yes. Um, that's a good question. So I think um, lot, we don't have that much yet, uh, but uh, I do see a lot of uh, people are um, go in that direction uh, right now in Taiwan or in um, other places as a diaspora community. They also did that, but they are not as profitable as um, China citizens, uh, the, the poor China one, yes. Um, if I no, don't know why. If no one else is itching to jump in, we can go to a question. So we have a question here which says, um, it feels like the discussion around accountability by social media platforms happens only in reference to Western companies. What leverage does the democratic world have over platforms like Vcontacti, Telegram, and WeChat? Great question. Right. That's the question I also want to ask. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have <laughs> answers. Yes. Does anyone want to take it? Well, yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, it's the same as like GDP, GDPR in the EU. It will apply to the, where that law is placed. So, I mean, the West has the same options. I wouldn't advocate for it uh, that, that Russia has taken and China has taken and kicking out companies that don't comply with the way that they've decided they're going to regulate their information space. So it's, it's possible. It's there. I think the emphasis for a long time has been on the major American ones because they're there at home and they've taken a central role in our own information ecosystem. I do think one thing that can help here is, so one of the things that we've been trying to do more and more of in our own analytical reporting is calling out the platforms that we see content spread to, right? I think more and more, and I imagine most of the Sherlock's in the room would agree, um, these operations are inherently cross-platform. And so one thing we've done, in particular the operations around Ukraine, we called out the fact that we saw you know, Facebook profiles who were designed to backstop content written on websites that were primarily amplified on Kontaktia, not Naklasnike, for example. So in some ways, hopefully, just raising some of this awareness of how these other platforms play in the global information ecosystem in hopes that it will then inform some of the regulatory conversations. We need to look at things as a system. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm just laughing because you said it before. Because so. <laughs> you believe it. Yeah, I do. I think that's the only way we can get out of this. The information environment is like the physical environment. If we don't start looking at this systemically, we have no way out of this. We will just constantly be reacting as we are. But what is systemic? I mean, uh, you know, WeChat, the, they're not going to face pressure from their government the way that the, US, the American platforms face pressure from their governments to crack down on this stuff. They're just not. No, but they may not be operating in the environments that they are right now. I mean, they can be banned. We've, we see that they can, things can be banned. Russia banned, China's banned. Yeah, I mean, I'm not can, advocating for Or TikTok could be banned in the United States. Exactly. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I don't want to put you cold water, but um, um, <laughs> what they can do is they can separate their company um, and it promote a different version like what TikTok and Douyin does. So, and actually WeChat is, uh, Weibo is also, they have an international version. So whatever you download is actually, um, there's a different, you probably see different stuff or different, you face different uh, content moderation um, uh, yeah, standards. TikTok yeah, US yeah. is technically separate, I believe. Yes. But again, global information ecosystem. Um, there was someone who raised their hand over there. Yes. I think. Hi. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. So my name is Omri Price. I'm the director of Alliance for Europe and also part of the Disarm Foundation. I, I want to thank you for the really interesting panel and also a great discussion that we had at a session yesterday. And um, this arm stands for Disinformation Analysis and Risk Management. It's exactly the kind of 
um, framework as a common language on this information that we're talking about here, basically applying uh, cybersecurity approaches uh, to share information. It's based on MITRE ATT&CK, for those who are familiar. And it's something that we've been working on to bring stakeholders together uh, around how we get this off the ground in a way that really enables information flows in a way that is you know, transparent to the community and, and really is an, able to engage you know, those in the space. Now, Alliance for Europe has been working on this kind of cooperation building for the last several years. And what we see is that there is a reason why everyone wants to have their own thing and want to invest their resources in one specific space or one specific project. Everyone wants to have their funding, their branding, and their right to do so. Everyone wants to have their own great idea. And so the, the genuine question that I think that we face as an organization and as a community and in establishing these common resources is how do we do that in a way that is a win-win for everyone? How do we enable everyone to have a common interest to use these tools together, to share information together, and not feel like, oh, well, I just lost a bit of funding to that guy because they're going to steal my idea, or, you know, how do I shine through? How do we really solve this collective action problem and show everyone, like, you can buy into this forum and feel that you're going to gain for it for your own advancement, as well as advancing the community and the common cause that we have, which is to have, you know, a democracy that is safe in the digital world and being able to really communicate together. So, I'm going to ask one you. person to address that for a minute so we can get to some more questions. Whoever wants to take it. I can. If you want. <clears throat> well, we start our work by uh, we think that we want to build a cross platform database that our analysis just put a keyword, they can gather all the data from the Weibo, from all these like uh, China uh, junk news site, and turns out. Well, we did it uh, in just a few months, then uh, they change, then we keep burning the money, try to adopt it, and it's never done. So I, I would suggest that um, maybe we can develop our competitive um, strengths uh, in analysis or other way. Um, once we have a, if we have a joint, if we can, we, if we don't need a bother for collecting those data, we can spend our money and our time on developing algorithm or develop, uh, changing our analysis or building up our capacity. Yeah, because we would never be better than uh, who own the data, right? Um, yeah. Um, I see another question on the board, which is how does the model of surveillance capitalism driving major social media platforms enable the disinformation for higher industry, and what challenges do the design of the platforms pose in formulating lasting change, which I'm assuming is to do with the fact that disinformation can be controversial and enraging and get clicks. Who wants to take that for a minute? That's a full-on research paper question. Um. <laughs> to answer in less than three minutes, I think would be a, a little bit uh, much. Um, I mean, I think, it's not just surveillance capitalism, it's the role of influence in our society that we are just not having a frank conversation about. I mean, this goes beyond influence operations and disinformation to the very fundamental basis of our legitimacy. I mean, we have influence happening everywhere to sell us things, to get us to vote for somebody. And for some reason, in democracies, we have not had that moment to come and really discuss how far is too far? At what point do people lose their agency? And to get to that, we need to accelerate research around the impact of these things. And, and we're not gonna do that unless we start to pool resources and have shared engineering infrastructure. Something as big as a CERN for the information environment. Um, I, okay, you have had a question for a while. <laughs> hey, yeah, my name's Justin, Code for Africa. We track a lot of the stuff about across 21 countries in Africa at the moment. And you've hit on a lot of important points that we've been trying to hit on with our partners. Disinformation's super profitable. It's a boom industry in places like Kenya. It's not just disinfo for hire. There's a whole subset of sub-economies inside there. But we're seeing the same kind of playbooks um, being used everywhere from Sudan through to Ethiopia, Burkina Faso, Mali, kind of, you know, you name it. Um, regardless of language or audience. It's cross-platform. 
It uh, wherever possible tries to use vernacular to avoid algorithmic kind of detection. Um, it's franchise driven, specifically um, in the cases that we monitor Russian protagonists franchising out to local kind of implementers. What are we doing, and so I've got a three part quick question. What are we doing to stop the fragmentation that's happened where even within the platforms, your fact checking teams work and the people who are trying to debunk the misleading information work completely separate from the threat disruption teams. There's this firewall between them and we're seeing that play out in the rest of kind of the, the ecosystem now as well. Fact checkers are not speaking to the guys who are doing you know, kind of the, the work that DFR labs or others do ourselves. So that's the first question, because it's part of it's, it's something that the, the people driving the disinformation, they don't see this distinction. They're leveraging all of that. So that's the first one. The second one is that the enablers who are building this wish fulfillment infrastructure are not just the political kind of PR, click for hire people. It's the scams, the scam artists who are building mass audiences, almost like an Amazon delivery service for disinformation operators. What are we doing to take them down, or if not taking them down, to map them out? At the moment in Africa, we're seeing there's a massive campaign to drive everyone on Facebook and Twitter onto dark social, um, specifically because enforcement's getting better. And then the third question was uh, kind of slightly self-serving. Um, TTCAT mentioned it, it's local nuance, understanding the local ecosystem. Most of the people doing work in the space are in the north. What are we doing to support kind of in-country, in-region um, analysts, researchers, and the people who join the dots? I'm not sure that was so much as questions as important statements that needed to be heard because it again reiterates the lack of coordination, the lack of bringing all of the different bits of knowledge that we have generated together and the lack of an international interconnected approach to this. I don't have answers in that amount of time. <laughs> does it looks, is anyone else itching to take that? Yeah, um, I, I don't have an answer for others, um, but in some, uh, I echo whatever Justin just said, um, that yes, um, for, for, the resort, for the local context, but also in some region, like for the region where I'm from, I feel like we need more digital Sherlock. We need more capacity building for uh, training more people can, who also understand their local context, local language, local um, political context, and also can do those analysis work. Um, um, be frankly, a lot of people ask me, do you know what China do information operation in Thailand or in mid Middle East? How I supposed to know, right? So we don't live there, right? And uh, we are not, uh, we, as long as we don't have the, the chance to train people actually there, whatever tools or whatever knowledge we have and join with the, this community, we will never find out what they do there. So that's my kind of response. Or, yeah. um. Did you want to? Maybe just knowing that we're almost at time. So I, I did want to echo, I think, Alicia, TTK, right? A lot of those points are really important, particularly the scams piece, the fact that I think we've seen this growth in these kind of scam and spam actors trying to get into this business. But the most important takeaway of those three points is the importance of enabling communities like Sherlock's all over the world, in particular, people who have that ability to dive really deep in local context, understand not just what's happening on the internet in a particular country, but what's happening on the ground. Um, and I know one of the priorities of folks on my team is not just building some of the tools that I know some of the folks here are familiar with to archive and share information about influence operations, but also working directly with some of these teams. So hopefully we'll have a chance, for those of you who haven't met, to talk after this panel, because it's something I, I think we really do want to do more of. Um, well, I just want to thank all of you because I learned so much from the panel. Um, I was thinking very quickly about the theme that we, st uh, oh yeah, I want to remind everyone that you can um, get this content and other relevant event information, the agenda, um, on the DFR Labs website and also their social media account, so go check that out. Um, yeah, I learned a ton thinking about the beginning, going back to the beginning where we, I asked how's the world different from six years ago when there was the IRA um, infiltrating American social media companies in the US election and now it's like a million small IRAs with all sorts of different motives paid by different actors. And it's really fascinating to hear 
the collective knowledge in this room actually about how to tackle this problem. So it helps my coverage a lot. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Liza. So we're going, either way, uh, we're going to the last coffee break of the session. When we come back right at 5 p.m., we'll hear from uh, our colleagues at NATO's Public Diplomacy Division, as well as end with a panel on great firewalls and iron curtains, the technical infrastructure between, uh, behind authoritarianism. So please come back uh, right at 5. We'll close out the day. Go ahead and get coffee, get caffeinated. Uh, answer whether a muffin is a pastry on the whiteboard, and we'll see you in about 10 minutes.
somewhere else. I have to <laughs> Yeah, I don't see now. Can you just pull off him if you stop me? Would you like us to? We are a little bit delayed, I guess. Yeah, but no, it's about now. We are early. Uh, we're supposed to start that. NATO is a defensive alliance created in response to threats possessed by authoritarian regimes in the past century. And now we see that the relevance of the alliance is as big as it was before. The Baltic states take war in Ukraine very personally. And if it wasn't for NATO security guarantees, we could have been in Ukraine's place. The Alliance is facing dual problem. On the one hand, the Alliance and its member states need to protect their societies from information operations, psychological operations, and general threat possessed by the hybrid warfare. On the other hand, the Alliance itself has become a target by Kremlin disinformation that tries to undermine trust of citizens within its member states and make them weaker. With that, I'm proud to welcome on stage Bai Babraje, Assistant Secretary General for Public D Diplomacy at NATO. Thank you very much and um, a big thank you to both the Atlantic Council and to DFR Labs, our good colleagues and long-time partners for the Alliance in uh, organizing various events but also actually in this work stream that we are discussing these last two days. I am grateful for the opportunity to join you all today both here in person but also online. And indeed these two days uh, in person and for the fifth time the Open Summit has brought together policymakers, civil society, journalists, industry and indeed it's to meant to address today's critical challenges, countering foreign interference, building resilience but also sharing knowledge, talking to each other, sharing experience and finding the best solutions for the problems we identify. As for many of us, or we could say for all, also NATO is faced with a changed and an evolving security environment. NATO's mission is to prevent war, to protect our nations, our people, and our values. We do it through strong deterrence and, if necessary, defense. This has been our mission and our privilege for more than 70 years. Information for NATO is an instrument of power. It lies across both civilian and military spheres. What it does, it helps us to implement our main tasks, to deter, if necessary, to defend, to prevent and manage crises, and to work with the partners across the globe. I want to say also that looking ahead in these times, Regardless of how Ukraine wins its war of liberation, we are faced with a new reality. The digital and information space for us at NATO is the most contested environment. 
Continuous activity, short of armed conflict, has become the norm, with threat actors trying to weaken our democratic institutions, influence diplomatic outcomes, and also trying to obtain relative security advantages against the alliance. Information threats are only partially visible and largely non-kinetic, combining military and non-military tools and blurring the lines between peace crisis and conflict. What it means for us at NATO is that the center of gravity, which is our unity, is affected because if it is more difficult to identify the threat, it's more difficult to take the decisions. That is why since 2014, NATO has undergone some of the most significant and deep reforms, both in terms of intelligence gathering, forming joint threat picture, but also in the information field to both improve the understand function, but also to engage. The war in Ukraine has demonstrated that the information environment is a primary, primary area for competition and we have heard that over the last two days quite a lot. It was used as an enabler, shaping the battle space for war. And in the years and weeks preceding the invasion, the Kremlin was priming audiences with narratives, whether genocide, mercenaries, provocations with chemical components, it was all to pave the way for the invasion and false flag operations. While the success of these efforts is debatable, there are real implications for how we prepare for the future. And as I said, we at NATO adapt constantly. We did our lessons learned from 2014, and we will do them as we speak now. And that is what we all have to do nationally in our organizations, be it in industry, be it in NGOs, be it in academia, elsewhere. And only then we can reach that systemic solution of answer or preventive actions that we discussed in the previous panel. So first, we must leverage the potential of open source intelligence. Bellingcat and others until 2014 were one of the first initiatives in this space. Today, the open source community, and many of you are here, has flourished. We see countless more civil society groups assuming the front lines of defending our information environment, exposing hostile information activities, and bringing accountability and validation to a heavily polluted information environment. We need more of this. The war in Ukraine has demonstrated the important role that the open source intelligence community has played in investigating, verifying, validating and preserving developments on the ground and often in public communications, these experts are trusted and relied upon more than official sources from governments or from uh, those who are uh, communicating about it. Second, we must harness the power of technology and innovation. We in the political West or wider global partnership, we have a unique advantage. Our companies and universities operate in free and open societies. Our most creative and innovative minds are able to express themselves freely. They are inspired to challenge, to think, to invent, and to do that in radical new directions without a threat of reprisals. By bringing together academia, startups, governments, we can design cutting edge solutions to address the security challenges that we face. This includes developing capabilities and tools to better detect, analyze and respond to information threats. And we know from those who have been involved, who have taken active part in debunking or in research or in other parts of this work, they are not going to spread disinformation. As more we have at all age groups, at all societal groups involved, as best off we are as society. 
Third, we need to defend our values in the digital world. And it seems strange for NATO to speak about values. But that is what NATO's mission is. It is actually in the Washington Treaty. That's why the alliance was established, to defend the freedom and liberty. We have seen how authoritarian states have exploited digital platforms and tools for their own strategic gains, undermining democracy, freedom, and rules-based international order. We must continue supporting the development of appropriate national multilateral solutions that help us preserve these values that we hold dear. Progress has been made from sanctions to regulatory measures to platform policies, but we need to do more. And we need to do more also in the private sector. A few words on, on further steps how we at NATO are adapting and addressing these new challenges. First, situational awareness <clears throat> and the function that is relatively new, as I said, to understand these new non-traditional threats. Primary, our mission is to look at those that are targeted as these threats, targeted as the alliance at allies. It's vital to enable a credible response. We use information environment assessments routinely to support discussions among allies and to provide senior NATO leadership with actionable insights and suggestions for decision making. That concerns both the civilian and military sides of the house. We are investing in our own effort to create an IA that is there for the NATO as the alliance, for the allies and for the commands and civilian leadership. We have prioritized technology and innovation. We have some of the most advanced technologies in the world and we are taking steps to continually push further. We have just launched a DIANA, or Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, to identify and develop the next generation of technologies. It is vital that the open source, that the open democratic nations of the world work together to ensure that the values remain at the heart of the technological future. This is how we will not only maintain our technological edge, but also shape the future, the new rules and norms of global technology. Also, building resilience against threats is critical. So not only understanding the threat and having a joint understanding across the 30 allies, but also recognizing the fact that the governments alone are not able to address it. So allies have recognized that we need to make our societies stronger, to make our infrastructure more resilient and our supply chains more secure. That's why we will establish clear and more measurable alliance-wide resilience objectives to ensure a shared resilience among the allies. And of course, to keep our people safe, we need a strong military. And we also need strong societies. That's why we work so closely with partners such as EU, such as global partners in Asia Pacific, such as in private sector, in non-governmental sector, all across the board to make sure that there is this whole society approach. NATO is also a unique platform where we exchange views and insights, share information, have open and frank discussions, and we coordinate action. With the alliances network, we bring together the entire Euro-Atlantic community. That helps us to develop common standards. It helps us to act. By bringing together the military and non-military, we address both the traditional threats and the new. Looking to the future, the information space will be at the core of strategic competition and conflict. The shared challenge requires our collective resolve, and we at NATO are doing our part. In an information environment that is always on, so too must be our efforts to engage. NATO wants to work with you. 
you are experts in civil society, industry, academia. The threats and information environment, in particular hostile information operations, disinformation, require embedded local communities that understand these nuances and unique details of specific threats. So we welcome further collaboration with all of you, with all of you who are engaged at the local levels. We are also very eager to work more with social media platforms and with various operators, innovators, the ones that can be on or that are on the front lines of countering this information. As we look forward to the summit in Madrid in a few weeks' time, we must keep in mind that no one has full visibility of all threats. That is why we must join forces. We are stronger, more resilient, and more secure together. And in conclusion, a few more reflections on, from me personally. We indeed as NATO are a political military alliance, a defensive alliance. And our purpose is to safeguard and defend the freedom and liberty of our people. Our military leaders always remind us to defend is to know what we are fighting for. What is that liberty and freedom that we are fighting for? And I am reminded in this regard of Sir Isaiah Berlin's two concepts of liberty. He's a British philosopher born in uh, Riga, Latvia, who uh, was one of the leading philosophers of, of liberalism. And he said, we have two types of liberties. One is negative, and that is the freedom and liberty from coercion. That is a concept of our inalienable rights. However, even in dictatorships, an individual can find freedom. If they extinguish the desire of freedom, even individuals in prisons can still retreat into their inner citadel of mind, which cannot be concurred, and that is a liberty from fear. So when we think back of Mandela, or when we think today of Navalny, Karamuza, or others, it gives us hope that even the most authoritarian regimes cannot and will not conquer the people. On the positive liberty, as Berlin said, it is the need to fulfill one's potential. That is why we are here. To be our own masters, to decide for ourselves. That's why the alliance was established. That's why we take collective action. It also can lead to huge changes and revolutions or anarchies. So the free societies like ours depend on the balance between these two liberties, the negative and the positive. And here what Berlin said was, human goals are many and they are in perpetual rivalry with each other. So we need to remember that it is the pluralism, the pluralism of our values that matters. Thus, for us as a defense alliance, for our citizens, for all of us here and online, it is important to know that appreciating liberty in the different forms, we are defending our way of life, our civilization, our societies, and that is what it is worth fighting for. That is our biggest mission together with you, and we stand together as allies protecting one billion people across Europe and North America. And it is up to us to play our part in maintaining security and building a better, safer world for future generations. We are NATO. We are stronger together. And we are in this together. Thank you. Thank you so much. The information environment is a domain of competition and conflict. Uh, two days before, well, I should say the last two days of last week, right before this conference, the DFR Lab had the honor uh, and pleasure to join NATO at NATO HQ for a capacity building program uh, with analysts. And that's 
a very, very similar capacity building program to what we're doing on the third floor with the digital Sherlock's. The whole point of that is that the methodology that goes into that uh, drives towards the same thing, which is transparency and accountability uh, across that entire information environment. And that's what gives us the upper hand in an information environment that is a domain of competition. So thank you, Ambassador Brazer, for your remarks. And thank you so much for your collaboration. Uh, for the last panel of the day, we are, well, I should just say this. It's a, a huge honor to introduce up to the stage for the last panel to bring us home uh, with an extraordinary conversation on the actual technical underpinnings of authoritarianism in the information environment that leads to outcomes that are not transparent or accountable in the information environment. Uh, leading this session it is non-resident uh, senior fellow at the DFR lab, Kat Duffy, to bring us home. Welcome to the stage, Kat. It's the last panel of the day, y'all. We're almost through. Can everyone do me a favor while we get settled? If you're sitting at the outside, can you scoot in? Come, come into the center, because we have a whole bunch of people coming in the back, and they want to join. And can I get people who are sitting back there by the window? Come sit in the front row. We're not scary, and I'm lonely. Please come join us up here. So let's give everyone a minute to come in, to get settled. We're going to close it out strong. I wore my saucy sneakers, y'all. We're going to close this out strong. Fantastic. All right, well, welcome everyone to our discussion today. We're closing out two amazing, amazing days of programs and conversations and collaboration with the Atlantic Council. So thanks so much to DFR Lab for this incredible event. Let's give them a round of applause quickly. An incredible, incredible two days. So I uh, am here today to talk about digital sovereignty, to talk about the digital hammers that are currently fracturing the internet, and how we think about a future where we may not always have the interoperable and global web that we've come to expect and come to rely on around the world. I am Kat Duffy, as uh, Graham noted. I am a non-resident fellow at DFR Lab. I advise companies and governments and INGOs on developing strategies to align emerging technologies with democratic norms and human rights, and on building socially responsible business practices uh, within the technology sector. I am joined today uh, to my right by Dave, uh, David Frauci, who is the Senior Director for European Government and Regulatory Affairs at the Internet Society, by Usama Kilji, who is joining us virtually. There's Usama. Uh, he is the Executive Director of Bolobi, one of Pakistan's uh, most influential digital rights organizations, uh, and Kenton Thibault, a resident fellow at DFR Lab and a PhD candidate at Georgetown University. Uh, and Kenton's work is focused on Chinese influence operations, China's role in the global information environment, and the implications of that for democratic resilience. And I am going to start our discussion today off with a quote. The state must control this area completely. Of course, not from the point of view of restrictions or some kind of totalitarian control, but from the point of view of the realization of national interests. And that was Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova um, about two weeks ago via a state media outlet. And I thought that that quote very nicely summed up a lot of the struggle that we're facing right now with the idea that in order to have national security, you must have a digital sovereignty that would essentially break an interoperable web. And so with that, I wanted to start, David, with you. So you are a, a government affairs official, you're a telecommunications engineer, you have deep expertise in telecom and in digital regulations, particularly in the EU. And over the past decade, we've seen the Russian government consistently seek to unplug Russia from the internet. And over the past five months, we've seen a really dramatic shift in their self-isolation from the interoperable web, as well as in external calls to cut Russia off from the web. Can you give us a brief explanation of what those calls have looked like, how Russia's relationship with the global and interoperable web has, has changed this year, and what you believe the most important takeaways for this audience are? Okay. Um, so first, I will 
just say that I work for the Internet Society. It's a non-profit that was founded 30 years ago by the same people who created the Internet. And our mission is to defend the Internet, to maintain it open, globally connected, trustworthy, and secure. Um, in the last months, um, it is important to, to remind that uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian government asked uh, ICANN and the RIPE NCC to disconnect Russia. And this was a, a very strange uh, petition. Uh, ICANN had to analyze this very carefully because it had political motivations. And finally, they decided to take the right decision, which is not disconnect Russia. Their mission is to connect networks, not to disconnect them. So it is important that um, the technical community reacts like this, because we are here to ensure that the network remains connected. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and also, it is important to, to realize that if this had happened, if, if um, ICANN or RIPE decided, had decided to disconnect Russia, that would have given the Kremlin the right excuse. Uh, it's their arguments that the Western world controls the Internet and it is a tool for us to uh, uh, shape uh, the world uh, behind a, a policy different than theirs. So um, on, on, we see um, Russia trying to disconnect themselves, or not to disconnect, but to ensure that they have the capability to, when there, when there is a, um, a threat, that they have a control of what's going on uh, in the network there. Um, so yeah, we have to keep, uh, to keep in mind that uh, this is wrong, and we should not uh, give them every excuse to do that. Some companies have decided also to, to uh, withdraw from, from, that, from that market. And although that's a legitimate decision, companies do whatever they want, um, it also fuels uh, the Kremlin's uh, positions. So, yeah, we have to, to, to keep an eye of, on, on policies because it's not only governments like the Russian autocrat government that wants to do this with the citizens, but also um, uh, other governments without knowing uh, they might be developing uh, policies that uh, harm the internet. So uh, we are keeping an eye on those. Uh, also, uh, some of them, they are set up with good faith, but uh, some of the decisions they take they do have some implications. And civil society, like our organization, needs to keep an eye on what's going on to ensure that they don't harm the internet. Uh, I'll leave it there so we can continue the conversation later. That's great. And so I think, you know, for me, an important takeaway from what you're saying is that there's also various ways to splinter or various ways to cut off access. Yeah. So you've got everything from a call to an international governing body to cut a country off, all the way up to the regulatory or sort of policy or application layer where the governments are putting in more control over what citizens can access, but you still have the interoperable web as that underlying infrastructure, at least. Kenton, you, on the other hand, are a China scholar, and China has approached this uh, relatively differently. And one of your areas of expertise and study is around how China has centered the internet at the heart of its broader strategy to shift global discourse and normative frameworks away from liberal, liberal democratic norms and towards a narrative that is more affirming of China's vision and political and geopolitical aims. So do you see similarities between the way that Russia has recently been approaching the web and China's strategy or do you think of them as being fundamentally quite different? Um, I see China's strategy as fundamentally seeking a transformation of the international order. And by international order, I mean norms and values and a mode of distribution or institutional arrangements that, um, that uh, seek to distribute those values in either an economic way or um, a military way. Uh, security way. So China seeks to transform the system, whereas Russia is more in the position of having to disrupt. So China being in the position of wanting to transform, this leads to kind of a different strategy. It leads to a strategy that's more about shaping the international environment versus um, pursuing strategies of disruption. Um, and this has both material and normative components. And material, we think of as, you know, the 
infrastructure, digital infrastructure, um, and then normative um, norms of how we govern data. Um, so China is a big proponent of um, what they term as cyber, cyber sovereignty, which privileges very much this state-centric um, state control of um, data within a country's borders. And this isn't, um, you know, out of a respect for other countries' development conditions, though there is um, a demand side to that. Um, this is about um, a broader strategy where uh, China is thinking about, um, you know, both this infrastructure and this kind of regulatory application, uh, these two pieces, as part of this broader whole. And so this is part of a strategy to ensure that, you know, not just these material networks, but also normative frameworks that govern how they are used are designed around um, channeling uh, valuable data, um, channeling um, norms in a way that places China at the center of um, the global digital order. And um, China has the ability to do so. Um, it spent about $140 billion on BRI projects as of 2020, and it spent $80 billion on digital Silk Road projects, which is the digital component of the BRI. Um, and so the kind of the main takeaway from that is that China really views the internet as a system of control rather than as a communication platform. And this kind of plays out in the cyber physical, which China sees as being mutually constitutive. So there's not really a separation between kind of this regulatory and infrastructure aspect that we kind of see in debates um, oftentimes in the West. Um, so that's kind of the key takeaway, is that they view this as very much an integrated system. And um, I do want to say their internal, um, the, the party has kind of designed um, the, reconstituted the system uh, to really, um, towards this goal. So consolidating party control with Xi Jinping at the center. Um, in charge of determining the policy direction for all of the bodies in the party that are responsible for both um, um, gover um, internet governance, digital governance, and things like external propaganda. So these are also viewed as like two sides of the same coin. For example, the uh, Cyber Space Affairs Commission, um, the, um, the head of the Cyber Cyberspace Affairs Commission, which is um, in charge of governing policy guidance on things like public opinion and, um, you know, how algorithms are used. The head of that is also the vice minister of the Central Propaganda Department. So China views these things as mutually constitutive, as interrelated, and um, that's kind of the key takeaway there. And so one difference then that we're really hearing as well is that China doesn't really see any air or any space between what the infrastructural level would be, what the regulatory or the policy level would be, it's all part of one very significant strategy that has been backed by about $220 billion recently, um, as opposed to Russia, which is navigating more of a, stuck a bit with the interoperable web as its base layer and then has to operate across that. And um, if I could just do a quick example. Um, so just to kind of illustrate how integrated this um, system is, you have uh, Chinese companies which have pursued internationalization strategies in recent years, and they have to kind of put this under the framework of the Digital Silk Road or the BRI. And um, so, for example, there's this data company called Lianlian Digital who does a lot of the e-commerce work on the Digital Silk Road. Um, China pitches, um, you know, deals, e-commerce deals with companies like Lian Lian Digital in regional forums like the Forum for um, uh, China-Africa Cooperation, and it pitches deals with companies like this under this rubric of gaining cyber sovereignty. So if you have this payment system with Lian Lian Digital, you are coming one step so closer to gaining cyber sovereignty, gaining control over your data flows. But really, it's kind of this... Um, there's a hypocrisy in there because it's actually designed to lock in countries to certain cyber physical systems that then feed back into the party state and enhance their ability to enact control. And so, Usama, I want to turn it to you in the screen. Hello, my friend. Uh, you, know, you are an internationally known digital rights activist, um, 
as well as the executive director, as I said, of one of the most respected digital rights organizations in Pakistan. And I think, you know, you and I have discussed before that discussions of splinter nets frequently sort of devolve into, well, there's a sort of US slash EU, and then there's Russia, and then there's China, and that's, that's how it's framed. Um, but we're seeing governments around the world taking different approaches to harnessing the web within their boundaries, to establishing their own attempts at digital sovereignty, um, and, and doing so in a way that would promote their own sort of social, political, and economic priorities as governments. Can you speak to that broader trend? Because this is also something we're really seeing in South Central Asia um, in particular. And, I, and I'd love to hear from you about, within those trends as well, are there really important pragmatic realities that you feel are often missed in this broader discourse that is somewhat binary? Oh. Hold on, Osama, we're having some trouble with your audio. One second. All right. You want to try yeah. now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think I want to address, you know, South and Central Asia, where you have a lot of democracies that are sort of, um, you have India and Pakistan that have been independent for, say, around 75 years, the post-colonial states that are really trying to find their footing into the system. Um, you know, you have Pakistan that has had bouts of military dictatorship as well. Then you have Bangladesh that's sort of younger. But overall, there seems to be for these states a lot of variety because they have the Russian model, they have the Chinese model, they have the US-EU model. Uh, but at the end of the day, I also want to address some limitations for, for countries like us. So uh, if, if you take the US, the US is it, you know, spied on um, multiple countries across the world, and Pakistan is the second most spied on country. At the same time, you have the Chinese internet system and the China-Pakistan economic corridor, uh, you know, bringing in a lot of Chinese fiber optic investments, as well as safe city projects that are photographing every citizen that lives in the large cities within Pakistan. So there are different systems that these countries are looking at, and now we have at multiple levels. So first you have this centralized uh, uh, monitoring system. So in Pakistan, it's called the web monitoring system, which, is, uh, which uses deep packet technology, which is a dual use surveillance technology. Uh, which has the ability to censor content at the root, uh, at the entry point, and has the ability to filter content as well. And India, on the other hand, also has a central monitoring system, uh, which uh, pretty much does the same. Um, what you, you've had talks about, you know, TikTok being banned in India. So TikTok has been blocked in India for a few years now, just because of the political tensions between India and uh, China. And in Pakistan, on the other hand, you've also seen the TikTok being banned for around five times and then unblocked, but essentially for different censorship reasons that the state gives. But what we're overall seeing is that there's a lot of technology that is available in the open market, which is for censorship, which is for surveillance, and even democratic countries are exporting it. So for example, Sandvine um, uh, is exporting this technology for filtration and censorship uh, from Canada. Uh, so are there any uh, export controls that are being put in place? Is civil society in the West talking about how uh, exports from their own countries are undermining democratic values globally? And on the other hand, we're looking at, you know, Western democracies that are coming up with laws and regulations that undermine uh, digital freedoms overall, not within their own, only within their own territories, but also seek to sort of uh, fall bring this model. You had the net ZG law in Germany, you had the Avia law in France, and while it was being debated, countries in Asia started copying those laws and bringing them in and saying, oh, if France or Germany can do this, we can do this too. But then we're looking at rule of law issues and they're not really being implemented in the best way, they're being abused. So I think that's also something that civil society globally needs to work on together in order to cooperate on these issues and put their heads together and say, okay, what if this proposal was to come in? What will be the global ramifications on how the internet functions? Um, and then take the step forward further 
keeping that in mind. And I think these are some like realities that we're looking at in this new field of the internet um, that you know brings up a lot more questions and, and the need for a lot more conversations. And uh, Osama, can you, you'd mentioned that you know, TikTok, for example, has been banned and then unbanned something like five times. What are you seeing that is different in Pakistan that is resulting in these laws or these regulations being pushed out and then getting turned over and uh, like how, what's, what's informing that? I think uh, in Pakistan, what's been really wonderful is the uh, multi-stakeholder advocacy that has been very strong. So you have an informed civil society that has been partnering with the media to raise awareness on censorship and surveillance issues and to inform the debate uh, among citizens and among policymakers as to how that really functions. Um, then you have the civil society working with the media, but also lawyer groups. Um, and, and these are citizen-led lawyer groups, political parties are being involved. And these multi-stakeholder advocacy has been so strong that the courts have been forced to listen, that the parliament and governments have been forced to take back a lot of their decisions. And there's this constant pushback from citizens. You know, in Pakistan, we have a tradition of uh, resistance. We've, we've kicked out around three military dictators that were backed by the US and were back to sort of a democratic systems over there. Um, so the civil society and, and the, the multi-stakeholder uh, alliances that are being formed are very strong and I feel they, they really provide a very good example. So, for example, in the past three or four months, we've seen criminal defamation being decriminalized by high courts in Pakistan. We've, we've also seen social media regulation that sort of legalized censorship being uh, struck down by courts and advising the parliament to look at them again uh, through you know, multi-stakeholder processes. So I think these were completely locally led um, efforts and, and they, they sort of, you know, give us a very good model that can globally be replicated better. I, that's fantastic and, and great to hear. And I think um, turning to that multi-stakeholder point, David, obviously ISOC is involved in many multi-stakeholder uh, initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I know that this is something ISOC has been putting a lot of thought into as well in terms of how civil society can come together and play a stronger role in working with governments as they're considering new regulations or new policies to look at what the impact of those would be. Can you speak a little bit to ISOC's work there? Yeah, yeah. We have uh, developed um, a toolkit that helps identify if a given policy includes um, 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 aspects that would harm the internet. So what we have done, we have identified what are the components that make the internet be the internet that we all want to have and we want to preserve. And we can run any policy uh, through this lens so that we can identify if there are negative aspects. This helps us create a, an impact assessment, internet impact assessment report. And we can share this to, with policymakers so that they can be aware of, of the consequences of the draft they are developing. We are uh, helping our community understand how this tool works and uh, we are teaching them how to create uh, reports and briefs based on this toolkit and we are um, uh, already analyzing uh, um, policy proposals around the globe with good, uh, with good outcomes because we are achieving change. We are uh, putting this in hands of our, our community and civil society and we are actually uh, making some uh, changes in, in, in policy. So this is, this is great. Um, Splinternet has been mentioned uh, a couple of times and I want to just explain a little bit to the audience what, what would that mean to the people using the internet. So imagine you go to a country and then your normal um, um, search tool does not work. You have to use um, uh, a search tool that is local and then uh, the results of that search tool would be curated or uh, adjusted to what uh, the government wants you to see. Or imagine that you want, um, you are making some tourism, you take pictures and you want to upload uh, pictures to a favorite uh, photo sharing app. And then you find that in this given country, your app doesn't work. That's, that would be because the government has set up um, uh, rules 
uh, on content sharing that are not uh, uh, that your app is not is complying to. So your app doesn't work or is not available there. So that means that a splinter net can be done by either cutting the cables, that, and this happens, or cutting the services, as in Pakistan, where TikTok uh, has been banned and uh, reaccepted, right? Uh, but it can also happen because of policies that are developed by countries. And this is not happening only in autocratic countries. This is also happening in places here, like here in Europe. And just to give an example, there's something on the table now that's called uh, DNS for EU. And it doesn't have to be bad per se. Uh, they want to, to set up a new infrastructure that would help resolve IP addresses within Europe. If implemented well, it will give resilience and better performance to the network in Europe. But if implemented wrong, it can also give governments the tool to filter and analyze what customers are doing on the web. Uh, and this is wrong. So what we, uh, as an organization, we, what we do is we keep track of these proposals and we help identify which need to be modified to ensure that the internet remains open. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing we have seen, especially with the um, significant increase in regulations that have been coming out of Europe in the past couple of years is uh, that, that Europe has had a, um, a very significant commitment to multi-stakeholder engagement and to having a broad range of different organizations and different types of expertise from civil society, from academia, from industry in negotiations and, and in discussions. And Kenton, on this point, I want to turn it over to you because that strikes me as markedly different than China's <coughs> very quiet and deep approach to multilateral negotiations in the internet governance space over a number of years, which includes their current advocacy to back Russia's bid for the presidency of the ITU this fall. And so I'm wondering if you can help give us an understanding of how multilateralism plays into China's strategy and multi-stakeholderism certainly would not. <laughs> Yes, so multilateralism is one of the norms along with, you know, cyber sovereignty that China is really trying to push um, as, you know, kind of the way to do business um, on the world stage with regards to internet issues. Um, this is because, you know, multilateralism privileges kind of state to state interactions and um, it's government to government and it issues a multi-stakeholder approach precisely because China does not want civil society actors involved. Um, and um, this isn't just government to government, it's also um, you know, Chinese corporate entities to other governments. And you know, like while in countries like the US, um, um, multinational companies like Exxon have you know, very um, sophisticated foreign policy uh, shops within them, uh, advocating for Exxon's interests. Um, here, you know, in a company like Huawei, they also are, you know, have a very um, sophisticated foreign policy uh, sh shop, but they are advocating on the interests of um, the CCP. And, you know, going back to this idea of, you know, everything goes back to ensuring the um, security of the Chinese Communist Party with Xi at the core, and these two sentences can't be separated. Um, Huawei, you know, the party committee of Huawei has to approve any sort of, you know, deal or whatever, um, or, you know, uh, interaction that would happen with Huawei and a sovereign government and make sure that, you know, the terms of whatever agreement would meet the security and, you know, propaganda guidance from, you know, the central committee and the bodies that carried that out. So this is all very much, um, you know, when I say that this is, um, the internet is a system of control, all of these, you know, um, there's this web and China wants to put itself at the center and then all of these, you know, cyber and physical systems are meant to feed back into this and then China can leverage this to, um, you know, exert more social control, either locally or um, abroad. And Usama, you had referenced this um, sort of briefly in your earlier remarks, but I wanted to come back to it. Uh, when we think about the multi-stakeholder approach that has been taken recently in the EU, 
Um, as someone who is a member of South Central Asian civil society, but who has seen the impact of EU laws um, be pr particularly bad, right, in multiple countries around the world outside of the jurisdiction of the EU. What is your take on the current approach to multi-stakeholderism? What, what is important about it and what are its current flaws when we're looking not just domestically but cross-regionally uh, at the way that different policies um, and regulations are being constructed? Oh, sorry, we're missing audio again. Let's try now. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Hello, can you hear me now? Yep. Perfect. Um, yeah, so just as the internet, I think, is an interoperable platform for global, I think the regulations uh, around the internet also tend to be very global in, a, in, in the sense that when someone does something, everyone's looking and looking to copy that. Uh, but then it turns uh, things around when those efforts are trying to create borders around the internet. And that's what we're seeing with a lot of the European regulations and the ramifications of those in countries outside of Europe. Um, uh, there, there are some very you know, good points around it. So for example, with the GDPR, we're seeing an uptick in um, uh, data protection and privacy laws around the world. A lot of countries are trying to match up to those standards and especially the requirement, the European requirement that in order to do business uh, or, or data transfers, you have to have equal or better regulation and legislation present, I think is a good precedent. But on the other hand, when it comes to regulating content, I think that's where a lot of the issues come up. So for example, uh, David also mentioned DNS uh, servers, how those are being regulated in the EU. Uh, in Pakistan, we're seeing this very similar conversation happening where the regulator is trying, the, uh, trying to get the internet service providers to uh, enforce the, the, you know, a centralized DNS system uh, whereby a lot of the content will be controlled. Uh, and it's the larger, it connects to the Chinese approach um, you know, that Kenton mentioned, uh, which Pakistan is trying to emulate because of its uh, you know, strong links with China, where they're trying to centralize information, to censor information, uh, content, and, and to carry out mass surveillance. And this also extends to say things such as criticism of the Pakistani partnership with China. When we demand more transparency, um, you know, these, these efforts are met with silence or more oppression or more uh, censorship. Um, and I think that's where this, uh, this need for civil societies across the globe to work together in order to connect on notes. So a lot of times when we speak to counterparts in South Asia and South Central Asia, we laugh a lot because we're like, okay, India and Pakistan really don't get along. The governments hate each other. But what we're seeing is that the approaches that the governments in Bangladesh and in India and in Pakistan are taking are very, very similar. Um, so that's where the civil society also has to put their heads together. Um, and especially when it comes to, say, European civil society and American civil society, because the impact of that is so much on the rest of the world that if we lock our heads together and do our advocacy together globally, only then can we save the global nature of the internet. And something I also want to add related to what we're seeing with the Russia-Ukraine conflict is there, the, you know, there's been a very bad precedent of censoring a lot of Russian uh, news platforms um, that we're seeing happen. And, you know, this is going to be, this is a slippery slope where in future, a lot of global, supposedly global platforms will censor news uh, organizations from different countries. Yes, they may uh, be engaging in disinformation and propaganda, but the but the, but the right approach is not to be paternalistic and to decide for citizens what has to be seen or what can be accessed by them. The right approach has to be to counter that disinformation in effective ways, right? Um, so the reason I'm mentioning this is that then it's also encouraged other governments to sort of censor news websites from other countries that they don't they don't seem um, friendly and what the impact of that then is further propaganda from states within territories uh, and walls built around the internet and citizens at the end of the day do not have access to information 
that they should rightfully have and make that decision rather than states make the de decisions for them. That's, that's fascinating. Thank you so much, Usama. And I wanted to pull in one question that we had gotten from the crowd. And David, I'm going to direct this to you. Uh, and it's, to what extent can we rely on VPNs and anonymizers, such as the Tor browser, to circumvent online censorship? Well, I, I, I just read it before, and I think it's a weird question, uh, because um, what VPNs and the Tor browser does is that they mask who you are, or they allow you to browse in a way that the network would not be able to identify you, but that doesn't, uh, is not related to, inter to online censorship. Online censorship is more related to changes on uh, what is published or changes on uh, what the government wants you to read or not, but not related to your uh, browsing activity. Now, if the question is to what extent you can trust the, your VPN that uh, you are really masked, uh, that your identity is really masked, then, uh, well, it depends uh, on the VPN and it's a matter of trust. Uh, you normally pay an amount and you have to trust that they promise to do what they, I mean, to, that they do what they promise to do in the terms and conditions, that they will not store your online activity and that they will not share it with a third party. Uh, but it's only a matter of trust. And to the extent that we've seen, for example, um, citizen, Russian citizens, for example, still accessing Twitter, but through a VPN, right? We've also seen an increasing number of laws around the world that are trying to illegalize VPNs or create commercial restrictions on VPNs such that, uh, for example, there's a new regulation that was just proposed in India, I think, two weeks ago, that would require VPNs to centralize all of the information and log all of the VPN traffic mm -hmm. in India, uh, which makes it pretty hard to be a VPN. Uh, and so we're seeing lots of different laws and regulations springing up that would give companies the ability to control the commercial um, products that were available in their country that would help evade the direct access restrictions and the, and the other regulatory restrictions they have put on their own digital space. We're, we're running short on time, and so what I would love to do is sum up, because one of the things we had promised uh, is that we would not end this summit on a like, <laughs> kind of note, right? We have promised that we would come out of here with some constructive, solid suggestions for things that we think democracies can do to respond to this and to help turn this around. These are a few of the things that I have heard in the discussion today, but please tell me what you think I'm missing. The first one uh, is to think carefully before, if you are a government, US and EU colleagues who are here, uh, to think very carefully about agreeing to a solely multilateral process. Is multilateralism a honeypot? That is my question to you. It is faster, it is more efficient, it is easier to operationalize as a government, it is less chaotic, it works a lot better with a government budget, and it also plays directly into a multi-billion dollar, multi-year long strategy run by the most authoritarian country uh, in the geopolitical sort of power space. Uh, so the lure of multilateralism is strong. But are you being lured into a honeypot? Is that really where you want to end up, right? This would be my first question and my suggestion to especially policymaking colleagues here. Reinvest, double down, innovate, and think very carefully about how you support multi-stakeholder engagement, about the breadth of what that multi-stakeholder engagement is. Should it go beyond your jurisdiction and allow for those outside of your jurisdiction to weigh in? if you already know that the ramifications of the policy decisions that you are making are likely to extend beyond your jurisdiction? Can you work with civil society like ISOC to think through toolkits and to think through approaches that ease that debate and ease that discussion for policymakers, especially while we still have so many people who are learning the space and learning the more technical elements of, of the questions that they're examining, mm -hmm. right? And Osama, I think you and I have talked a lot about this as well trying to engage in strong multi-stakeholder processes at a time where civil society is facing closing civic space, is closing foreign funding restrictions, right, and is under increasing pressure around the world, 
it's very difficult. And so we need governments to be thinking in very imaginative and profound ways about what true multi-stakeholder engagement would look like and how they change procurement methods, how they change foreign assistance priorities and policies, how they open it up to a broader range of individuals, um, how they work with multilingual inputs and responses. Uh, and so I think that is another thing that has come up in this conversation, but that I wanted to really hammer home. Um, a third, I think, that we've referenced is that the ITU elections are this fall, and China's been quietly whipping votes and uh, pushing on that election for a long time, and we need governments really thinking about how they get in each and every vote so that we are not saddled with an ITU that is uh, being led by Russia for the coming years, because that will not do great things for the interoperable web or for multi-stakeholder approaches. Uh, addre address export controls. Address what you are allowing companies within your jurisdictions to export. Look at how those exports are being used and think about whether or not you are fueling democratic orders, whether you are fueling the global liberal order, or whether, in fact, you are allowing your free market to aid repression and to aid authoritarianism in a way that will eventually kill that free market. That's another question we would argue that government should be engaging in and thinking about carefully. Uh, and are there any, any other big things that you feel like we yeah. should be calling on governments for? Make impact assessment. Make with, <laughs> with use ISOC's impact assessment. Yeah, it's, free to, <laughs> it's free to use and it works very well. Yeah. Anything else? I can't top the honeypot comment, so I think you said it all. I'm going to make it a bumper sticker. Yeah, I'm going to make a should. t shirt, y'all. It'll be a fundraiser. Yeah. Usama, how about you? Any, any additional? I covered. I think you said I covered everything. I'm reading yeah. your lips. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. And with that, we have three seconds left in our panel. So I am going to say thank you so much to our panelists. I'm going to say thank you for coming to the last session of this amazing summit. And we are going to turn it over to our incredible organizers to close us out. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. We made it. <laughs> Graham literally came running. I came running. I had to get glasses so that we could read all the partners. I really hope that it's going to be bigger than that. So we've been a little busy running around, as you may have noticed. And so in between sessions, we wrote each other parts of closing remarks. And neither of us have seen them. So forgive me for anything that Graham is making me say to you. That's right. There's definitely lines in there that Rose will deeply regret in the, in the very near term. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. But at least we can read it now. So we are now coming to the end of the fifth annual 360 Open Summit, uh, hosted by the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. Uh, if you missed the entirety of the conference, uh, my name is Graham Brookie. I am the <laughs> director of the Digital Forensic Research Lab at the Atlantic Council. That's great. I get to take credit for that. And I'm Rose Jackson. I'm the director of the Democracy and Tech Initiative. And all I can say is what a two days we just had. It was two days. That's all that was. Two days. On day one, we heard from U.S. Ambassador to the European Union and piped in our colleague Roman live from Kiev to talk about the reality of Russia's war against Ukraine, both on the ground as well as online. We heard how the decisions the platforms make play into and, and shape war and conflict. And powerful testimony from the frontline journalists and activists targeted by the NSO group's surveillance uh, software. We heard from Hong Kong democracy leader, from a Hong Kong democracy leader, uh, who spoke forcefully about our interconnected fates, and we heard from industry partners about leveraging proactive defense to create a safer information ecosystem. We close the day looking at the future with panels taking on implications of the growing Web3 ecosystem and what that means for democracy. Uh, we also talked to those who are looking at what safety is online in increasingly ubiquitous virtual reality and augmented reality contexts. That was just day one. Uh, today, because time is a flat circle and we're coming at this stage in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Today, we heard from Mr. Audrey Tang, who's the digital minister of Taiwan, in conversation with Brazilian journalist Laís Martins. And we, heard, we learned about election integrity, what election integrity means, uh, in an increasingly complex digital ecosystem. 
Forgive us for I hope that tired. you just included as much alliteration as humanly possible. I tried to make it really hard to say all at once. <laughs> Connect Humanity and their partners brought home the centrality of connectivity and access to every issue that the conference covered. And NDI brought home how battling online violence against women is essential to building representative democracies. We were lucky to hear once again from the drafters of the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act on the eve of passage of a once in a generation legislation. <laughs> and of course, we heard from Secretary Blinken and Maria Reza and a number of US leaders, including acting GEC coordinator Leah Bray and of course, NSC senior director Rob Bershinsky. And from Ambassador Braja on the importance of, informa of the information domain of war and that we are stronger with allies. It's a true fact. Which leaves us the exceptional panel we just had to close us out. And I don't know that we could have found a more perfect and pitch perfect note to end on. Of course, the last two days has actually been three separate conferences all at once. Uh, and over the course of the pandemic, the Digital Sherlock's program is something that we moved to an entirely virtual program. And over the course of the pandemic, we were able to train about 1,500 people from 114 countries. And throughout this conference, we've been joined here in person by, a, a, what, a little over 100 of the Digital Sherlocks, uh, representing just over 50 countries. And those Digital Sherlocks are independent researchers, journalists, students, and civil society. Uh, they've been mostly down on the third floor, but I think y'all are up here. So thank you so much for joining. It's also worth saying, and I apologize to the teleprompter for going slightly off script at this moment, that there are a number of digital Sherlocks who were not able to join us because of the reality of how hard it is to get a visa often in Belgium if you are from a country in the global south. So we wanted to acknowledge that and say how much we miss having those colleagues in the room and recommit ourselves to ensuring that people really are allowed to be in the same spaces online or offline. I will go back on script now and note that in addition to the digital Sherlock's, you probably participated in a side event of some sort over the course of the last two days. And we hope that those conversations were rich and fruitful. In addition to all of the partners that participated in those side events, so in addition to, uh, I mean, everybody that joined us on main stage, all the partners joined us for side events, including RightsCon, the National Democratic Institute, the International Republican Institute, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, and nine other civil society organizations committed to the Action Coalition for Meaningful Transparency. And those are just a few, uh, but I am deeply out of breath. <laughs> Throw in a few more if you want. Uh, but we've said it throughout the conference, and I think it's great as we're coming to a close to emphasize again, what makes 360 Open Summit unique is the community. And I hope that you all feel that as we're coming to an end, that through those side events, that what you saw represented on stage here in these panels, that in the digital Sherlock's room, you really felt that it represented a diverse cross-section of the people required to move us forward in good change to create a better world, and that you feel that you were made richer by that experience. We're deeply thankful for our presenting partners as well, including the United States Mission to the European Union, with a special thanks to Ambassador Mark Gittenstein, who joined us yesterday as well as today, and the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. 360 OS, as we said before, is further strengthened by valuable inputs from practitioners in, in our industry partners, like Meta and Twitter. We had folks from Google and a number of other places in the room, and the government representatives from over a dozen countries globally, way more than I could possibly name, because Graham is kinder to me than I was to him. But I will thank Canada Global Affairs and the Danish Foreign Ministry for their support in making many of the side programs possible today. Also, a huge thank you and shout out to the summit's media partner, Rest of World, who's helped amplify all of these conversations, not just to an audience here in the European Union, but to audiences around the world. That's, core part, that's a core part of their journalism, and we're thankful for it every single day. They also sat in and either moderated or served as panelists on two of our really exceptional panels, and we're richer for having had them there. At the start of this conference, we paid our respects to former Secretary Madeleine Albright. And she used to say something quite often that has stuck with me for most of my career. She said that the core tension in the world is between those who believe that people should serve their governments or between people who believe governments should serve their people. I think it's instructive to turn that frame into the issues that we've discussed for the last two days. Should people serve technology and government or should technology and government serve people? And I know that that might sound overly simplified and a little bit holy, but our contested realities and potential futures comes down to this. If we're to build a world in which the latter is true, 
then it's on us to continue the work together to drive forward a future that makes any of that possible. Of course, our staff, nothing would be able, we wouldn't be able to do anything without all of our colleagues across the In fact, the we're not really capable of speaking this at this moment. It's, <laughs> it'd be better if one Rose of Rose and I were out. flying solo on this one, and it it's is dangerous. showing all the way. <laughs> yeah. uh, Nothing would be possible, especially the conference like this, without all of our team across the DFR Lab space. I should say this, that we are one of the largest centers at the Atlantic Council, and we are the only center that has staff on all of the continents where we have regional centers across the Atlantic Council. Now, huge upside is that we get to work with all of you every single day around the world. And uh, many of you get to work with our research team, our capacity building team, our policy team, or the team that makes it all possible. Now, the downside for us is that we don't get to see each other every single day. So we look for excuses, uh, like a very large global conference in Brussels, to get together and hang out. Uh, now, none of any of this, uh, the food, the main stage, the agenda, the, uh, all of the side events, and the agendas that we're trying to move forward, the work that we're actually able to do uh, here at the conference, as well as on a day-to-day -day basis, would not be possible without them. Uh, they all chip in, and it's an inc incredible team, and we are all so thankful for you all. Please welcome us, uh, just give a round of applause for the entirety of the DFR Lab staff. So I am to now make a couple of logistical announcements. Number one, we have some summit swag. That has three exclamation marks. I think I I'm should so excited. say that more excitedly. <laughs> Very excited. <laughs> On your way to the happy hour, make sure to stop by the front desk to pick up t-shirts, stickers, and more. I don't know what the more is, but I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, <laughs> and one last logistical announcement. Uh, to come to this conference, at some point you interacted with one very special member of our team. Uh, and the person who answered all of the emails, coordinated all of the flights, worked with production teams, has no idea that we're talking about her right now, and coordinated our entire team to come together for this event. Should we? She's a bit stage shy. So She's going to hate this, actually. You go. It's your no, one. you. So please <laughs> give us the biggest round of applause to welcome the only, one and only, Kelsey Hankwinet to the stage. <laughs> Attention. You got the last two lines. We need the mic. Uh, I will just say thank you for coming to Brussels and thank you for joining us online. <laughs> That's all we get. <laughs> and the happy hour is on the square right the, like in 20 minutes, so we'll see you on the square at the happy hour. Down there on the corner in the app and starting now? Now. Thanks for looking out for See, us. See, disinformation. <laughs> we'll Thank see you guys for coming. Out.